Good morning, counselors. We are live from River Valley. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to, I would like to call the June 19th Community and Public Services Committee meeting to order. And at this time, I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. I'd like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory and Métis homelands and acknowledge the diverse Indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Soto, Blackfoot, Nakota Sioux, as well as Métis and Inuit, and now settlers from around the world. And I will do a roll call now. Councillor Rice? Hi, good morning. Good morning, Councillor Knack? Good morning. Good morning, Councillor Paquette? Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Mayor, are you online with us? Not at this time. Councillor Wright? Good morning. Good morning. Okay, now I have to go through my memory. Uh, Councillor Stevenson? Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Tang? Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Hamilton? Councillor Rutherford? Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Salvador? Councillor Cartmel? And Councillor Jans. All right. Next, we will move with adoption of the agenda. Councillor Rice? I move that the June 19th, 2023 Community and Public Service Committee meeting agenda be adopted with the following change. Uh, deletion and 7.3, uh, Community Sandbox Program Review. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Any questions about the adoption of the agenda? I myself have a question, so I'll pass the chair over to you, Councillor Rice. Uh, I'm taking. Oh, you don't need to. Pass I don't need the chair to do that at committee. Or in a committee. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, so I'll keep the chair then, and I just want, would like to ask the question uh, to administration. Um, if you could clarify as to why we are deleting this. So we're moving the community um, services sandboxes report to the OP12 conversation. So we'll be having the same conversation about uh, community sandboxes, but we're doing that as part of OP12 and the uh, budget conversations. Okay, great. So would that be at the next update? Yes. yes. Fantastic. Yes, so okay, great. That's it. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Please vote. We have four votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. Next, uh, approval of the minutes. Councillor Knack, would you please move approval of the minutes? Absolutely, thank you, Councillor Prince. I'll move the approval of the minutes from the May 31st, 2023 Community and Public Services Committee and the June 5th, 2023 Community and, uh, Community and Public Services Committee non-regular. Thank you, any questions, errors, omissions? Seeing none, please vote. We have four votes. Thank you, please display the vote. And that has carried. Uh, protocol items, I'm not aware of any protocol items. So we'll move on to um, select items for debate. I'll please ask my colleagues to sign up.
Councillor Knack. Go ahead. Thank you. Sorry, working between two screens here. Uh, yes, we are selecting uh, 7.1, 7.2, 7.3, 7.4, 7.5, 7.6, 7.7, 7.8, 7.9, 7.10, 7.11, 7.12, 7.13, 7.14, 7.15, 7.16, 7.17, 7.18, 7.19, 7.20, 7.21, 7.22, 7.23, 7.24, 7.25, 7.26, 7.27, 7.28, 7.29, 7.30, 7.31, 7.32, 7.33, 7.34, 7.35, 7.36, 7.37, 7.38, 7.39, 7.40, 7.41, 7.42, 7.43, 7.44, 7.45, 7.46, 7.47, 7.48, 7.49, 7.50, 7.51, 7.52, 7.53, 7.54, 7.55, 7.56, 7.57, 7.58, 7.59, 7.60, 7.61, 7.62, 7.63, 7.64, 7.65, 7.66, 7.67, 7.68, 7.69, 7.70, 7.71, 7.72, 7.73, 7.74, 7.75, 7.76, 7.77, 7.78, 7.79, 7.80, 7.81, 7.82, 7.83, 7.84, 7.85, 7.86, 7.87, 7.88, 7.89, 7.90, 7.91, 7.92, 7.93, 7.94, 7.95, 7.96, 7.97, 7.98, 7.99, 7.100, 7.101, 7.102, 7.103, 7.104, 7.105, 7.106, 7.107, 7.108, 7.109, 7.110, 7.111, 7.112, 7.113, 7.114, 7.115, 7.116, 7.117, 7.118, 7.119, 7.120, 7.121, 7.122, 7.123, 7.124, 7.125, 7.126, 7.127, 7.128, 7.129, 7.130, 7.131, 7.132, 7.133, 7.134, 7.135, 7.136, 7.137, 7.138, 7.139, 7.140, 7.141, 7.142, 7.143, 7.144, 7.145, 7.146, 7.147, 7.148, 7.149, 7.150, 7.151, 7.152, 7.153, 7.154, 7.155, 7.156, 7.157, 7.158, 7.159, 7.160, 7.170, 7.171, 7.172, 7.173, 7.174, 7.175, 7.176, 7.177, 7.178, 7.179, 7.180, 7.181, 7.182, 7.183, 7.184, 7.185, 7.186, 7.187, 7.188, 7.189, 7.190, 7.191, 7.192, 7.193, 7.194, 7.195, 7.196, 7.197, 7.198, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.199, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 7.99, 
that uh, uh, item 7.1 be the first item of business? We have four votes. Thank you. Please display the vote. And that has carried. Next, councillor inquiries. I'm not aware of any. Reports to be dealt with at a different meeting. Do we have any questions or comments on requests to be dealt with at a different meeting? No, please vote. Sorry. Do we need to vote on those? No. To be, no? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm so glad you're here, Clerk Yusuf. Request to reschedule reports, none. Unfinished business, none. So we are on to public reports, and I see administration all ready to go. So please go ahead whenever you're ready. Good morning. Um, wait for the slides. Are they coming? Good morning, my name is Lila Peter and I'm the Director of Development Approvals and Inspections and I'm joined by Kim Petron today, I'm the Acting Deputy City Manager for Urban Planning and Economy. And there are a number of team members here with me from business licensing, legal and community standards and neighborhoods who will all help respond to questions that you may have. Next slide please. The topic of indoor shisha consumption in public places has been before committee and council several times. <clears throat> a July 2018 committee motion led to amendments to the public places bylaw in June 2019, and this aligned the definitions of indoor smoking, cannabis, and tobacco, and shisha. And it ultimately led to the prohibition of all indoor shisha smoking, effective July 2020. Administration worked closely with the community to prepare for that ban and advised any potential applicants of the impending changes. In January 2021, stakeholders from the Edmonton Hookah Cultural Society spoke to committee about the impact that the ban had had on their community. When options under the business license bylaw were presented to committee in April 2021, a motion was made to allow indoor shisha smoking, but that motion was defeated. Then, in October 22, stakeholders from the Edmonton Hookah Cultural Society shared their perspectives to committee and asked that a gender-based analysis be completed, in addition to reviewing some risk mitigation measures that the society proposed to reduce risks associated with indoor shisha consumption. City Council subsequently passed a motion in November 2022 directing administration to engage with stakeholders including Alberta Health Services and provide a report with recommendations on potential bylaw amendments for indoor shisha consumption. At that committee meeting um, or at that meeting administration identified that there was no budget to allow for a robust engagement plan with Edmontonians but that the focus would be on speaking to identified stakeholders to understand the information being referenced by the Edmonton Cultural Hookah Society. It was further identified that depending on the direction that committee chooses to go today, specific bylaw amendments would be brought forward as part of the review of the public spaces bylaw project. So based on this, the report before you today includes information about what might need to happen if committee were to direct administration to bring forward bylaw amendments. Next slide, please. <clears throat> To ensure that administration's understanding of the public health implications of indoor shisha consumption were up to date, administration interviewed representatives from Alberta Health Services and Action on Smoking and Health, which is a local health advocacy organization, organization based in Edmonton. Public health risks identified include that there is a significant risk to those with underlying health conditions that can be aggravated by exposure to secondhand smoke that there are cancer, heart disease, and lung disease risks associated with nicotine and other carcinogens in non-tobacco products such as those of herbal shisha, and that the risk to youth who are more likely to experiment, who often see water pipes as a novel experience and are typically unaware of adverse health effects. 
So during engagement, Alberta Health Services made it clear that building controls such as ventilation and physical separation are not sufficient, as these measures do not eliminate secondhand or thirdhand smoke, and that there is no safe level of exposure to secondhand smoke. This smoke would impact non-partaking members of the public sharing the building space, any inspectors who might visit the space, first responders or workers. Next slide, please. Administration engaged with community members and business owners to understand the social and cultural implications of shisha consumption. Feedback received from these stakeholders reaffirmed that there are diverging opinions on the cultural relevance of smoking shisha, with some communities emphasizing its social significance and others maintaining that this practice is outdated. Administration heard that shisha continues to hold cultural significance, particularly for African and South Asian communities, and in some cases can provide a safe environment for women in impacted communities to gather. Next slide, please. The City Safety Codes team reviewed the Shisha Lounge Ventilation and Isolation Engineering Report that had previously been provided by stakeholders advocating for indoor shisha consumption. The American Society of Heating, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Engineers, or ASHRAE, is a professional association responsible for advanced heating, ventilation, air conditioning and refrigeration systems design and construction. And it is considered North America's leading authority on indoor air ventilation and its standards have been adopted within the Canadian National Building Code. ASHRAE's position is that there are limits to what engineering controls can do when it comes to smoke and that all smoking activity inside and near buildings should be eliminated. Next slide, please. In consideration of stakeholder feedback from health authorities, community members and North American air ventilation standards, and in alignment with the Healthy City, city Plan goal, administration is recommending that no bylaw amendments be made with respect to reintroducing the allowance of indoor shisha consumption. If committee were to direct administration to allow for indoor shisha consumption, a robust public engagement uh, with Edmontonians, as well as changes to both the public places bylaw and the business license bylaw would be required. Next slide, please. And we'd like to thank you and are pleased to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we will hear from our speakers, but I would like to read out um, how we will follow uh, the process. For each item, administration provide, may provide opening remarks or a presentation. Members of public who have registered to speak will then be invited to make their presentations. Speakers will be heard in panels and each speaker will have five minutes to present. The clerk will run the official timer in council chamber or in River Valley room. The timer lights on the podiums will be green for the first four minutes, turn yellow when there is one minute remaining, and flash red when the five minutes are up. If you are participating virtually, you may wish to use a timer of your own. When everyone in your panel has had a chance to present, members of council may ask questions of you or other panel members. For this reason, you may wish to remain in the meeting until all questions have been asked of your panel. If you are participating virtually, Please remember to mute your micro microphone when you are not speaking and refrain from using the raise hand function as it creates issues of fairness and decorum. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties, please reach out to the office of the city clerk using the contact information provided in your confirmation of registration or at city.clerk at edmonton.ca. If you are here with us in person, the clerk will guide you to your seat when it is your turn to speak. In the event of an emergency, please follow the clerk's directions to evacuate. City staff will direct you to your muster point. I will now call up. Oh, before you do that, can we just have a last minute speaker. Can we get a vote to add him to the speaker list? Certainly, yes. yes. I just sent you his name in, in the chat. Thank you, Clerk Youssef. Uh, and for which item would that be? For 7.1? 7.1, yeah. Okay. So I would like to ask my colleagues to vote to all include Omar Yacoub in, uh, as a speaker for item 7.1. Thank you.
Are there any questions about admitting the... Councillor Rice, go ahead. Um, so the, the new speaker is from, represent any organization? Or I just the individual? Yeah, I believe his uh, Islamic family, we're just, gonna, we're just getting the paperwork, but um, he might be representing that organization. Oh, okay. But I'll get that to you right away, okay. yeah. Okay, I'll ask committee members to vote on accepting Omar as a speaker. We have four votes. Please display the vote, and that has carried. So now I will, um, I know Rochelle, you are online. Christopher, Sakura, you can come on up. The clerk will guide you to your seat. Rena Sorensen is online. Avnish, you can come on up. And Omar, are you with us online? Has he, has he joined the meeting yet? We, we've aware? sent him the Google Meet, so he might just be joining a little late. We'll okay. just give him some time, yeah. That sounds great. So we will be starting uh, Rochelle Schindler, and I would just like to ask that if you are speaking on behalf of uh, Alberta Health Services or on someone else or another organization, please just um, acknowledge that. So Rochelle, please go ahead. You have five minutes. Sure thing. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Dr. Rochelle Schindler. I'm a Medical Officer of Health with Alberta Health Services Provincial Promoting Health Department, which includes tobacco, vaping, and cannabis program. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to address the committee today. Uh, next slide. Oh, those are actually Chris's slides, but that's okay. We'll just forge forward. Um, I also want to acknowledge the land this morning, um, particularly noting that uh, Wednesday is National Indigenous Peoples Day, and I'm grateful for the elders and knowledge keepers who have informed my own reconciliation path. In my presentation, I'm going to focus on uh, the uh, update on the health hazards related to water pipe smoking, uh, as well as addressing some myths uh, associated with herbal uh, and non-tobacco water pipe smoking. And my colleague, Dr. Chris Sikora, um, will be following with the importance of maintaining water pipe smoking protection under Edmonton's Public Places Bylaw and how it supports your 10-year strategic plan. So the backgrounds of origin and of water pipe use doesn't need an introduction. We've already talked about it a bit here, but I wanna draw your attention to a few pieces. Um, first, that sacred and traditional indigenous tobacco use is different and distinct from cultural use. And uh, this is important uh, because cultural relevance is not the same as a sacred practice. Um, and I believe I am on slide six presently, um, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Um, and so these are not regulated in the same way. So the research is clear that water pipe smoking, whether it contains tobacco or not, has been shown to pose significant harms to the health of the consumer and those exposed to admissions, um, including people who work in these locations. I do acknowledge the cultural context of shisha and uh, water pipe smoking, um, but I also want to reiterate that establishing public spaces for people to enter um, means that risk is not just for the people that is culturally relevant, um, but also the broad public. Um, additionally, if we're talking about gender-based analysis, any harms then would be disproportionately burdened uh, upon, uh, for example, women. Uh, next slide. So many countries in the Middle East have implemented restrictions on water pipe smoking in public places, given its recognition by the WHO as a cause of cardiovascular and lung disease. And the recommendations from administration align with the highly protective regulations that have been implemented in jurisdictions where water pipe smoking is the most prevalent. Next slide. During the COVID-19 pandemic, there were restrictions uh, strengthened uh, against water pipes to contribute because it could contribute to the spread of disease. And uh, given the common practice of sharing pipes, COVID is not the only pathogen which could be spread this way. Uh, meningitis, influenza, and uh, strep throat, which is, can also cause uh, flesh-eating disease, are readily spread by contact with saliva. 
In addition to spread of infectious disease, health concerns about increasing water pipe smoking among youth has led Turkey, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Kuwait, and Singapore to ban water pipe smoking in public places. And these same health concerns exist in Alberta. Despite the restrictions on water pipe smoking in public places in many countries where the practice is prevalent, industry indicate that they're responding to a demand from a cultural viewpoint, while they are failing to acknowledge the marketing activities that underlie this demand. Water pipe smoking is being actively marketed as a popular way to spend times with friends socializing, um, and patronage at shisha establishments is not culturally exclusive. Next slide. So shisha is promoted in sweetened fruit and candy flavors that appeal to young people. And it's also sometimes portrayed as a traditional activity appealing to people's sense of identity and heritage. Among the most common reasons for people, especially youth, to be interested in smoking hookah are positive viewpoints uh, related to fun or new experiences and misconceptions about the risk. 18% of Albertan students in grade nine to 12 report having tried hookah. And in the 2021 Canadian Tobacco and Nicotine Survey, about half of water pipe users under the age of 35 identified as non-smokers. And in fact, Canadians who vape are 14 times more likely to use water pipes than non-vapers, which speaks to the transition of young people to less stigmatized but equally harmful smoking practices rather than a cultural trend. Next slide. I can also speak to the real challenges by, that we've noted in inspecting uh, these shisha lounges in Calgary. Um, and so challenges include the packaging being discarded to facilitate storage so we can't identify what the product is and testing it just isn't feasible. Additionally and importantly, we found that ventilation units are often turned off to reduce noise, cost, or even improve the smoky ambience. So I will pass it over to Chris. Thank you, Rochelle. Uh, Chris, you go ahead. You have five minutes. No, thank you very much. And, and thank you very much for the opportunity to, to, to speak to Council today. So I'm Chris Sikor. I'm the Lead Medical Officer of Health for the Edmonton Zone and a proud resident of Alberta's capital city. Our next slide. So AHS applauds the work that Council has done over the years to support and encourage healthy behaviors for all Edmontonians. Edmonton is leading Alberta in many areas of public health, including the behaviors and actions chosen by its citizens. Compared to the rest of the province, Edmonton and area reports a lower daily smoking average. Since July 2020, the city is ranked as one of Canada's leading jurisdictions through, public, through the Public Places Bylaw that provides for utmost protection for the health of the public by prohibiting all forms of indoor smoking including water pipe smoking in public places. By maintaining the public places bylaw as it stands, this further supports Edmontonians and its visitors to participate in healthy behaviors and actions and aligns directly with health, the healthy city strategic goal of Edmonton's 10-year strategic plan. With smoking contributing to over 4,000 deaths in this province annually, we see no foreseeable benefit to the public health by opening up the public places bylaw. Our next, next slide. One more, one more slide, please. Oh, there we go, thanks. So there are a number of health risks when water pipe smoking is carried out in public places. This includes the specific health risks such as cancer, heart disease, and lung disease, both to the individual smoking and to others exposed to the secondhand smoke, including the combustion products, products of the heating source. As my colleague, Dr. Schindler addressed earlier, there are also risks from social modeling of water pipe smoking, along with access and appeal to youth and the spread of infectious diseases. Employees working in spaces where water pipe smoking occurs are exposed to the toxic chemicals in water pipe smoke. Beyond the pandemic, there are many risks to public health when water pipe smoking is carried out in public places. This includes specific health risks to the individual along with health risks to the non-consuming public. The actions recommended in the June 2023 report here today and the actions taken by the City of Edmonton in enacting by the, the bylaw to protect the health of the public is one that, the, that should be applauded. And here's why. Our next slide. So the smoking bylaw eliminates risks that arise specifically as a result of the consumption of in public places and it introduces the highest level of protection for members of the public. It protects youth from susceptibility to initiating use because of social modeling normalizing smoking behavior. It protects young adults from perpetuating harmful smoking behaviors that is commercialized to increase appeal. It protects patrons from the health harms of secondhand smoke exposure. It protects every member of society from community spread of, of infectious diseases. 
It protects employees from, in, from the industry of precari and pr precarious and, and inequitable working conditions. And it further extends protection to a broader workforce performing their essential civic duties like health inspectors, enforce, enforcement services, as well as first responders. The actions taken to remove the public protection established by the bylaw are actions that serve to is selectively diminish protection for selective members of the public and does not reflect the additional evidence published from indoor ventilation since 2019. Our next slide. So in 2012, uh, Alberta government in collaboration, in collaboration with Alberta Health Services published the Environmental Public Health Indoor Air Quality Manual. The manual proceeds to ultimately conclude that the only effective means of reducing the risk for adverse health outcomes is to eliminate smoking activities indoors. The manual emphasizes that control measures such as ventilation and dedicated smoking rooms are not recommended as even separately enclosed Separately exhausted, negative pressure smoking rooms do not keep secondhand smoke from spilling into adjacent areas. There are significant harms associated with the smoking of herbal or non tobacco shisha, um, and not only for those partaking, but others that would be exposed as well, including workers. Studies in Alberta have found that the herbal shisha contains often tobacco nicotine in spite of labeling otherwise. Other jurisdictions, such as the U.S. Surgeon General, the World Health Organization, are therefore recommending similar protections as indicated as the health risk uh, from the combustion of herbal shisha are similar to those of tobacco shisha, including exposure to carcinogens. Next slide. This is also supported by ASHRAE, uh, where they actually do take the position that the only means of avoiding health effects and eliminating indoor smoking Tobacco smoke exposure is to ban all smoking activity inside and, and near buildings. So I think my time is up, and thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sakura and Dr. Schindler, and thank you for your own time control. <laughs> That's nice. Uh, next, we'll go to Rena Sorensen. Please go ahead. You have five minutes. Good morning. Uh, my name is Rena Sorensen, and I'm here representing Ash Canada Action Against Smoking and Health. I'm actually on the board of Ash, um, so I'm I'm a pinch hitter today. Usually, you would have less Hagen speaking, um, but I will tell you that I'm a respiratory therapist um, by trade. So there's I have ten points for you. Some of it's replicating what was already spoken, but the evidence is quite clear. Um, Health Canada and the U.S. Centers for Disease Control. The evidence is very, very clear that there is no safe uh, level of secondhand smoke. And shisha is just as harmful as other sources of secondhand smoke like tobacco. So um, I'm a, a fan of evidence and I hope that council is too. Same thing going with the, um, the, with the ASHRAE report. There's no practical means of ventilating secondhand smoke. And so to propose that um, Edmonton businesses invest in that is, uh, is wasteful and probably disrespectful to them to ask them to spend the money on something that the evidence is very clear on that it, it will not work. Um, I'm here to tell a personal story as well. So all workers deserve uniform protection. And so I'm here to tell you, um, I was a part, I, I very much understand the economic boom that Shisha represents. Um, I was a dance instructor years ago um, and there were, with every new Shisha establishment an opening in Edmonton, um, they needed more belly dancers to support that wave. And so I was brought in because there was just so many of them to be brought in. And I'm a respiratory therapist and I understand tobacco and the risks of secondhand smoke. And I believed them, you know, this is a long time ago, I'm retired, um, but I believed them that it was dried fruit and it smelled like incense to me. And I trusted uh, the city of Edmonton to protect me, just like I trust uh, them to protect me from tobacco. So. I danced in, I've been in, I don't know how many Shisha establishments as an entertainer. Uh, and there was a circuit of girls that all worked and I have extremely fond memories and I, I personally benefited economically from it. I do understand the trend um, that is not necessarily um, culturally relevant because I've been to places like Morocco and Egypt and 
you don't see women smoking shisha there like you do in Canada. So we have our own sort of thing that we've developed here and it was a lot of fun and, and, you know, it, it's very, it, there's a lot of economic um, money to be made from that type of business transaction. But I tell you, I would trade it all, all the money I made and all those fabulous memories that I have. Um, if I could save my friend, one of our belly dancers is now dealing with a very aggressive form of cancer. And she's a mom like me, uh, who both of us, you know, were professionals and we thought we had what it took to make healthy choices. And yet we were sort of um, misled because we, we believed that city council regulations, you know, all of the public health um, systems that were in place would protect us. And turns out we were wrong. So I would like you to think of my friend <laughs> when you're making this decision today uh, because she cannot work. Um, the people who do work in the industry, sometimes it's precarious employment. So if you have a, a, a you know, minimum wage job, um, it's gonna be a little bit more difficult for you to stand up for yourself and say, you don't want to be exposed to this at work. Um, when it, you know, it's, it's serious employment consequences can come up if you complain. Um, it's not a level playing field. So you're, you're undermining the decision made in 2018 that made for fair business practice. Um, there's an absolute economic advantage to allowing, uh, to having this inconsistent approach to business regulation. So um, opening up a can of worms there. Um, they, they had lots of time to prepare. This is not new information that this ban would be coming or might stay. So um, I think you, you've done your due diligence there and you would but not be alone. There's dozens of Canadian com communities uh, there, there's a recent poll that shows that uh, one in, only one in five Edmonton respondents um, support restoring hookah, hookah bars, according to a ledger, uh, ledger public opinion poll. So um, you would not be alone. You would be in the majority to make the healthy and the right decision today, um, al along with some of the, you know, uh, disease, uh, sorry, what's the term, um, communicable diseases, right? The the way that the tips are handed out, it does not protect you. You're an inhaling from water. And my time is up. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Avnish Nanda. Avnish, please go ahead. You have five minutes. Thank you. Um, I represent the Edmonton Hooker Cultural Society, uh, which uh, is comprised of members of the African, Arab, and South Asian community here in Edmonton for whom Shisha consumption is an integral part of their cultural identity. And um, th there's a lot to say even in the presentations that preceded me. And I just want to stress one thing is that um, as part of the consultation the city engaged in was to reach out with racialized hijabi women, Muslim women, about their experiences uh, since the shutdown of Shisha lounges. And there's a lot of things that the city of Edmonton does a good job with. But one thing uh, that I think over the past years is clear is providing safe spaces for members of that community to congregate. And in the consultation that the city admin engaged in, it was clear that um, Shisha lounges represented to these women safe spaces, uh, spaces where they can um, meet with and socialize with their peers to sit down and feel safe. The closure of Shisha lounges uh, removed that from a, from a commercial social establishment. And uh, as, you know, the direct engagement revealed, it's made the city a less safe uh, space for those individuals. And it's not just, uh, you know, racialized hijabi women who have uh, uh, outlined this, it's other members of the Arab, African, and South Asian community who says, who've said that the city reflects them less with the closure of shisha lounges. Uh, in addition to that, um, you know, while there has been a complete total ban of shisha lounges, a no tolerance approach City Council has gone and liberalized uh, alcohol, uh, pu public alcohol consumption uh, in city parks. Um, members of City Council have been um, kind of a aggressive in promoting that aspect, despite public safety and public health warnings to the contrary, including by AHS. So we have an inconsistency of who uh, city policy, city admin, seems to reflect in these decision making. Um, in from an economic uh, impact, at the height, there were about 50 lounges in the city. 
50 shisha lounges that were owned and employed pr primarily uh, members of the African, Arab, and South Asian community, and we were left with about four. Um, as soon as the ban came into effect, 80 to 90 percent of their staff was fired. Uh, these are people who, who have difficulties finding employment in other sectors. Um, in terms of the city admin report that responds to the engineering study that we provided, uh, I noticed a, a number of inconsistencies, and it appears as if perhaps because of resource constraints, city admin did not actually engage in an engineering review. What they in fact did was looked at uh, a set of American standards and try to line things up rather than actually having an engineer review the report and see if it meets the uh, clear requirements and directions of city council of what would be needed to bring back shisha consumption. Um, from our perspective and our, what our engineer found, which is independent third party, uh, was that smoke exposure to employees and people who are not in the consumption room would be similar to folks attending a Korean barbecue restaurant or a Hindu temple where open flame um, burning happens, where people are exposed to smoke exposure. So if we're able to tolerate those cultural experiences and the harms associated with that, why not shisha consumption? Um, in a jurisdictional review, I think it was also interesting that Edmonton is likely the only city or maybe in Ottawa that bans shisha consumption. Um, and I, I just think that's revealing that, you know, we should be aspiring to do what a Toronto or a Montreal or a Vancouver does rather than a Sherwood Park or one of these smaller centers because we have a larger, um, a more culture diverse population. Uh, another thing that was uh, interesting in this jurisdictional review that I think the city should consider and something we've been advocating for the start is that allow for a private venue license. Um, that's something that I think is a middle ground approach that could address these potential concerns. Um, those are just my comments and something I hope the city uh, admin considers and council considers as it moves forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next I'll call for Omar Yacoub. Are you online with us? I am. Can you hear me? Hi, yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. You have five minutes. Thank you so much. I would like to say to city council that I am strongly in favor of the ban. Um, I support the team at Islamic Family, a social change organization based in Edmonton that has been here for 30 years. Shisha is not part of my identity. Lounges where I cannot breathe are not safe. The overwhelming opinion of community leaders and scholars is that Shisha should be prohibited on public health grounds. The idea that there should be an exemption for cultural reasons is glib and based on a false logic that brown lungs are different. I urge council to continue the ban. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we've heard from all of our speakers, so I'll just ask my colleagues to please sign up to ask questions of the speakers. Councillor Knack, you selected this item. Would you like to go first? Sure. Yeah, I don't. I, I know we've discussed this quite a bit <laughs> over the years, and 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 so I don't have a ton of questions. Uh, actually, I think it was Councillor Wright who originally moved the motion, so I'm a, I'm willing to defer to her first if uh, if that's okay with you as chair. Are there any other committee members that have any questions? No. Okay, Councillor Wright, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, and I, I did put the motion forward because as I, as I saw um, from, I guess, previous decisions that um, the, the industry was tasked with, with coming up with mitigation strategies. And, um, and I think they've done that now with the engineering report. So I wanted them to have the opportunity to bring that forward um, for, for committee and for council to, to look at. Um, so when I, I guess when, when I look at the, the definition of mitigation, um, it's to make less severe and it's not necessarily to eliminate it altogether. Um, so I'm wondering, Dr. Sikora, do, uh, ha, have you looked at the report, the, the engineering report for uh, ventilation? HS didn't have the opportunity to review the engineering report. Oh, no? Okay. Um, just, I guess, for in general, then, um, would, you know, would some ventilation requirements or restrictions in that, would that help to reduce the, 
um, you know, the, the amount of smoke in the air? I think it, engineering efforts could be done to reduce the amount of, of hazardous material, toxic chemicals that are in, in these indoor smoking environments, but it doesn't adequately eliminate the risk. Right. The goals yeah. of uh, health, uh, whether that be uh, referencing the, uh, our broad-based health organizations, uh, uh, like Health Canada, World Health Organization, are to actually eliminate the risk for the, the non-essential, or to eliminate the risk for those individuals that may frequent those environments. There is continued risk to others and secondary risk around bringing tobacco smoke home on one's clothes risk to workers in those environments that have to service even the enclosed space or the adjacent space next door, as well as risk to individuals that might have to go in from a first response or from an inspection perspective. So engineering can help reduce, but it doesn't eliminate. Our goal is to actually eliminate, and that's ultimately the whole purpose. Okay. And I guess how realistic is it to eliminate all risk in the workplace? I mean, I, I think, you know, occupational health and safety, we, you know, you try to, to reduce it, but you can't eliminate it. Um, and then I'm also looking at, you know, other health risks um, for other, you know, for, as a result of other businesses, you know, things like fast food restaurants that have, um, you know, sugar, high fat things. How, how can... How can we be expected to control everybody's, I guess, choice uh, as to what they, what, what they want to um, access and, and what risks they want to take? I think that's, that's, that's a very fair point. Um, the bylaw doesn't infringe on an individual's choice to be able to partake in this particular activity. Okay. What it does is have that envelope of protection for those that are secondarily impacted. If, if I choose to eat uh, high fat or high sugar food, that's my personal risk and it doesn't impact those around me. In the indoor spaces and the bylaw is designed, um, the controls are to protect others beyond the individual who is, protect, who is participating in that activity. Okay. There are plenty of activities that can be un, done in the privacy of your own home that don't impact others. Shisha as well as the indoor tobacco smoking is something that impacts other individuals, therefore it's incumbent upon council to be able to have bylaws and regulations to be able to help reduce risk for those individuals. So then where would the greater risk be? I'm thinking somebody consuming shisha in their home without adequate or, or sort of ramped up ventilation um, or in a space maybe where, where children aren't allowed um, with, with, with better ventilation requirements. So, City of Edmonton doesn't regulate the indoor spaces the, in one's home, so it's difficult to compare and contrast those risks. Whereas but but if you're if if you're sitting in your living room at home and you've got the kids over and the grandkids, are they are they more susceptible to that secondhand smoke risk? And the and I think it's referred to as third hand, being stuck on clothing and children's toys and whatnot. Is that a greater risk to those children than if they weren't allowed in? Uh, a well-ventilated private establishment. It very well could be a, a, an increased risk and maybe a higher risk because it's difficult to, to describe and have any understanding of what an indoor household ventilation process might look like. Certainly the risk is there and we implore that no one should start smoking. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that we actually would like to see a smoke-free Canada at some point in the future. Several other countries have started to move down that pathway. There are no public health benefits to cigarette smoking or tobacco smoking or shisha or water pipe smoking of any sort. So we do hope to get away from this, having public space approaches and bylaws that help reduce and eliminate risk as much as possible is a step towards reducing modeling, reducing initiation, as well as reducing the consumption of smoking in our overall society. Okay, thank you. Oh, my time is up, so thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Knack? Sorry, Councillor Knack, you're still muted. Dr. Sikora, um, Mr. Nando's present. Emily? I think it's still just even? delayed. I think it's just delayed. Now we can hear you. 
All right. I'm going to get going. Um, Dr. Sakura, I was curious uh, about your response, Mr. Nanda, in his presentation, talked about um, the potential risk of something like, say, Korean barbecue versus uh, shisha. And um, curious from a medical perspective if, if there is a, a difference from, from the research, from the studies, because um, I, I, I'm not an expert and I just wouldn't mind any insight you could provide on that. I'll admit, Councillor Knack, that I have a difficult time balancing that, that risk comparison. Um, what we, so, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start with what we do know, um, or what, what we do know from uh, shisha lounges as well as uh, smoking, uh, whether that be tobacco or, or other substances, is that there are carcinogenic, or carcinogenic materials that are emitted both from charcoal, from the substances that are burned, um, it, and other, other material that is either, either addictive, such as nicotine, and that have an impact on individuals, uh, as well as those that, that might be secondary or tertiary, tertiarily impacted. We know that the end result of exposure to those carcinogenic materials is, in the long term, heart disease, lung disease, as well as uh, uh, cancer overall. Now, I, I, I haven't looked at the specific studies of uh, an, an overall average of particulate matter or, or substances that are present within an average Korean barbecue restaurant. So again, I, I have a difficult time uh, doing a risk comparison to that overall. But what I do know is that the, the risks associated with tobacco smoke and tobacco exposure are significant, are known, and it's incumbent upon, uh, I, th I think, all of, all of society to be able to help reduce those risks as well. As well. Uh, Councillor Mack, just Thank because you. you referenced oh. um, something I said. Oh, just I hold said. on. You, sorry to interrupt, sure. but um, Councillor Knack would need to ask the question of you. <laughs> Councillor Knack? I, I'd be happy to have Mr. Nanda respond. That's, yeah. that's perfectly fine. Okay, yeah, please go ahead. Sure. Um, Councillor Knack, I, I kind of prefaced um, my um, position on with the mitigation efforts that we had proposed that uh, my friend um, Dr. Segura has not reviewed. Um, another thing I just want to stress is just, uh, and maybe Dr. Segura just missed this, but this is the third time we've been before City Council and we've <laughs> reviewed this point um, to death that there's no nicotine and there's no tobacco in uh, herbal shisha consumption. So when we talk about the risks associated with products that contain nicotine and tobacco, we're not talking about what we're proposing or what has been in place in commercial shisha consumption in Edmonton since at least 2005. Um, so it, it's very, um, uh, you know, it's very difficult to have a conversation with Alberta Health Services on this when they st keep pointing to products and methods of consumption that are not even being proposed uh, by anyone here today. No, I appreciate that. Um, I think the last question, and, and Mr. Yacoub, I, I appreciate you coming today and, and sharing your perspective. And, and you know, we're we're having a bit of a conversation today about, and, and it's it's frustrating to feel like it's an either or. It's it's either public health or it's or it's um, ensuring that there are appropriate locations based off cultural need for folks to gather and come together. Um, but but in a way, because we we do know the sort of broader health conversation. I, I guess I'm just wondering, you, you were very quick in your presentation. You, you sort of had a very, very quick message about why why you don't think it should continue. Um, and I was just wondering if you could maybe expand on that perspective a little bit more, uh, but I realize I'm, I'm actually pretty much out of time. So maybe I'll come back around to, to ask you that if that's okay. I would also like to point out that AHS requested that engineering report uh, several times and we didn't receive it. Okay, Councillor Rice, please go ahead. Uh, 
thank you everyone and for your presentation. Um, the first question go to Dr. Sikara. Uh, specific, uh, I would like to have better understanding about in your presentation, uh, talk about herb, herbal uh, is not equal safer. So can you explain a little bit more from like your professional uh, expertise? And because of what I heard here and then uh, this proposal is all about herbal. So what is specific evidence, scientific evidence and can demonstrate uh, even herbal for this shisha smoke and still not safe? So I just want to get a bit, little bit more evidence on that piece. No, thank you very much, Councillor Rice. Uh, and, and I may ask Dr. Schindler to expand on this yeah, as well. Yeah, sure, sure, um, yes. So when, when products of combustion are, are breathed in, they, they do cause and do have the potential to cause damage to the lungs overall. There was a, an, an interesting study uh, that, that identified, you know, well, burn some stuff and then expose the, the smoke to uh, uh, lung tissue overall, so in tissue culture, in a laboratory-based setting. And they identified that there was similar damage uh, found in that tissue culture, lung tissue, to mm. charcoal, to tobacco, to the syrup, uh, really signifying that if you burn it, it's gonna cause damage to your lungs overall, and that's in the acute sense, but also in the chronic sense. So while there might not be nicotine within the, the products of combustion at a, at, at a shisha lounge, it still causes damage. Smoke is smoke, smoke causes damage, smoke causes harm. There is, and I'll pass it over to Dr. Schindler as well, if I can. So no matter, and it's, and it's like to pay call or it's a herb, herbal. That's okay. correct. Thank yeah. you for that clarification. Yeah. Um, so is Dr. Uh, Dr. Shen? Yeah, I, yeah, you have I, anything I, to add? Yeah, I mean, it, just in terms of some of that uh, broader pieces of evidence around non-tobacco containing smoke. I mean, we're all dealing with wildfire smoke and air quality issues here uh, in Alberta over the last couple of months. And obviously there's not a lot of tobacco in that smoke. Um, still with the high particulate matter, um, we see every uh, time that that air quality um, uh, worsens that you're going to see uh, increased presentations with heart attacks, you're going to see exacerbations of asthma, you're going to see, uh, and then over the long term, uh, then we start to also see those things that uh, Dr. Sakura was referring to with in terms of uh, long-term damage to the heart and lungs. So, you know, it's, it's something that Yes, there's that piece that, okay, it may not contain tobacco, uh, but the smoke itself is still harmful. And then the additional piece is that um, there's the aspect of social modeling um, and the idea that, you know, when someone is smoking, you just see the smoke. You can't actually look at the method, um, uh, the modality that they're smoking. Um, and this social modeling piece is, is important because, like I mentioned, we're seeing people who are, uh, moving towards, especially young people who are moving towards vaping and water pipe and these other methods of smoking because they perceive it as safer um, when they're still damaging their lungs. Uh, thank you very much and then uh, for the uh, information. Um, so next question go to Mr. Landa. Uh, you mentioned earlier as uh, there's some like mitigation strategy and you proposed. Can you describe a little bit more what type of mitigation strategy and you proposed? Uh, yes, and I believe your office received a copy of the engineering report that was prepared by a third-party engineer um, who signed off on it that applies um, what happens in the industrial process where noxious and other dangerous substance, including smoke, are emitted to prevent any second-hand, third-hand exposure to staff, at, um, in this case, staff at a shisha establishment, as well as those who do not want to partake. So we're talking... Um, thick uh, glass uh, barriers between smoking and non-smoking areas, the most um, industrial grade air ventilation system that exists, um, air locks between the consumption and non-consumption areas, separate entrances so that 
um, smoke does not flow into the non-consumption uh, so area. So this has all been I'm, provided I'm going, and Sorry, detailed. I'm going to stop you here yeah. and because of my time. Uh, so in Funasi's case, what is the specific reason why, and is it based on three time requests, the engineer reports was not provided? Well, f the first consultation, there was no consultation with the industry. Uh, city admin decided to consult with one Shisha Lounge owner. Uh, when that was, pr last time we appeared, uh, I think two years ago now, we provided a modeling and then uh, I believe Councillor Mack and Councillor Paquette said that they needed an additional uh, report, which we went and did at our own cost, but most of these businesses are no longer in business. So we're here today on a good faith basis uh, with the evidence to show that this is an effective mitigation strategy. So we're kind of complying with what the city told us to comply with. Okay, thank you. Your time is up, but I'm going to carry on asking you a question. Uh, you had said that uh, under no circumstances there's nicotine in the shisha. I do recall reading a study where they did uh, find. So that's a study that shows that I think certain uh, herbal shisha producers were lying in the content of the product. That is not an Alberta study. I don't know, maybe it is an Alberta study, but I think that particular manufacturer of herbal uh, shisha was the problem, not that all herbal shisha is problematic because much of it is coconut shells or other products that my, my friend is correct that when you consume something that's combustible, there are issues, but it does not contain nicotine, does not contain uh, hashish, does not contain any of these other products that the province has banned. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Sakura, um, so you had said that any combustible material that's inhaled would be detrimental to, or not even inhaled, but secondhand smoke as well? Yes, that, that, that constitutes risk to the individual and could constitute risk to other individuals as well. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, Rena Sorensen, I, I do have a question for you and thank you for sharing your personal story and I'm sorry to hear about your friend. I, I, I you. hope the best for her. Um, can you tell me uh, in your experience, your professional experience, have you seen um, instances where um, people have had respiratory issues? Uh, so Link specifically to shisha, um, that's been difficult to track. Like even in the pulmonary function labs where we test your lungs and we, we have to document smoking history, we actually don't know how to document shisha history in, in Canadian terms it's relatively new. So I don't, um, I don't have personal experience with that because we're still trying to catch up with it. I wonder if probably some of the physicians from AHS, do you know, do you have any statistics on shisha related disease? I apologize, I'm not prepared for that question. Yeah, no, evidence. no, that's okay, no problem at all. I don't know if uh, Dr. Schindler or Dr. Sakura could answer. From my perspective, it would be fairly challenging to pull that apart, just given the uh, frequency of co-use um, with shisha and um, other tobacco products. Right, okay. Thank Recognizing you. that even though shisha may be herbal, the cumulative impacts may be similar, so. Yeah, like in the pulmonary function lab, because we don't know how to, to do it, we actually would probably label it as tobacco. So we would say it's about this many packs cigarettes per day is about how much you should per day, you know, so it's the, the data we have is skewed. Sorry to tell you it's, it's in terms of research, she says fairly new to us as far as our ability to research it. Okay. Yeah. No, thank you for those answers. Uh, I'm done with my questions. Next I'll go to Councillor Rice. I have a question for the administration. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wright, please go ahead. Uh, Councillor Knack is on again. Councillor Knack, please go ahead. Uh, just looking to get a, a response from Mr. Yakub. I know he, he probably has to leave right away. So if you have any quick thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you so much, Councillor Knack. I really appreciate your question about community spaces. Shisha joints are a very small subset of the spaces where community congregates. 
And in fact, they are very low in terms of per perceived and actual safety for many of the same reasons people feel bars are unsafe. One of the things the Shisha Ban has done is it has encouraged alternative spaces in the community to flourish. Uh, community groups, university settings, other places have benefited from the Shisha Ban. Uh, in addition, restaurants and other places that don't serve Shisha continue to flourish, continue to remain vibrant. And so I would uh, reiterate the previous point that the Shisha Ban is something that is, is really helpful. Also, two other small points. While Korean barbecue is wonderful, no one deeply breeds it again and again. Um, shisha is something different in that it's a it's something one is continuously ingesting into one's lungs. And while a report from AHS may be valuable, there's overwhelming evidence supporting a ban through the global public health research. Uh, this is a the ban on shisha is a global trend. Istanbul and other cities have already implemented such bans. And so, uh, thank you again for the question, and. Thank you for this, Ben, which has supported community spaces to flourish. Appreciate that additional information. Those are all my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Councillor Wright, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm, I'm not debating the health risks associated with smoking. Um, my mom died of lung cancer, and that was even after she tried to mitigate the risk by, by quitting smoking six or seven years previously. Um, so, but I do think um, that with the engineering report, and maybe that's something I will ask administration um, why that was not forwarded um, on for, for, for further analysis, um, that, that is concerning to me. Um, I'm also, I'm just wondering, um, so I mean we've got the, the, the health risk related to inhaling. Um, but what about the health risk for those women who found it to be a safer place um, to, to congregate, to be with community. What's the risk to their mental health not having those places to, to gather? Um, maybe Dr. Sikor or Dr. Schindler? I haven't looked at that in depth, okay. so I, I apologize. I really can't provide a, a, a fulsome answer in there. No, okay. Um, Dr. Schindler, do you have any comments? Just to reiterate um, Omar's point that providing a safe space means overall a safe space and that a smoke-free space is going to be a lot safer. Even though I think it says in the report something about it helps to relieve stress. Um, so if they don't have that, that opportunity, I guess. Okay, I, I'm just sort of concerned with mental health. Mr. Nanda, you talked about it being safer spaces for women. Yeah, and... Um, those stakeholders that were uh, consulted were members of my uh, the society that I represent. Um, it's women who've had experience of violence in the city because of their race, because of um, uh, how they appear in terms of their practicing their faith. And you know, I, I believe this uh, council has had a task force or a purposeful effort to mitigate harms to racialized hijabi women in in the in the in the wake of all the violence. And if you have a group saying that. You know, doing this complete ban has taken away a safe space for us to congregate, to socialize. I, you know, I think that should carry some weight. That should cause some reflection um, of who this ban is really benefiting. And if it's marginalizing the most marginalized within our community, people who have been subject to unspeakable acts of violence uh, with no mitigation or effort to address, uh, I think that should give this council at least some pause to see if what we're doing here does affect um, public safety in all of its aspects. Yeah, and I, I do think we have a responsibility to not only create a healthy city, but also an inclusive city, um, and also one that I think generates economic um, return for the city as well. And I'm just wondering, you'd mentioned that about 50 lounges have closed down with this ban? Yeah, there were about 50 at its height right before the ban, and we are now looking at four that operate, and we're you know, hundreds of hundreds of jobs have been lost. Okay. And, and have those gone to the surrounding municipalities that do allow the lounges? Yeah, there, um, Sherwood Park uh, has a, a loud a lounge. I think they're in the process of doing away with um, shisha lounges, but there's other municipalities that have popped up. There's also um, delivery shisha services that have emerged in, in Edmonton where uh, they deliver shisha to someone's house or for a party, but they do not, they serve non-herbal products. Okay. Um, and we're also seeing, um, like the Ottawa example, when Ottawa m went to move, uh, a lot of illegal venues opened up. 
uh, to meet with the demand. And unfortunately, we're seeing that as well, where there's no safety measures in place. Okay. Um, and then uh, just looking at the jurisdictional scan, I think um, there are there some other um, surrounding municipalities as well that, that still operate the lounges, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay. And have those... Um, have those businesses there sprung up since the ones here closed down in Edmonton? Yes. Uh, yeah. One of those businesses is actually owned by um, a member of our organization where um, he just opened up outside of the city. Um, and his preference is not is to be in Edmonton where he lives and, and such and where the community is. But um, those are tax dollars that are, go, you know, are going to a different municipality. Um, and, you know, I don't think there's any difference here. And And your members would be ready to come back to Edmonton? Uh, well, yeah, and, and to be clear, the engineering fix proposal, we, the proposal that we were suggesting the city adopt is not in place in anywhere in Canada, and it would be to the expense of you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to implement, but these lounge owners and these community members are so um, passionate about, uh, and, and it, tissue consumption is so integral to their identity that they're willing to make that investment. Okay, and one quick question. Is this ventilation system similar to what's operating out at Enoch Reserve? Uh, I, think, I think it's uh, it's it's something more substantial. Okay, that. Yeah. okay, thank you very much. Thank you, I think we are done with questions of the speakers. Does anyone else have any questions to the speakers? No? Okay, so I'll ask the speakers, uh, you're more than welcome to stay if you like to um, uh, hear what we have to ask of administration. So administration, please come forward. Great, Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you. Um, so, based on the presentation, uh, this topic specific come back to our council for, for several times since 2018 right now. And then, but the conclusion still the consistent is the same. So what I heard from city administration. Uh, so my question is when we draw those conclusion and because from 2018 to right now, there are so many factors change and we experience COVID-19, we experience other type of public safety and the public health uh, issues. And then in terms of what I heard during our earlier questions and answers, so inclusive fact and green generate economic city and also other multiple municipalities and has a seminar uh, process, uh, all those factors already considered. I just want to make sure and when we come back for this conclusion this time. Yes, um, I think that it was right and fair to examine the engineering report and to continue to examine this issue. Um, however, as we look at it, we still see that the public health concerns cannot be fully mitigated and I acknowledge that there is a difference between mitigation and prevention. Um, but we continue to look at the issue and apply that public health lens. And I think as well it's important to note that there is an equity that is provided in this public health lens on the public health concern. So we are um, equitable in how we are applying smoking and inhalation of products across our spaces as well. So. The, it is not an easy issue to tackle, and we understand that there may be economic benefits and there may be some cultural benefits as well, but we are very much focused on that public health consideration. Okay, so that, that means we actually really consider all the factors. But yes. Okay, okay that, that's very good to know. And then also the next question, if amendments, I know administration recommendation is against amendments and further. Uh, if amendment happens, that means I heard we have the public spaces amendment needs to be changed, and also the business license bylaw amendment. So for these two bylaws, and to follow up any amendment, potential amendment for the current this issue, that will take a larger public engagement, take a larger like effort, a, a, a larger time, and for the city to do it. And. So my question is, any like the public engagement re, 
regarding the public spaces um, bylaw and also business bylaw haven't happened or already happened. We would still need to do that engagement on this specific item. We have not done that. And Councillor Rice, just to be clear, when this motion was made, um, we were we were limited in, from a resource perspective to do broad public engagement. So we were um, clear that we were doing targeted stakeholder engagement as it relates to the report okay. before you today. Okay, that's that, that's a very good uh, to know that, and specifically, and because uh, I also heard the budget limitation as well. Right. Correct. Okay, so in that case, let's end on my question to administration. I'm going to put the motion and for receive this report as information. And thank you, City Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Rice. You're done asking? Okay, uh, we have a recommendation on the floor. Councillor Wright, please go ahead. Okay, um, so we talk, you talked about public health being of utmost importance. Yet when we spoke about um, the, um, the alcohol in parks, there was concern about public health issues at that time. And I'm just wondering what makes this different from that? I think ultimately there is very much the direct correlation between the second and third hand smoke impacts on individuals who may choose not to um, who, who are impacted by that smoke. Whereas with alcohol, the ingestion goes into the person and there isn't that second health impact to others. Oh, I think there is great health impact to others, especially those that we heard from, from these same cultural communities that um, were hesitant to, to frequent some of the parks because of, because of concern with, with people's alcohol consumption and the effect that it might have on them. Councillor, the parks program only affects a number of parks, not all parks in Edmonton. So I think that's where we decided to balance the health concerns. There are parks that do not allow alcohol consumption at this time, which can be frequented by individuals who are not comfortable in parks where alcohol is allowed. Yeah, and, and these lounges would only be accessible to those who are comfortable accessing those lounges, right? To some extent, there will always be workers who may not have a choice that would be working in those areas. There are city and other um, provincial and other inspectors who would have to inspect those areas and would, have, would be exposed to that. So there is a difference in that, yes, you, the large majority of people accessing the space would be doing so voluntarily, but there is also, just like with tobacco smoke and some of the decisions that were made there, people who may not have a choice who have to access this, that space. And they do so now on an ongoing basis, right? Our first responders, you know, even if they respond to a private home, they don't know what they might expect. That, that is part of the risk that we appreciate that they uh, take on. Um, and I'm just wondering, so we, we talk about having further engagement and consultation and why wasn't this done five years ago? <laughs> When it, when it first came to council? So there's been a number of different considerations with this file. And um, at the time, the direction was made to move towards removing the, to aligning the shisha with the tobacco. That was the decision of council at the time. And so the work that was done was to move towards that decision, that direction that council gave. Um, without a further direction, then these other aspects aren't examined. Okay. But would the decision of council at the time been different had they been given, um, I guess, a more, more robust uh, analysis? So Councillor Rice in 2019 uh, is when the direction from council was to um, prohibit all of the tobacco and tobacco-like products, including shisha. And there was a subsequent year to work with um, industry through that in terms of um, how and when to implement. And that's how we had it being implemented one year later in 2020. Subsequent to that, there was another report that administration brought forward in 2020, 2020 or 2021. 2021, my apologies, um, that looked at various conditions uh, or like in, in terms of being able to open this type but of the, business. The public engagement that was done, I believe, in 2019, it was a survey that was done, really didn't target the demographic of, 
of of those that that consume shisha or that that frequent these lounges. Is that right? I do believe that the um, information previously was focused on owners, um, and there has been a change in how we do engagement over the years. GBA Plus has become something that is standard for a lot of our reports now. It was not then. So there has been a shift in how we do our work okay. since then. Okay, I'm, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just concerned that, I guess maybe not all the, the proper information was provided in order to make that decision. Um, and then, oh, and then there was the question about the engineering report not being provided to AHS. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so the City of Edmonton does not own the engineering report. That means we're not able to share it without consent of the owner. Uh, we reached out to the, uh, the report owner. We advised them of our inability to share the report without consent and advised them of the parties that were asking for the report itself. We also told them we were unable to share it and would not be sharing it, but if they were interested, these were the contacts. Past that, the City of Edmonton has no ability to share the report. Okay, and was Mr. Nanda made aware of this representing the association? We did email him. Okay. At the correct email? Because I know originally it was the wrong one. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. That's all the time I have. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Knack? Thank you, Councillor Principe. I, I don't have any questions, um, but I wanted to, at the appropriate time, speak to it. And then uh, I thought what we would do, because I believe the original mover of the motion uh, Council Wright would like the opportunity to vote on this. So while I'm uh, supportive of requisitioning it up to allow her to have that opportunity, I also thought we could finish the debate here without, so that we don't have to re-debate it at what is currently a very packed council meeting. Okay, are you putting a requisition on the floor then? I would prefer to speak to it and have us speak to it before I say those words, because I believe once two of us say that, <laughs> that would essentially end the discussion at this meeting and, and thereby we would have to pick it up at a council meeting that's currently packed. So okay. um, I'll wait and then at the appropriate time, uh, Madam Chair, I'd love to speak to it and then I will ask that. All right, Councillor Paquette, do you have any questions? Uh, just a quick, uh, quick couple, yeah. Okay, please go ahead, Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so, in in this uh, in this report, uh, in terms of consultation, how many people did we speak to? We spoke to two um, people from uh, the impacted communities. Um, we had one additional uh, business owner uh, reach out as well. Okay, so three people. Yes, I believe that's correct, Councillor. Okay, uh, and we feel that uh, we've gotten a representative viewpoint uh, from those numbers? Administration was um, hoping, I think, and looking to speak to more. Um, we did uh, reach out through our contact to see if we could get more people to speak to, but we were unable to. We also aren't able to use our business license records to reach out to individuals through the freedom of information laws. And we had identified that it would be a very limited consultation given the short turnaround on this. So a more robust engagement would be required if we were to bring along bylaw amendments. Sure, uh, but do we feel that that's a, uh, you know, three uh, people is a good statistical representation. Councillor Paquette, we definitely recognize that if we were to pursue bylaw changes, that more robust engagement with Edmontonians would be an important aspect of making changes to the bylaws, and that's the work that we would do if we were directed for next steps. Okay, I see. Yeah, so the, yeah, it sounds to me like there might be a little bit more work that needs to be done in order to make, um, an informed decision that satisfies all communities because it's, I mean, or maybe I'm wrong. Uh, what do you think? Councillor Brigitte, I feel from the reflecting on um, the committee when this motion was originally made, the intent was to allow the opportunity for um, the business owners to be able to provide uh, a venue for their engineering report and information and for committee to be able to consider that. And so that is an important aspect of of the work that we conducted to get to the report today. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, sounds like we, we might need one last step before a final decision. I'm not sure, but uh, those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Any other questions? Okay, that is it for questions. We are to closing comments. Anyone to speak? Um, Clerk Youssef, should I go to Councillor Knack last since he was the... Oh, he's not I think the mover. I believe he's not Rice the mover. Put, yeah. He selected the item, but he's not the mover. Right, so Councillor Wright, please go ahead. Um, I want to speak to Councillor Knack, uh, to Councillor Knack moving the requisition of the item to, to Council, That's and that hasn't been done yet. Uh, you just need two councillors. speak to that. You just need two councillors to requisition an item, and that as hasn't. We haven't gotten another councillor to do that yet. Yeah. As um, soon I rather, sorry. Um, I rather um, the motion on the floor right now um, is to receive the inform uh, the report for information, and um, once that if that passes, the item is dealt with at the committee level. So just getting clarity on what is being requisitioned, like, good, if, if it is requisitioned. That is a very good point because if we requisition this, even if it goes to council, it's just to receive for information. You guys are doing that right now at the committee level? Right. So you'll be doing it again at the council or, or there'll be another, mo like, I don't know, but just uh, to get clarity on my understanding is that once we, um, it would just be for voting purposes at council? To make it easier, it would just, I, I would recommend just to withdraw receipt for information and just requisition the item if that's the will of committee. Councillor Rice? So we withdraw this motion received as information first and then we go to the requisition? If it's at the will of committee, if we have another councillor willing to do that yeah that would be my recommendation uh, so okay I can withdraw right now but the info requisition is not passed we have to go back yes okay yes absolutely thank you thank you yeah. so, so just clarification on requisition we just need to two counselors we don't need to vote on a requisition no all right and so it has been withdrawn, the receipt for information? So we don't need a vote for the yeah, requisition? No, no, it's not a vote. It's just two councillors verbally say requisition and the item is goes up to council and there's no debate. There's no vote to requisition. So if that's the case, I'm not always draw my motion. <laughs> okay, we'll put it back on the floor. All right, so we have a recommendation on the floor. And uh, Councillor Knack, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, I, I maybe have a, a, a slightly modified version of what I was suggesting a bit earlier. Because um, essentially what, what I'm trying to avoid is us having to speak to this at council because we have two packed days of council that we cannot afford time to, to relitigate something we've debated at committee. But I wanna give everyone the chance to speak. So. Um, this is unorthodox. It is, it is not a common way we have done a motion like this, but we could in fact amend this motion to say that, that a committee recommend to council that this report be received for information. Again, not a common approach, but it at least allows the motion to be fully debated by every other member of council. We can vote on this as committee and then council can vote on it. And if that motion were to fail us, a different motion could be put on the floor at council. So that would allow us to, because the minute two of us say the word, the, it ends the discussion, including when emotions on the floor. And I, I and I do want to respect Council Wright's wishes of uh, allowing her the chance to speak to this and vote on it, even if even if we likely will be on opposing sides of this discussion. So, um, 
uh, from a clerk's, uh, maybe I'll just confirm with the clerks, we could in fact make this, amend this motion to say that committee recommend to council that we receive for information. It's not common, but it's, but it's permitted. It is in order, I believe. If, if there's unanimous consent from the committee to do that, yes, we can do that. Okay. Then that's what I would suggest, which would then allow us to fully debate the item and it would allow this to be put on the council agenda, but it isn't, it would then not require us to all to speak to it at council. So um, I will make that hopefully as a friendly amendment. <laughs> uh, and, and if not, then I'll just put forward as a regular amendment um, so that we can get it on council, but still debate it here. So I'll ask committee members if they're agreeable to that. Well, just uh, to continue that, what I'm assuming is a point of order uh, is uh, that um, if it gets requisition to council, what that means is that at that time, uh, Council Wright can make a uh, subsequent motion regard um, unless the vote completely uh, goes uh, not the way that she wants and then the discussion would be over because the item is concluded. So that uh, there's a little bit of a, uh, a sticky wicket there and uh, procedurally um, all that does is give Council Wright an opportunity to vote but not to put forward a subsequent motion for uh, um, engagement uh, and uh, and in order for everyone to see those engineering reports and so on and so forth. So my concern is that if we do this, all we're doing is we're shutting the door for a period of 12 months before this comes back once again. And I'm just wondering if it would be better to just have the entire debate now. So, so that would be my so uh, my understanding is uh, you would a like little bit of a wrinkle and I, I'm sorry for that, but my understanding, Councillor Paquette, is that you're not agreeable to uh, referring this as a recommendation to Council? Well, either way, at this point, Council Wright cannot make a subsequent. So it, it gets a little tricky there. Um, hmm. Sorry, maybe just because it was my time at Councilor Paquette, I'm sorry. I, I, oh, I my apologies. Help clear that. It's okay, I, and I appreciate your perspective. Maybe just in the last moment of my time, uh, she would have that right if council chose not to accept the recommendation of this committee. But if a majority of councillors choose to accept the recommendation of the committee, um, and, and I imagine Councilor Wright would speak to why she would encourage council not to approve that recommendation so that she could make an alter alternative motion. If enough councillors felt that they, that they wanted to give her that opportunity, they could vote against the recommendation to receive her information and give her that opportunity. So I think there is a mechanism to do that, um, even with this recommendation going before. So that's that's why my, my amendment ideally would, would be to allow this to be recommended to council and then council can debate that, or rather we can debate it now and council can make a final decision next week. There is one other option here. Uh, point if, of if order. That, if you'll indulge me, Point Councilor. of order. <clears throat> the time, yeah, the time is around. off. The time is not tracking and then we have to follow the process. Apologies, we'll start it. We'll just give um, one more minute to Councillor Paquette first time very very quickly uh if this gets requisitioned it can be selected by uh councillor wright who at the outset can put a uh a motion on the floor immediately if she so chooses so there is that option and uh, i'm wondering if that would uh satisfy Are you looking for a response, Councillor Paquette, or just is that I your am, concern? but I, this yeah. is very informal, so. Yes, it is. Let's 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 try to uh, get back on track here. Uh, we need to make a decision on uh, if it is um, agreeable to committee members that Councillor Knack amend the motion that's on the floor and make it a recommendation to City Council to receive for information. Is that agreeable to committee members? Yeah, now that we've sort of thought through the process, I, I think I can get behind that. 
And Councillor Race? Uh, before, before we vote, I know we are debating here, and then just a, a few clarification questions to the um, administration. And then because this topic come back to one, two, three, four, five times already, and in the council for the discussion, even last time, and when the motion brought by Councilor Wright, we already had a very robust dis debate in the council already. And then I, I really appreciate uh, my colleagues' points, and we want to give the more opportunity for more debate. But to me, in for the debate already happened the last time when this motion say council direct administration to engage with stakeholders and provide options to allow indoor suicide smoking already and then debated last time in 2022. And then I did not say the further debate is needed at this point. So I rather uh, look at all the uh, strong recommendation from city administration at this moment. We are not going to that direction to amend, amend the bylaw. So I agree with that. I would align with our city did all this since 2018, all the robust engagement reports, all the analysis, and to follow that recommendation and just receive this as information. And then there is no further debate. I, I, I cannot say that further outcome will come from the repeated debate. And because the recommendation is already here. And then evidence is very clear and from all the speakers today. It, it's, uh, Councilor Rice, it's my understanding that we would finish debate here. It would just be for voting purposes. So we won't, uh, we will close debate here at committee level and it would just be for voting purposes. And also I, I heard my colleagues request on you, your process and because for the information received uh, at committee level and right now we try to get the information received at council level. And to me, and this is something uh, we are trying to deal with uniquely, I didn't say the specific reason why we need to do that. And I'm not convinced. Okay, so that was not a friendly amendment to, um, to uh, change it to recommendation to city council. So next, uh, we will go to Councillor Wright. Thank you very much, Councillor Principe. Um, so I, I, I'm looking at this as similar to the request that Councillor Rice had asked to be requisitioned to council so that she had the opportunity to vote on it uh, herself. And I think that was in regards to the Twin Brooks item. So um, am I missing something? Is, is this sort of the same thing, Clerk Yusuf? I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? Sorry, <laughs> to have the item um, uh, re requisition to council, um, would this be similar to what Councillor Rice had asked? Um, I think it was Urban Planning Committee to have them uh, requisition the, the Twin Parks decision to council so that she could vote on it? I, um, okay, I may have missed that meeting or okay. may have been <laughs> not paying attention, but um, yeah, like was that received for information at the committee level? Was there a motion on the floor? Yes, there. Uh, yes, there was. Or, to, uh, um, yeah, to have the decision um, rather than being made at the committee level, to have yeah. it requisitioned to the council so that she had the opportunity to vote on yeah, it. Yeah, that has happened before. That, okay, yes. so yes. It's, this yes. isn't this uncommon is not, then. No, to, no. To I just allow would voting. like. Yeah. So if this motion, you know, um, passes to receive it for information, we can still send the item up. If you have, there's two councillors on the committee willing to do that. We'll just put the history of the item at the committee level, and then council can do, at, and at the council level, you guys can decide what to do there okay. at, that, I'm, at that point. I'm kind of at the mercy of my colleagues here on committee now, um, as I was on it um, at the time that I made this motion. Um, because I, I think that, yes, it has been brought to council and debated at different opportunities, but I don't think there's been that full robust um, 
there's been missing information at each time. I think um, originally in 2018, 2019, there wasn't the full cultural community aspect that was looked at. Um, and then it, it, was, it was sent back to, to task the industry with providing that um, mitigation of the ventilation. Now that's come back and, and nobody has really had a chance to, to review that information. Um, so I, I do, I would appreciate it um, and, and going to council um, and allowing me the opportunity then to perhaps uh, put in a subsequent motion um, either for, for more fuller engagement um, or, or vote otherwise. So um, I, I would appreciate the committee's uh, entertaining me on this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Paquette? Thank you. Um, I think it's fair to say that there are gaps in our information. Um, and we need to make a decision that has every appearance and reality of being fair to both council um, as a measure of respect, but especially to the public and to the community. And I'm not sure we're there yet. And uh, this is a big question. Obviously, it's being debated around the world. So I don't think that we can just sort of brush it away because we don't want to talk about it anymore. So with that in mind, I'm, I'm going to uh, requisition. Just to clarify, Councillor Knack, do you still want to requisition this item? Not quite yet. I, I want and to debate it before we requisition. Yes. So well, it's out there and it is waiting for a response at any point. So we will um, finish discussion here at committee level. We will finish the debate. We will speak to it at committee level. And yes. at the time for requisition, it, because there's it no guarantee this Council, will pass will... receipt of information. Correct. And if that happens, That's it correct. doesn't go to Council for a vote at all. And therefore, the affected councillors will not be able to vote. That is correct. So at this time, if there, does anyone else have any questions? Councillor Knack, please go ahead. I just want to confirm what I heard from the clerks, uh, which is that if, if this motion is voted on and let's say it's approved, you can still requisition after the motion has been approved because that, that is what I thought I heard, which did not, did I misunderstand that? Clear. Yeah, so right now the, this motion is on the floor. If you, if I, if I get two councillors to say requisition, we can requisition this item up to council with this motion on the floor. Um, okay, no, what I was confirming, and, and I think you've clarified, is that once we vote, it once, is too late to requisition. So I just wanted to confirm. So, so in you can, of, yeah, you can still requisition once we vote. You just, I just need to. Um, get clarity on wh what we're what we are requisitioning because the item has been dealt with at the committee level. At that okay. point, after, if it I, passes, I feel, I feel the cleaner approach is still yeah. going to be the one I had suggested earlier, which yes. I understand wasn't a friendly amendment. Exactly. Yeah. So, so I will I will uh, <laughs> make it a real amendment and and say that I'd like to amend this motion that says committee recommend to council. Um, so that it can be still voted on here. And if that is, well, I'm gonna make that friendly amendment and if people wanna vote it down, then so be it. Um, but I'm, I'm struck. I wanna make sure everyone can also uh, speak to it before going to council, but based off the amount of time we're spending here, I, that might not be ideal at this point anyways. Okay, so we have an amendment on the floor and we need to uh, vote on that, but is there any questions about the amendment? But I did hear Councilor Knack say requisition multiple times. Oh, nice, nice try. Okay, uh, Councilor Rice, go ahead. Councilor well, Hamilton, and, yeah. Folks on the board. Um, I'm not sure if they have questions on the amendment. Councilor <laughs> Hamilton, do you have questions on the amendment? Yes. Speak to the Not item. questions, just to speak to the items, given okay. um, sort of the parameters that were set that you didn't want us speaking at council. Okay. Uh, Clerk Yusuf, is it appropriate at this time to listen to people speaking to this amendment? Yeah, okay. The amendment's please, on the please floor, go yeah. ahead, Councillor Hamilton. 
Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm speaking to, I, I know that the amendment's a little bit procedural. I would, I would posit, uh, Madam Chair, that you could, um, that when a motion's on the floor, it can be requisitioned at any time. Um, but uh, uh, I digress here. Um, I wanted to speak to this. I tuned in today because um, I, I was open to hearing if there was new information um, that would be presented that would change my mind. Um, I, uh, like Councillor Knack and Councillor Paquette, I've been privy to this conversation since the early days. I actually didn't support the shisha ban to begin with, um, but evidence presented in 2019 uh, made me think that it was, you know, a good idea in terms of public health. I also supported revisiting it when um, Councillor Zadok brought it back in 2021 because I agreed with the premise that perhaps uh, a culturally culturally sensitive or equity like an EDI lens wasn't appropriately applied in the first uh, instance. However, um, so so that gives you context for why I tuned in today and and I was open to hearing what I had missed in previous debates. What I heard um, was something that affirmed the direction I think that council had gone in in the past two, um, the the past two instances of direction on this subject matter. I heard that the um, research and public health data with respect to exposure to secondhand smoke, notwithstanding what substance is burning, is overwhelming in the position that it is harmful. Um, both to the co direct consumer and to people in the immediate environment. And as somebody who has personally struggled in the last few weeks with the, the amount of smoke uh, in the air, like so many other folks in Alberta and across this country, um, I, you know, wildfire versus uh, shisha versus tobacco smoke didn't make much of a difference in terms of my own personal comfort. Uh, and and it does, you know, I I I hear the data that that exposure, um, and and to to people who have no choice but to enter those facilities, like inspectors, firefighters, I remind you, are provided with PPE, including uh, respirators, uh, because that is part of their job. But P that PPE is not necessarily provided to other uh, other. Uh, persons, including uh, those who may be working in those environments, delivery drivers who might be picking up uh, food for delivery. That that is uh, a, an exposure. I also um, and and the the most persuasive thing for me was the very succinct um, uh, comment given by Mr. Jacob uh, about how this has um, this this is not maybe necessarily the place to concentrate. Uh, focus on opening up spaces that are are inclusive and welcoming um, and and maybe off that point uh, and I'll say I found him most persuasive on this subject because it begs the question to me of is this where city council wants to spend our time energy and resources according to administration in order to do more engagement they need more resources and then there's a lot of conversation about op 12 um, and I know equity, diversity, and inclusion are a, a significant focus of this council, and that is okay. But I, I really question whether or not this is the place that city council wants to uh, allocate those resources, whether or not this is the area where we can make the most change, whether or not the outcome is a safer and healthier city. Uh, and I, I am not convinced that is the case. I am further not convinced that that more research or more engagement with community on this is going to negate or make okay the social or the, the public health impacts. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I remain unconvinced that this is uh, something that we should be focusing our time and resources on. Um, I also, you know, I'm, I'm remiss to note that uh, over the last half century, there has been a great deal of effort in public health and society at large to uh, to talk about the stigma of smoking of all kind. And while we're not talking about tobacco, I note that um, there was a, a comment made that, you know, whether it's a water pipe or vaping, the, the substance is uh, uh, less important than than the, the medium, essentially. Um, 
and that it does make uh, smoking of some kind look okay. And we've spent a great deal of effort in this society to to make make it not look okay. And to the effect that we've had a, a huge positive impact on public health. So with that, um, I you know I wouldn't support this at council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Rutherford. Yes, I'm going to do the same thing, just in the parameters of making sure that I'm speaking it to it here. Um, fully support the vote at council, but really want to limit debate. And I echo many of the comments from Councillor Hamilton, and she nailed exactly where I was. I was thinking, except I haven't had the long history of the conversations that have come prior to this term. Uh, but I too question the additional engagement would provide more information that would sway the public health arguments. You know, public engagement is one piece of the information wheel that we have to, to make informed decisions as a council, uh, including technical studies, including um, expert advice, and including pub in public engagement. And I feel very convinced that I have enough information today to not utilize further resources to go down this path any further at this point. I'm gonna reuse a bit of my remainder of my time to talk a little bit of a, to tell a little bit of a personal story because I think it's relevant to my colleagues as they're, they're thinking about this. Um, I grew up in a, in a family and yes, it was tobacco, but both my parents were heavy smokers. I sat in a car with them every day. We went to restaurants, they always, were smoking in the house, I never got away from it. Then when I was 18, I became a server. And this is gonna age me a little bit, but when I was first a server, smoking was allowed in restaurants. So in order for me to make my livelihood, I had to continue to be exposed to cigarette smoke um, throughout my late teens and early early 20s in order to, to survive, quite frankly. Um, what a game changer when that bylaw was changed to eliminate smoking in restaurants. Um, I didn't even notice how much of an impact it made on me until I didn't have to breathe in that smoke every day at work um, before I realized that how much it had actually affected my health, my asthma, and, and other things. I also lived in Singapore for a while. And while in Singapore, they have a lot of shisha lounges. There was Arab Street. Uh, there was a lot of flavor tobaccos and I actually in my late mid 20s picked up smoking in Singapore because of the the idea of using hookah was safe or you know it was the the flavored tobacco like strawberry flavored tobacco was a lot lighter um, you know we, we recently eliminated menthol cigarettes in, in Canada for a similar reason um, but I think I, the reason I bring this up is because I think we have to look at this from the perspective too of the influence this can have and have on youth and, and young adults in terms of, uh, influencing their, their later activities. And while I was lucky enough to, to not get addicted and to not continue smoking, uh, into my adult life, I smoked significantly more in Singapore than I ever have in my entire life both hookah and flavored tobacco. And so I, I think about it from those contexts of the, the kids that can't control the environment they're in, the workers that can't control the environment they're in when they have to make a livelihood, and the young people and uh, that will ultimately uh, see this, like as mentioned in the speakers today, as less harmful um, and more palatable uh, form of, of, of smoking, whatever that substance is. So for those reasons, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not willing to continue this conversation further. And I agree with Councillor Hamilton. The, um, the arguments, the one piece I was really debating was that cultural aspect, but I agree with Councillor Hamilton in terms of the compelling arguments made around, uh, you know, this is a debate that's happening even within within countries where this is a cultural practice and where are we best using our resources to make sure that we're creating those safe and equitable spaces for uh, Muslim women, for 
people of all different cultural backgrounds. Um, so with that, I will I'll leave it at that and, and vote, which I will I will support the receive for information at council if this is requisitioned. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Rice. I don't have anything to add. I just want to get, get clarification and confirmation and from uh, City Kirk from uh, in terms of procedural. As, so this uh, this is just to go to the council and for vote purpose received as information only, right? Sorry, I just got back. What did you, so can you repeat that? Uh, this Sorry, is Councillor Rice, it's yeah. the city clerk here. So just for absolute clarity, regardless of the intentions of committee, council is a different body and council can choose to discuss, amend, or debate any matter that's before them. So I do understand committee would like this to be a council decision. When you are done debating the item as a committee, if you would like this to go to council, you can do one of two things. Requisition it up there, which is two councillors send it, send the item there with no motion on the floor, or this amendment passes, which is a bit unique. And if this amendment passes, then the amended motion, which is to recommend to council that it be received for information will also go up to council. So both paths get it to council, but you cannot put any limitations on council's debate, just for absolute clarity, Councillor Rice. Okay, so no, no further debate and it just received as information. Okay. Okay, not, that's my question. And I don't have anything to speak. Okay, thank you, Councillor Rice. I'm just going to put myself on the board here to ask a question. I just wanted a uh, clarification on that, uh, Clerk Giesbrick. Did you say that even if we speak to it at committee, if it goes to council, it can still be debated? 100%, it's a separate body. So committee can do whatever it wants down right now, but if you're okay. wanting to send this up to council for all of council to have a vote on the matter, the easiest thing to do would be to have two members of your committee requisition this matter up. There is, there is no way for committee to limit debate at city council under any circumstances. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Uh, Councilor Knack, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so appreciate, I'll start with the, just the, the focus on the amendment, which is a little, uh, I appreciate the word unique. Uh, that was a very kind word of, of, uh, of in fact, trying to uh, navigate a complex process. Uh, essentially, what, what I understood, and, and I think has, has since been solidified based off some additional speakers uh, who are not on committee, I was not getting an impression that there was a, a desire amongst a majority of councillors to, to further debate a different option. So uh, I, I chose a unique approach of which it was to recommend receipt of information to council. Um, which is what I am understanding is going to, which, which how I'm reading this meeting and what I've heard today and knowing how many members of council are currently uh, listening to this meeting right now um, is, is a way to allow that recommendation to essentially not do anything further to still be voted on. And if by chance I have misread the room um, and it were to fail at council when voted at council, then Councillor Wright would have the ability uh, to put forward a different motion uh, in place of that. So that was really the intent of this, which is to still allow Councillor Wright the professional courtesy that she has asked for, which is to be able to vote on this at council without requisitioning it uh, and leaving it very open-ended. I, I, I am ready to make a decision on this. Uh, and I'm going to echo some of the comments from Councillor Rutherford and Councillor Hamilton uh, that, that I, I do not feel the need to continue this further. I, I believe I have information available to me to make a decision, uh, which is why I think receipt of information is the right direction, but I, I'd like Council to have that vote. So that's why I've, I've asked for this amendment versus just requisitioning the entire report without a recommendation on the floor, um, because then it, it'll, it, it creates the opportunity to further relitigate, even though that opportunity exists no matter what, and I appreciate that. We have now had a debate. We have had multiple members of council speak, and so I am comfortable with recommending receipt of information to council. So that is where the specific intent of this motion comes forward. Um, 
and, and so just speaking to the main piece, I, again, I, I, I don't want to repeat much of what was already said. Um, at numerous times over the last number of years, there has been engagement with owners. There's been engagement from individuals who used to uh, frequent shisha lounges. Um, and, and I appreciate there's, you know, uh, there's always opportunities for, for more engagement. Um, but when I made the decision to reconsider this uh, in the motion that led to this report, my feedback was focused on public health. And what I have not seen today is something that eliminates that, that concern that I had when I first started discussing this. Uh, I appreciate there are differences between um, allowing alcohol at public parks versus allowing something like this in a lounge where there would be people exposed to a second hand substance. That's that is the difference to me. Um, you know, there, there's broader conversations about alcohol and public use and, you know, what the right approach is on that. Um, but in terms of a second hand approach, that's why I was interested in seeing this and, and I appreciate the work that's gone into this, but I'm I'm comfortable with what I've seen. I'm comfortable with the the advice of our our medical professionals, and you know I would echo the points we've heard, which is that uh, I think there are many locations where one can build community, and and I, what I haven't heard today is a convincing reason why we would need to allow something that has the potential of a secondhand impact to help with the broader community uh, or broader community connections. So uh, I'm comfortable with receiving this for information. I'd like Councillor Wright the opportunity to be able to vote on receipt of information. And if that recommendation fails, then she would have the ability to put forward a, a different motion. So if there is in fact a majority of council who would like to do further engagement, who would like to do, uh, who would like to do a different analysis that hasn't already been done over the next five years, uh, that that ability exists if this motion is to fail at council. So um, that's why I'll, I've put forward the amendments, uh, but I'm comfortable with where we're at and, uh, and, and glad we had this conversation and glad we did revisit it. Um, but, but to date, I have not heard anything that has uh, shifted that perspective from, from five years ago about the health impacts. So I'll be supporting the amendments. I'll be supporting the original motion of receipt of information. And then at council, I would vote in favor of that receipt of information once again. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Knack. I just wanted to say that I was hoping that we could uh, finish the debate at committee level and I feel that committee is the whole role of committee is to make decisions at this level if we requisitioned everything it would not be very efficient uh, but having said that I do feel that I, I would like to give Councillor Wright the the opportunity to vote at it even if if I won't be in support of it I still want to give you that opportunity so I, I will um, vote in favor of the amendment any other questions or comments or closing statements? Councillor Rice, go ahead. I think that the council members we work together, we support each other, and then I really appreciate that courtesy, and then my colleagues want to put it there. But also I would like to reflect that comments I will write from other my colleagues. Uh, we really want uh, to focus on our energy and the time and efforts and not continually to have the conversation uh, on this subject matter. And specifically, I heard very clearly and from city clerk. And then if we are going this one to the council, our committee will not uh, we are not giving the direction to council, so we should not open a larger uh, debate or discussion. So there is a potential and for further debate and a further di discussion and happened at a council level again. So that's actually the opposite of the main points and my colleagues made here, so we should not continue this. Uh, conversation, we should like have the conversation very clearly. 
um, at the committee level. And also I heard um, my colleagues say very clear we're going to uh, um, support receive just for information. So that is clear indicator to accept our city administration strong recommendation not amend our bylaw. So if that is the direction or all intention, I should say, not direction, we're not voted yet. If that is the intention, and then including our council uh, committee member and other council members already said very clear, why do we open the further door and for further debate and further other type of actions and may triggered at the council and for all the more work and for city administration is going to do it. I really encourage my committee members and not support this amendment. Let's receive as information at committee level and then let's focus on build the future and for our Edmontonians and in the way the scientific research and also recreation already approved. And then let's focus on that energy there. And instead of open the door for a larger debate, a larger action, a larger further work for our city administration. So I'm not going to vote this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Race. Please vote. We have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. Now we're on to item 7.2. Uh, we're going to put the motion as amended. Oh, no, back. yeah, that's right. We have the motion as amended on the floor. Anyone to speak? The motion as amended on the floor. Yeah, it's, we're just loading it to eScribe. Hold on one sec. Thank you. We have a motion on the floor. Anyone to speak to it? Did we do enough speaking? Then please vote. We have four votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. Now we're on to 7.2, right? Okay. Thank you. Okay, administration, whenever you're ready, we are. Thank you. I'm Eddie Rober, the Deputy City Manager of City Operations. Uh, we're here today to present the Snow and Ice Control 2022-2023 winter season results and to share a bit of information about the bylaw enforcement and ticketing during uh, the Phase 2 parking bans. Administration made several improvements to the program for the 2022-23 season including adjustments to service standards to align with the season's budget, with the season's budget, uh, additional staff to support snow clearing operations, 
and parking ban enforcement, improve parking ban communications. And with me today, I have Craig McEwen, the branch manager of Parks and Road Services, Keith Scott, the director of complaints and investigations with community standards and neighborhoods, Mark Beer, the director of infrastructure operations, and Val Dasik, the general supervisor of infrastructure field operations. We also have a cross-functional integrated team uh, from across the corporation available to answer any questions you have today. Uh, the Snow and Ice program enables Edmontonians to experience a safe and livable, livable winter city, ensuring residents can connect and access spaces, uh, services, facilities, and transportation networks, no matter how they travel. Edmonton is a winter city, and this is, uh, this is incredibly important work that impacts everyone, no matter how they travel. Over the past few months, we have used a new lens to look at our performance, our service levels and how we can improve snow and ice control, service delivery, and experience for Edmontonians. I'll ask Mark, David, and Craig to walk you through the presentation. Mark, over to you. Thanks, Eddie. Good morning, committee. Uh, this is our roads report card for this last winter season. It shows how we're performing compared with the service levels in our snow and ice control procedure. Our service standards are aligned to the budget and are based on an average snow event and average number of weather events per season. There's naturally some variation throughout the season, so we strive to complete work within our service standards at least 80% of the time. Uh, we met that goal across all service categories last season and came close to 100% on several. This is largely due to several key factors. So first, I cannot emphasize enough um, how hard our snow and ice control crews work to keep the roads and active pathways safe. Last season, we were able to hire additional staff using the 4.7 million one-time funding, which was approved by council in the July of 2022. This meant more employees out doing the work and better utilization of our equipment and other resources. Second, based on comprehensive program analysis following the snow and ice control audit and conversations with employees, service level standards were realigned to available resources and budget. This resulted in more realistic and attainable targets for the completion of our work. And lastly, there were also fewer snow days and precipitation this season, as well as a lack of freezing rain. So you may notice that our completion rate for residential roads and alleys, while still within our targets, was a little lower than our other categories. So in general, uh, more favorable temperatures have a positive impact on snow and ice control performance. However, in this case, uh, the warmer temperatures that we saw and the thaw events caused melting issues in residential neighborhoods where we usually maintain a five centimeter snowpack. Additional grooming and maintenance was required as a result. Uh, in other areas, warmer weather enabled crews to finish cul-de-sac clearing more quickly and provided more opportunities to remove windrows in school zones. Crews were also incredibly agile and pivoted to support pothole repairs in warmer conditions when routes were clear of snow. So now we'll touch on active pathways. This is our scorecard for last season. And I'm happy to report that we exceeded our goal of 80% inventory cleared to service standards. As with roadways, this is largely due to the excellent team members, service standards that align to our budget, um, and additional staff, um, and as well as generally more favorable weather conditions. Active pathways are challenging to maintain due to the huge variety in types of inventory that crews maintain, as well as the high level of manual work that's needed compared to roads. If you could go back to the active pathway slide. Yeah, there you go. Uh, there's also differences between how a snow event is defined. Uh, while a roadways event is considered accumulation of two centimeters or more, smaller amounts of snow can pose a greater safety risk to users of active pathways. Therefore, any amount of snow within 48 hours is considered a snow event for active pathways crew that triggers, um, uh, triggers a snow event. Uh, this ensures that Edmontonians can walk, bike, roll, and use other modes of active transportation year round. In addition to priority work, snow and ice control crews also provided proactive snow clearing support for winter festivals and events, such as New Year's in Churchill Square, Candy Cane Lane, Lunar New Year, Ice on White, Canot Volant, uh, the Junos, and more. And we also launched our Name of Plow contest, which received over 2,100 submissions uh, from residents. So I'm now gonna turn it over to Keith, who's gonna walk you through the phase two parking ban enforcement statistics. Thanks, Mark. 
so during the 2022-2023 winter season, we had three parking bans in total. Two phase one bans, which temporarily prohib prohibit parking on arterial collector roads, and one phase two ban, which affects residential and industrial roads and alleys. Several improvements were made to the parking enforcement process, including the launch of a new notification system with approximately 31,000 subscribers to date, the creation of more visible neighborhood signage, and the addition of 15 seasonal snow and ice officers for dedicated parking ban enforcement. During a parking ban, enforcement areas change daily based on the planned snow removal routes and the progress made by the crews. No areas or neighborhoods are identified as ongoing high priority for enforcement. Rather, enforcement teams are directed by snow and ice leaders based on neighborhood compliance. During the phase two ban, which was in effect from January 24th to February 7th, 2,875 tickets were issued and 144 of those were proactively canceled in the Northwest and Central districts due to a notification error. This table shows the approximate distribution of tickets throughout the city, including those that were later canceled. It is relatively even across locations. However, some of the differences may be attributable to neighborhood design. At this time, the enforcement database does not track tickets or violations by location. The data in this table is based on the issuing officer's assigned district for the day. However, it does not account for cases where officers may have been redeployed into different districts midday based on an operational need or request. Tickets issued under the citywide category were issued by officers who did not have a specific assigned district. In future years, we will be tracking the, district, the ticket distribution in a more detailed manner. Okay, next slide. So looking ahead to future winters, this graph shows the approved snow and ice control budget uh, by winter season rather than by calendar year. So the gray portion of the bars illustrates the base budget and the red shows the funding approved for the 23 to 26 uh, operating budget. The 23, or sorry, the 2022 to 2023 bar represents what we actually spent uh, in total last winter season. So the blue portion represents the $4.7 million in one-time funding that was approved uh, for the purpose of ramping up to the uh, implement the service levels outlined in last year's uh, snow and ice control report. Uh, and uh, in the 2023 to 2026 budget, snow and ice control received 20% of the proposed service package funding. So the orange uh, unfavorable variance was the cost of maintaining a consistent service level throughout the 2023 portion uh, of the 22-23 winter season. So last year, or last winter, I should say. Uh, the difference between what was spent in the 22-23 winter season and what is approved for the 23-24 winter season is about $9 million. Uh, so as a result, we will see a reduction in the service levels in the coming winter season uh, as compared to uh, last winter. As the budget increases over the following year, service levels will increase to align with that budget. And it's, it's important to note that uh, while the budget will increase, we typically also experience inventory growth, uh, growth year over year. So the addition of new roads or pathways to maintain will also be a factor uh, into service levels. Next slide. Uh, so this chart shows our 23-24, so that'll be next winter, uh, as budgeted in comparison to last winter. So arterial roads may take up to five days to be cleared instead of four. Residential roads may take up to 10 uh, once the blading cycle starts instead of eight. Uh, residential, or sorry, clearing of sidewalks, ramps, stairs, bridges, and trails may take up to six days instead of four. And priority three active pathways will see the largest change, uh, largely due to the manual nature of the work. Uh, so manual clearing of bus stops, sandbox refilling uh, may take up to 22 days from 13. So it's also worth to note that the service levels in this table are conservative estimates based on budget, uh, and we're actively working on uh, several strategies to minimize the gap based on last season's service levels and this upcoming winter. Uh, as we continue to find efficiencies and refine our operational plans, we'll communicate the 23-24, so next winter service levels uh, to both council and residents. Uh, we also have uh, reduced capacity for enforcement. So as part of the improvements made uh, for last winter season, 15 dedicated snow and ice officers were hired for parking ban and sidewalk clearing enforcement. Uh, and for next winter, the 23-24 season, 
this will be reduced to five uh, snow and ice officers with without the tow uh, without the tow services. So next slide. So in closing, for the 23-24 winter season, administration will focus on priority service levels to ensure safety, reliability, and connectivity across Edmonton's mobility network with an emphasis on adapting the snow and ice control program uh, to the realities of climate change. We're continually monitoring and adjusting service delivery to respond to changes in winter weather patterns, such as the increased frequency of smaller weather events versus historically uh, larger ones, and the increase in early uh, season fr uh, freeze-thaw cycles. So to that end, we've identified a number of opportunities for program improvements uh, that can be made this upcoming winter uh, within our current budget. And so some of those examples include uh, working with vendors to improve weather prediction resources at the microclimate level. So this will enable uh, a more tailored approach uh, to the winter road maintenance. Monitoring uh, residential snowpack more often and relocating, reallocating resources as necessary to respond to increased freeze-thaw cycles. Uh, using our improved communication channels and procedures to provide information on service levels and ensure Edmontonians understand our shared uh, responsibility to snow removal. So administration uh, will, will report on uh, uh, snow and ice control performance annually after each winter season, and this will ensure that council and Edmontonians are kept informed uh, and provide an opportunity between seasons uh, to discuss resourcing and priorities. So that concludes our presentation, and happy to uh, answer any questions after our speakers. Great, thank you for the presentation. We will go on now to uh, Tanya LaRiviere. Hi, Tanya. Hello. Hi. Hi, you have five minutes. Please go ahead. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm going to sneak in a good morning to City Council and to everyone joining. My name is Tonya Lerviere. I chair the Accessibility Advisory Committee, which I will refer to as AAC. As an advisory body to Edmonton City Council, the AAC strives to understand the community's accessibility needs and prioritize them in the context of Council's strategic objectives and policies. In 2022, the AAC worked closely with the city's snow and ice control section to advocate for a higher level of snow clearance, which is vitally needed to meet the needs of the disability community and to ensure we have access to our communities, workplaces, and the city at large. While snow and ice clearing primarily focuses on roadways, active transportations, and budget, other aspects of snow and ice clearing must also remain a high priority. During these consultations, the AAC identified five priority areas of concern. They are as follows. Snow clearing of accessible parking stalls, including the pathway to buildings, bus stops, and curb cuts. Sidewalk maintenance of city-owned commercial and residential sidewalks. Increased enforcement of snow removal responsibilities of homeowners and businesses. Large windows creating significant accessibility issues literally trapping citizens on their block and the need for assisted shoveling program for those facing barriers. The snow and ice control information report presented today specifies that Edmonton will experience a decrease in service for the 2023-24 snow and ice season based on their budget. Specifically, priority two active pathways, city sidewalks, ramps, staircases, shared paths, pedestrian bridges, bus stop access will be cleared in six days instead of four. Priority three active pathways, manually cleared paths, bus benches, sandbox, work will be completed in 22 days instead of 13. These service reductions are a concern for this committee. Snow and ice control have themselves identified the following through the GBA plus analysis. Persons with mobility and accessibility challenges and those who use multiple modes of transportation have greater difficulty moving around in snowy and icy winter conditions and may face additional barriers to clearing snow. This results in safety hazards and day-to-day -day barriers to mobility for themselves and others in the community. Persons with limited mobility are disproportionately affected by snow and ice control measures and face the risk of increased injuries with icy conditions. And people who use active pathways and public transportation are affected differently by snow and ice compared to those who use roads and vehicles. These individuals face increased barriers and risk of injury with snow and ice accumulation along any part of their route. We understand budget constraints, but safety and accessibility must be prioritized. The AAC would encourage Council 
use these findings to help identify safety and accessibility priorities related to snow removal and ice control. That said, safety and accessibility are not the sole responsibility of the city. It is the responsibility of all Edmontonians and businesses. We are aware that an information report about assisted snow removal programs is coming forward in July. We respectfully ask this council committee to consider putting forth a motion for the snow and ice control communications team to consult with the accessibility advisory committee to create robust educational campaigns around business and neighborhood snow shoveling initiatives and accessibility awareness. While the AAC plays a crucial role in advising on the city's inclusiveness and accessibility for individuals with disabilities, the progress happens with your support as our city councillors and city administration. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a little bit of time uh, before we go to lunch, so I'm going to ask you some uh, questions, Ms. LaRiviere. Uh, you had mentioned about the priority three um, being 22 days compared to priority one being one day for snow removal. Do you see that in, in your opinion, how impactful is that uh, with the priority one being cleared in one day, will that be very impactful for the uh, accessibility? Uh, having it cleared in one day obviously will be uh, beneficial um, and I believe that's staying the same but 22 days um, to clear bus benches um, manually cleared paths that's near a month that is a huge accessibility concern uh, for all Edmontonians yeah not just those with limited mobility or, or vision Yes, yes, I agree. Um, I guess what the question I, I, I'm trying to get at is, is priority one more significant to people with accessibility issues oh, or is priority I, three, are there any, is there any level that is more um, impactful? Um, you know, individuals with disabilities, a quarter of Edmontonians identify as having a disability. You know, we're all over the city. so. Um, and, you know, we all have our different routes of travel and paths. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, generally, of course, ideally, we would like to see, you know, full clearing within, you know, four days of the entire city, but understand that that's, that's not reasonable, um, just from a budget perspective. Right, okay, and so if we had to make some adjustments, I'm not saying we could or would make adjustments, but if we had to um, increase the timing it took for say priority one to be two days so that we could um, decrease the amount of days for priority three, would that be something that would be acceptable? Yeah, absolutely. Any amendments that can be made to improve the clearing of snow and ice? You know, I mean, we're specifically around those certain areas, um, senior housing, uh, long-term care uh, facilities, um, of course, the, those high traffic areas um, could definitely make a difference. Not enough, I, um, not enough of a difference to, you know, ensure safety and accessibility for everybody, but enough that, you know, every little bit is going to count. Okay, great. Thank you. Those were the uh, only questions for me. Uh, we are coming up to 12 o'clock here right now. So um, I'm guessing there might be some more questions for you. Can I ask my colleagues, are there questions? Ms. LaRiviere, are you okay to join us at 1.30 again for more questions? Absolutely. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. So we will be in recess now until 1.30. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.
afternoon, councillors. We are live from River Valley. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting back to order, and I will start with a roll call with committee members. Councillor Rice. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Paquette. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mayor Sohi, are you online with us? No, he's not. Uh, Councillor Cartmel. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Tang. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And I'll just check online, see if any of our other colleagues are there. Uh, Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Stevenson. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mm. Councillor Hamilton. Councillor Rutherford. Hello. Hi, Councillor Salvador. And Councillor Jans. All right, so now we are going to continue with uh, questions to the speaker. Uh, I'll just ask my colleagues to sign up if they have any questions to the speaker. It does show I'm on the board, but not on your board. Okay, Councillor Knack, go ahead then, please. Yeah, sorry, it shows that I'm, I'm signed up. Uh, I, I just actually really had one um, question because uh, Tanya, before you, uh, Wrap. I think in your speaking notes, you, you briefly said that, you know, you, you don't think that um, four days across the board for all of those is reasonable. And, and then you, you, you prefaced it with a budget saying budget wise, because I just want to double check. It's like from an accessibility standpoint, that actually feels like a pretty reasonable request. I mean, I appreciate we have to balance budget and we have to figure out what the right increases every year to get there, but uh, that feels like the end state we should actually be at, shouldn't it? Are you talking about all priority levels, one to three? Yeah, I mean, maybe three, you might not do four, maybe you do it by seven or something or six, but but like, it feels like, you know, we should strive for a much higher standard than what is currently done. And again, setting aside budget, you know, an ideal scenario is probably everything done within you know, no more than a week, I would say, right? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to be sure because I think, again, I appreciate that you, <laughs> you, you preface that because you're trying to look out for budget as well. But I think, you know, we've been, we've been having this debate for so long about, you know, how much do we invest in snow clearing and snow removal? And when it comes to active pathways, like that's the area that I don't, you know, we gotta, we gotta like get a move on here, and and I think there was some great work done last year by the team, and and I want to see us, you know, continue to go further down that path as I'm sure you do. So, yes. okay, yeah, I that that was all, that was my main question for you. Uh, oh, I guess I mean your main ask was about the communications piece, and and just to confirm, you've had like, have you run that idea by folks in the city at this point about that working together for on a communications plan? I mean, I, I'm happy to look at maybe making that a formal request, but I just wanted to get a sense of what you've heard from, from city staff at this point. Uh, well, when Jason was chair, we did meet with Snow and Ice way back and we discussed, right. yeah, we discussed um, educational campaigns but nothing is really, we haven't had those discussions about what that would look like, what our messaging would be. Uh, so that really didn't move forward. Okay, hey, I'll, I'll ask about that when I get to the questions. And thank, thank you, I appreciate you being here today. Thank you, those are all my questions. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, thank you for coming to speak. You had a um, wording for a suggested motion. I'm wondering if you could send that to us uh, in our inbox, would Absolutely. that be possible? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And um, yeah. So the length of time for clearing. Um, can you? I'm not sure if you mentioned it. Did you mention what you think would be an actual appropriate time frame for clearing up to priority three? Well, again, you know, I mean, the sooner the better and ideally, yeah, if that could all be done within those seven days, within a week, four days would be ideal. But again, right. I mean, you know, when we're talking about our weather patterns, it's it's hard to predict what's going to happen in 
you know, we could have a tremendous amount of rainfall or snowfall and rain and ice accumulation within those four days or seven days yeah. or 13 days. So I think I already know the answer to my next question, but just to have you say it out loud might be helpful. And that is that, uh, look, if the sidewalks aren't, uh, aren't cleared or if they're icy, um, myself, I can walk out, I can avoid it, I can step over it, you know, I can get on with my day. With someone with reduced mobility, I'm assuming that that is not actually a possibility. It could, yes, absolutely. It could not so, be possible. so what would the circumstance be for that person then if they needed to go out and about? I, I guess it depends whereabouts the person is located, right? Because if you're in neighborhoods uh, where snow shoveling is up to the homeowners, you know, if that was, if a homeowner was to neglect shoveling their walks for up to two weeks, they'd probably be getting a notification from the city or somebody would complain that, you know, or if it's a business, you know, same thing. Um, and so, if we come to a crossing, uh, a, you know, on a city sidewalk at a city crossing, and there's a, there's a big snow drift there left by the plows, um, what happens? It depends on the person's mobility. They might not be able to cross the road. They might not, like, they could be literally completely stuck on the sidewalk, needing assistance from somebody else who can come along and help. And you see this throughout the city yeah. all the time. Anecdotally, I have seen people actually literally lift people in wheelchairs over a windrow and then over the next one on the other side of the road. So yeah. it, that's basically the reality for a lot of folks, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and if we could get the suggested wording of that motion, it'd be great. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Tang. Great. Thank you so much, Tanya, for, for being here and speaking to this, um, to this issue. Um, wanted to follow up on that because I think there will be lots of questions on the service levels, but I wanted to talk a little bit about your ask on the communication campaign. Um, just to be clear, uh, what I heard was that you didn't necessarily have anything prepared, but you're asking the committee to provide some direction uh, to administration. Um, is that right? Uh, yeah, ideally, we'd like to see a motion put forward uh, for snow and ice control communications team to collaborate with the accessibility advisory committee on an educational campaign around the snow shoveling initiatives and accessibility awareness. Yeah, this feels like a, um, I feel like this comes up every season, actually. Um, yeah. Feels like a fairly low-hanging fruit bat that could have quite a significant uh, impact. Um, and are you thinking... Just to be a bit more specific, you're thinking more sidewalks and neighborhood. Any sense about, like, say, uh, private lots? Uh, I'm thinking shopping strips. Kind of why it's Im just generally, right? Like, why it's important. Um, and I bring this up because I've, you know, I've had non-committee members approach me as well about similar types of communication campaign. Um, and you know, gen typically city doesn't do a lot of the private lots, but there might be potential benefits in the broader message of when we all shovel together, this is the kind of the benefit for everybody. Yes, definitely. And we would want to direct that to businesses. So I can tell you, I know I have two friends who had family members and they both slipped on ice at the door at restaurants. They were both seniors. They both fell, hit their heads mm -hmm. and days later passed away from the uh, injuries that they sustained. So this would also be directed to those businesses. And businesses don't want that liability. They don't want that on their, mm -hmm. on their record either. Right. Right, wow, that's, uh, that's awful. Um, yeah. Anyways, appreciate just you being a bit more specific about kind of the scope that you were thinking of. And I'm sure, you know, the city team will have to consider a bit of the scope of their work, but I think the point here is also to co-develop or work really with the AAC. Um, I mean, how many times would you, so you said this has come up in the past, but the conversation didn't necessarily yield to um, the campaign that, that the, the committee has envisioned. 
Is that what yeah, I'm hearing correct. too? Yeah, correct. And we haven't, as of late, had any communications regarding the report that's coming in July on the uh, assisted snow shoveling. So you will want, so the, so, so the committee will want perhaps a, a presentation, if not already, um, just so the committee can provide some preliminary feedback as well. Yes. Yeah, that, 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 that's very clear. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, and, and that's it for me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Ting. Councillor Wright. Uh, thanks very much, um, and thanks, Tanya, for, I guess, for, for bringing to our attention as well that you haven't had anybody connect um, on that uh, assisted snow program. My understanding is that uh, Keith Scott should be reaching out to you um, shortly to sort of get your feedback on it from the city, okay? Okay, thank you. Um, and then I'm just wondering, you, you talked about being a priority being around um, long-term care centres and seniors, residents, and, and that. Aren't those usually um, private um, areas? So, so isn't the company those companies that own those facilities aren't they responsible for it for the clearing? I'm not a hundred percent sure on that. I'm I'm going to make an assumption that they are, but again, like with our messaging, we would want it to be clear for businesses and we population. I mentioned population on their responsibility for snow clearing okay. with accessibility and safety in mind. Okay, um, and then so I'm wondering, but beyond that, would there be other areas of priority? Like I'm thinking, like around bus stops or other high traffic areas that you can think of. Yeah, definitely the bus stops, um, and crosswalks. Okay. Um, the high traffic areas. Okay. And then with the communication piece, then so you're thinking more. Um, Reach, reaching out to those businesses, uh, even out to those um, residential property owners that that fail to uh, clear their sidewalks and let them know what the impacts are of, of that, right? Yes. Okay. And um, within that, you know, maybe suggest like a community initiative to snow shoveling. Um, there, you know, there, there could be lots of creative ideas where you can build community and take care of, of its members at the same time. Yeah, I know there used to be, and I guess that'll come out more on July 11th there, but I know there used to be the Snow Angels programs and there's been volunteer groups that help in that. Okay. Um, yeah, and I think that's that's all the questions I had for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Any other questions to the speaker? I don't see any other questions. So now questions to administration. Please sign up. Councillor Knack, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Councillor Principe. Uh, thanks for this report. I really loved having it. I, I, and again, just want to just uh, offer my thanks for the the quality of information over the last sort of year, year and a half now. It's it's is making um, a significant difference in being able to understand the work that you're doing. Uh, the challenges you face and and you know that helps inform what we're working on so and what we need to do as a council so I just really want to say I appreciate it because I, I think it's it's a it's a significant noticeable difference from what we used to have you know years ago so um, thanks for for putting that all together um, maybe I'll start just by asking a question about that communications plan from uh, that's being requested from the accessibility advisory committee um, I, I imagine you know this is this is one of those things that while it probably doesn't need a motion, I hear that they wouldn't mind it. And, and so it's sort of one of those like, are you okay if we put forward a motion to do something that I hope you would probably be doing based off today's meeting? Yeah, it's, it's okay either way. I don't think we need a motion to do that. We're happy to connect with the, with the committee and, and strive to make sure that we're, we're communicating appropriately that meets their needs as well. So uh, totally up to council. Yeah, I, I think if we we're going to put forward a motion, it wouldn't require a report back. It would just ask that that's done and that leaves it in your hands. And, and I've heard that commitment already and I'll, I'll wait to see what my colleagues say. But uh, if that gives some additional comfort to the committee, I, I'm happy to do that uh, just to make sure that they, they know for 100 percent sure it's happening. Um, but I, I appreciate your commitment, Mr. Robar, on that. Wanted to ask about, um, you know, as and again, I, you know, most of what is what we're talking about is ultimately 
strictly based off how much we are going to resource you. So I don't want to spend a lot of time debating the nuance because in the end, if we want more, we have to provide you with the money to doing so. Um, so so I, I don't think there's a ton to debate other than I guess I'll ask generally, Mr. Robar, as part of the OP12 work, we, we have identified core services as one of the areas we would expect to be seeing additional funding as part of this reallocation exercise. Um, and and I, I would expect that snow removal would be a, a heavy part of that core service uh, category, correct? That is correct. Yeah, so, so council will have some decision points at the end of this year as to how much we want to further invest in the snow removal if we're not comfortable with, with what you presented in the report today, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, so then the only other question I have on that front from that ties a bit into this accessibility and piece here is, is as we're getting that, that information and advice, you know, you've, you've given us a report last year that still identifies that you should be at around $100 million a year or just under. Is that generally still what you would, in an ideal world, if money was no option or money was no issue, that's where you would still be, right? Or where you'd want to be. Yeah, if we were, if you're referring to AP1 and RP1 in the pre, the uh, report, it would be around $100 million, correct? Okay. Um, so for me, I, and I guess that's that's one of the, the questions uh, that I have. When, when you showed what you could do based on your current resources, uh, it shows by 2026 that you would get back to the level that we were at this past year for roads, I believe, in the presentation. I should have kept that open somewhere. Uh, but that that's generally accurate, correct? You you would be it's a little at bit, that level. It's it's a little bit less. Uh, there would still, still be to. about a, a five million dollar difference. So there was about seventy two million dollar program that was delivered this past winter, uh, and then by the end of this four year budget cycle, it would be uh, just over sixty seven. Correct. So I, I understand the dollar amount. I think the the presentation had showed, or, or I think the report had showed that generally for uh, the roadway inventory. By the end of by that that year, you would be close to achieving similar targets to what you hit this past year, specifically on roads, not active pathways. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Where the difference is is on the active pathways front, and and even even with the gradual increases currently proposed, you would not be back at the uh, levels that we saw this past winter on our active pathway inventory. Correct. That that's correct. That's right. Can you talk a I want to ask you a little bit about that difference and from a GBA plus perspective, I'll probably come back on a second round because what I want to understand is, is, you know, if we in that world of, of limited resources, if they didn't increase, how do you divvy them up between roads versus active pathways, knowing that active pathways has a pretty strong accessibility component. So I'll come back around on the second round. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you. I would like to start to echo uh, Councillor Knox, and I, I do have that graduation and, and towards the work and the information provided in front of us. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a few questions regarding this basic financial piece and the other the implication of our city's roads as well. Uh, the first one, um, for 2022 to 2023 winter season, uh, the presentation demonstrated we spent it 72.2 million. And then for 2023 to 2024 winter season, so we, to keep the same service level, the proposal funding is 63.2 million. So is not understanding correct based on the data you provided here? Um, are you uh, looking at the, the total budget for yeah. the 23 to 24? 24. Yeah, there's about a... a um, decrease. Yeah, there's a decrease of about $9 million. Uh, so, but this will change and we keep the same service level or how that imp impact could be if we reduce $9 million? Uh, yeah, in, uh, in slide six of the presentation, we showed what that service level change will take place. Uh, so from last winter season through to next winter season, um, there's a few key changes. Uh, the first one would be on priority one roads. Uh, instead of being done in about four days, it'll be about five. 
Um, moving into the active, or sorry, into the priority four roads, it'll take roughly uh, 10 days instead of uh, eight once a blading cycle starts. Uh, and then same thing on active pathways, priority two and three. Every priority will change a bit. Um, just rounding is, uh, is why some of those didn't change, but um, we, if, we, if we put up the slide six, we could show the difference between last winter and this season and what those will change. Uh, I, I, do, I do understand the change here. Then my question is, and even with the current level, uh, service level with a budget $7.2 million for 2022-23, if we're going to reduce the funding, that means the service level is reduced as well, and based on what you describe here. Correct. But that is our Edmontonians asked. Is that our Edmontonians asked to reduce the service level? What, what we've done is we've, um, we're going to be operationalizing the budget that we have. Uh, this is a little bit concerning to me, and because based on what we heard from our Edmontonians and snow removal and ice control, and based on the budget, we only budgeted last year, and when we, during that budget deliberation, only 20% what the needs. And right now, we're going to reduce even further. So compared to the 2022 and 2023, no, no, this is um, in the in the ch in the chart that shows those red bars. Yeah. Uh, that is the twenty percent uh, funding. So what we are, what we're showing here is uh, this is what was funded at budget time, uh, and the service levels are reflected of, of what was passed at budget um, in the, uh, in December. I know the operation uh, operating plan and for how we uh, do the two thousand twenty three twenty four winter season, and it's based on the budget approved from last year. What what I'm saying here, my point is, if our Edmontonians still concerned the service level for our slow removal and the ice control, what a way we could keep the same service level and not reduced? That is my key point here. There, there would be uh, a funding gap of about $9 million for this upcoming winter season. Okay. Uh, I can see my time, how many times? Um, I still have, yeah. I, I cannot see time. Yeah, it um, my next question is re related to this and based on the roadway uh, impact what the program provided last year. Uh, I didn't see the progress a little bit and as I compared to the 2021-23. Um, so right now, all the score becomes the green and no red anymore. But with this $9 million funding gap, that means we're going back and to we'll have some next, like well, lower score for, for the roads as well. That means we'll, for our major roads and we'll have some like impact as well. I don't think I have enough time. The, um, I could probably answer that in, in 10 yeah. seconds. Is <laughs> the, uh, What the, the green is related to yeah. is the service level. Yeah. So what will change is the service level. So now instead, so essentially the, yeah. the target changes to align with the budget. And so we'll measure ourselves against how, how, uh, how we're able to achieve that new service level. I will come back. My time is up. Thank Great. you. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Paquette. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you for this report. Um, when it comes to the tickets that were given out, um, one of the contentions uh, from residents was that signage went up that said within 72 hours there was going to be snow clearing and then it was longer than 72 hours and people came back to park and then they got ticketed. Uh, is this something we're keeping in mind for this upcoming uh, season? Yes, for sure, Councillor uh, Paquette. We have we adjusted it as soon as the snow ban was articulated and communicated out. There was one uh, notification error, error that we had, but going forward, we're ensuring that when the signs are out, before any tickets or any warning or any towing happens, we're ensuring that the signs are out and that the communication has been communicated to the entire neighborhood. We'll ensure that that continues to happen. Well, that's great. Yeah, as you are probably aware, there was a neighborhood in my. Uh, ward that was affected in that way. So that would be great for them to hear that. Um, yeah. The question that comes into my mailbox, and uh, I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but it should be asked out loud uh, from residents is, um, can't we squeeze any more efficiency out of this 
uh, out of the money that we have in order to uh, provide better snow and ice response. We're constantly evaluating that, completely agree. Some of the things that we're doing are, you know, to your last question around communication, we've added uh, hundreds of new signs. We've changed the color to make it more obvious or when there is a parking ban. Um, we're working on that email and text notification tool. Um, we're looking, uh, you know, working with vendors for that um, micro, micro, micro climate level uh, for monitoring. Um, so the, the communication and looking for efficiencies on how, how many staff can we hire, how many staff can we retain, and uh, how do we deliver more effectively, constantly looking at different areas for, uh, for making the program more efficient. And then communicating it out to public to make it clear and, and easy and transparent to see where our plows are. We're working on a map right now, so you can click on it and see where all the, all the plows are, when the last road was, was done and, and when it's scheduled to be done next. And you can see all the named plows moving around the city, looking at different ways to make it more open, transparent, easy to understand the program, and how do we deliver uh, more effectively with the budget that we have. Yeah, and uh, so the budget you have, um, to be fair, is quite low uh, compared to other uh, winter cities uh, in Canada. And um, as was touched on, and this is uh, the question here, is that, um, and uh, this was touched on, but even though the budget will be increasing year after year, what you're also keeping up with is that there's increasing growth. And so I'm just wondering if there is a metric there that shows us the increasing costs due to growth and inflation um, versus what you're actually getting. We, um, we, we look at that yearly. So working with uh, like our, our partners in um, urban planning and economy, depending, depending on new developments as they come online, um, trying to account for that for operating impact of capital, but then in, incorporating that inventory growth uh, operating budget, and then every year would be adjusting those service levels based on what the new budget is and, uh, and, and how much inventory we have to get through that. So uh, each year we would be updating those numbers. Okay, but we can sort of forecast, or are we going to try to forecast that over the next few years so we have an idea ahead of time? What, um, uh, let me just, uh, let me just check, I might have to check on that and, uh, and get back to you on how exactly we're doing that. Yeah, that might be great because then it can give council a little bit of an idea of like, okay, is this an appropriate funding uh, that you have or are we going to be falling behind or should we be topping this up? So uh, that would be fantastic because I think um, everyone wants to see better snow clearing. Um, and what I've heard is that the, if we wanted the same level of snow clearing as we had last year, we would require a, a, an additional $9 million this year. And then you know a little bit less every year as it goes up or not, depending on the forecast of growth. Do I have that right? Th that's right. Okay, and uh, even with that nine million, it doesn't sound like this. Uh, we're even close to addressing what we heard uh, as far as mobility challenges uh, due to wind roads and icy sidewalks and things like that. Is that your understanding as well? I think uh, one of the important things to talk about too is just the change in the climate. So, you know, our snow and ice program is built off of a certain type of climate. Obviously, that's been changing over the past few years, and we're adjusting to to go along with that. When we talk about efficiencies, those are the kinds of things that we're adjusting to over time, and and that plays into that that conversation as well. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I oh I want to say that I use the text tool. It's awesome. It's great. It's very informative, very helpful. So thank you for that. Uh, I do have a question about the active pathways priority three. Now I see that that's pretty significant, 30, 13 days to 22 days. And we see um, uh, priority one remain one day. I know I shouldn't be doing this, you know, because this is operations, but is it possible to kind of balance that out a little bit more? Because often people using those bus stops are on their way to the LRT station. So if they can't get on the bus <laughs> to go to the LRT, having the LRT cleared isn't, you know, like, is it possible to priority one, make it even two days? Will that impact priority three? Can we then decrease the amount of days for priority three? 
Um, the, the, the short answer would be uh, it, it could be done, uh, but we would be trading um, priority bike lanes uh, for um, for bus stops. And so really it, it's a function of just how um, how the inventory, how long it takes to get through. And it's very manual, some of that priority three work around bus stops uh, and some of those public amenities and, the, and filling the sandboxes as well uh, is a part of that active pathway priority three task. So um, in order to change uh, the days, um, Changing from one day to two day in priority one would lar lar like would essentially have a large impact um, and might not have that proportional impact for say something on ac uh, on a priority three basis. So at the end of the day, in order to adjust those numbers, um, staffing is is really the way to to address that sequencing. And, and really on the priority ones as well, it's about getting to bare pavement. So if you delay the amount of time that you uh, get to your priority one uh, streets, it's harder to get to bare pavement over the time that it's there. So it creates a bit of a problem on the other end of it. So yeah, and I was like in referencing just the active pathways, if it's possible to just, you know, try to not see such a big discrepancy. 13 days to 22 days is, is quite significant, I feel. Um, what about if, if we do see changes in the sandboxes, will that, would you see that being significant in decreasing the amount of days? It would. It would probably change. Uh, it would change the active pathway priority three by roughly three days. So, um, I know that's a, a report we're going to be talking about later in this fall. But that does right. impact um, that work uh, by about three days. Okay, great. And I know that uh, it was um, passed that we would be uh, building Ambleside site. And one of the reason, or one of the comments I heard from administration is that it will help with the citywide um, uh, snow removal once that that is built. Yes, yeah, certainly we're going through and operating. Yeah, <laughs> the Ambleside site and the service reallocation strategy for that. So looking at the city, how would we deploy our vehicles after that site is built? Certainly being uh, better proximity to services helps us up our service levels for sure. Deadhead kilometers or non-revenue non kilometers, not, not non-revenue, but non-productive kilometers is uh, something you can eliminate through that. Right, and I recall uh, administration saying that it would actually help citywide as well. It will impact the citywide removal as well because of that. And uh, where are we at uh, the Ambleside site? Not I'll, sure, that's I'll okay. I'll have to get back to you. That's okay. Do yeah. you think that we might see in the upcoming years when we when the Ambleside site is operating that we will see a difference in these numbers? We're a few years away from Ambleside. Still being, a few years away. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's good. That's it for me. Thank you very much. We'll go uh, next to Councillor Wright. Please go ahead. Thanks very much. So sticking with that slide number six and the the, um, the sandboxes and that, that's that's removing the sandbox program altogether, that three days, is that right? Yeah, it would be roughly three days if the program were to be, um, to be removed. Okay, and then um, I'm also wondering about the public amenities. So that's not our rec centers or our other city facilities. What does that include? So in the priority three active pathways? Um, priority three, you've got manually cleared areas, bus stops, paths, public amenities. What are those public amenities? Generally, that's all um, publicly cleared areas that are outside of the other um, priorities. So that would be areas around um, stoplights, like the push buttons to activate the crosswalks, those types of things that require manual removal. Oh, okay. That's not included anywhere else along, like with the city sidewalks, because the city sidewalks move into the, the push buttons? So the city sidewalks are included in priority two, but the manual portion of it, so the areas that are required for people to go with shovels are part of priority three. And those, those areas have to be done manually? They can't be done with equi equipment? Correct. So those okay. areas close to poles that the equipment can't get that close to. Okay. Okay. And then so on the, um, on the equipment side of things, in attachment one, it, it shows um, that we only used 
nine of the 19 graders in 2022-2023? Was that due to, was the equipment down or was there not the, the manpower to... No, the equipment, the equipment was available. It's just the climate that we experienced this past winter um, wasn't a typical winter with a significant amount of snowfall um, that required greater usage. So we used different types of equipment to uh, handle the snow this past winter. Okay, okay. I just wanted to understand that a little bit more because um, I was thinking if it, if it was not having enough people, is, was there a way that we could maybe... Um, you know, create dual roles for the summer parks and roads, the summer parks people into uh, um, into having them ready then to to move into to snow removal. Okay, so thank you very much for clarifying that. Um, and then, and I too, like Councillor Principe, um, use the electronic notification. And I'm just wondering. I think you said there was only thirty one thousand people signed up for that. That's correct. Thirty one thousand. Is there any way to identify what areas, like what neighborhoods maybe were, were most signed up? Uh, we could probably get that with, uh, with our partners based on where people sign up. But uh, we did put quite a bit of work into advertising the tool, any opportunity we had at a media availability or um, public service announcement, we were um, advertising the notification tool and we did see with every uh, parking ban or every media availability, the uh, um, enrollment increase. So we're hopeful that we'll see um, increased usage next year because it's been really good at getting the word out. Okay, and I'm just wondering, I, I know that the, the parking enforcement data is kind of skewed because it doesn't necessarily, it, it was the, what what the normal um, bylaw officer would, the area of the city that they would normally be, attend to, but I think you mentioned that they moved moved around depending on need, right? Yeah, and you're going to you'll be refining that by neighborhood next year as well. Yes, we will. Okay, so then maybe you know if we can see some correlation between those that receive notifications and and those don't that don't get ticketed, um, that might help to encourage others to to sign up for it as well. Um, and then I'm just wondering, um, is there any way, and this might be a logistical nightmare to prioritize prioritize residential streets, maybe to ones that are a little narrower, where it's, it's more of a need to, to get the roads cleared as to, you know, maybe some, some wider, um, wider residential roads? I guess I would answer that from an equity standpoint, we don't tailor our services to neighborhoods. Um, we offer the same residential service across the city. Uh, we do have inspectors that are in neighborhoods regularly, um, determining the condition of those neighborhoods to determine whether or not we do need to go in there um, and groom the neighborhood. Um, but we don't tailor our services um, based on width of streets or, or anything like that. Okay, okay, my time's up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Great, thank you very much for, for this uh, report, both of them. Um, so I guess first on the, on the, on the, on the funding, in the four-year budget, I'm right here, hello. <laughs> um, you, you've seen a 20% uh, increase to, to the portfolio as a whole over the four years, but taking one-time funding variances into account and to avoid sort of large you know, fluctuations, this is kind of how you distribute it over the four years. Hence, we're seeing the way that, that red portion is distributed, correct? Um, not, I, don't, I don't believe so. I believe what, what took place was we were, we were given the $4.7 million last year with the direction to start ramping up towards that R1, AP1 level that we talked about in last year's reports. Um, and so we got about halfway there. So we were about 50% of the way towards that R1, AP1 level. Uh, and then in December, during budget deliberations, uh, instead of 100% uh, or 50% of that R1, AP1 service level, or sorry, service package, 20% was uh, funded. So then really the difference we're seeing between um, uh, this past winter and next winter is we went up to 50% and then we retained that for the entire winter season. 
and now we're just correcting to back to what has been actually funded moving forward. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess my, my, my point is, um, uh, even though the report talks about decrease in service level, but overall it is an increase in budget, uh, but just not to the level that you had initially proposed. Uh, so therefore affecting service. Um, I wanted to ask a bit about communication. Um, for the Snow and Ice communication, you do the notification, you do mail outs. I'm wondering like how easy it is to incorporate something like the video campaign that the, the, the AAC chair was talking about. Uh, I know this came up in the past, but would it be considered as part of say the, the communication work plan? We're, yeah, we're happy to, uh, to start incorporating um, as many tools as we can with, with the resources and budget we have for, for getting the word out and educating Edmontonians for what to expect. Um, so happy to work with, uh, with the committee and, and uh, in collaboration with our communications and engagement team and, and see what we can do. And that will be part of, that can be done as part of the existing kind of communication bucket then? We would, in, we would absolutely incorporate okay. that into our existing plans. Oh, yeah, appreciate that. Um, and then I was wondering for the inf on the enforcement side, um, how does how do those numbers compare to past winters when it comes to you know the parking ban ticket numbers? Well, from uh, in 2022, the numbers are comparable, although we wrote a lot more warnings because it was mm, it was the right, first first right. year of that phase two ban. Yeah. So, but the numbers are comparable uh, from that perspective, although. Um, with the addition of the 15 snow and ice officers, you can imagine that, that we were a lot more proactive and a lot more, um, we were out there a lot more. So uh, our numbers would obviously be higher because of the fact that we were, had dedicated resources. So the numbers were comparable, but the year before was more warnings than actual tickets, C correct. whereas comparable number th this last winter season's more tickets than the usual warnings. Right, because in the previous years we had used uh, contracted services, but we didn't have as many. So, okay. um, yes. Um, and then how, how many of those, like 2,800, and then you, you take away the, the ones that were canceled, how many of those led to towing? To, to total? To to sorry, towing. 243. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and that's obviously more than past year because we didn't really have that no. service, right? Correct. Um, okay. And then I was wondering about... Um, yeah, so I guess I sort of have this overall, I, you know, last year, one of the principles that was really critical for me was making sure frontline staff really felt empowered to make some real time decisions, rather than say waiting for directions to come down from the top and then they have to go back to the neighborhoods and m fix mistakes, et cetera. And it feels like this year, kind of given what we're anticipating with the service level, that kind of iterative, you know, real time small decision making will come like, will become more important than ever. Wondering if you can speak to that or just touch on that. Um, how do folks feel about that? Uh, you know, do they feel really empowered and, um, yeah. Yeah, I, ca I can uh, start off and then Val can talk to some of the specifics. So absolutely empowerment and uh, delegation of authority to our uh, frontline staff has been a definite focus over the last year and ensuring that decisions are made at the right level and that operational crews have full authority to make operational level decisions to clear the inventory that they're, uh, they're charged with. We, uh, we have also have a few committees that uh, we receive regular engagement from across the snow and ice control program. So whether you're on roads or active pathways, uh, we have these opportunities for staff to come together and provide ideas on how they can uh, perhaps do their jobs better, or some of the barriers that they're facing, but really that comes down to getting out and being present with the operational staff and hearing from them and their experiences and making sure that they feel that they're empowered to, to do the work that they're charged Thank with. Thank you. Sorry, oh, I have appreciate to catch you that. off. Thank we're you. Way, we're over time. Sorry about that. Councillor Knack. Uh, thank you, Councillor Principe. Um, I think the, uh, Mr. Scott, I just wanted to ask, sorry, I had to step away for, for a brief moment and I, I might have missed it, but you were talking about the 15 officers. I, I heard about the enforcement on the parking piece and how they did a lot of proactive, uh, so, and, and sorry, what are we, with the changes, what what does that number take us to going forward? Yes. Yeah, so you're going to have 15 going forward, correct? 
Correct. We won't be having 15. So the reduction was down to 20% of what the ask was. And so going forward, we'll have approximately five snow and ice officers that will be allocated towards supporting the parking bans. And in addition to that, w one of the things that um, we were extremely proud of this year was that when they weren't working on the snow bans, they were actually out doing proactive enforcement in some of those high traffic areas, uh, areas around seniors homes, rec centers, BIAs, commercial uh, areas, in order to try and make the most impact we could um, for those that need accessibility and that had mobility issues. So um, that certainly is going to be reduced, uh, but we will do uh, as much as we can with the current resourcing that's been allocated. But yeah, realistically, that that's that doesn't you know that's a pretty big drop down. So I, I don't know how much you'll be able to get out. What were you finding with the sort of main streets and and all of that work? Because I mean, you're right. There's a bit of an accessibility component to that. What was were you finding a lot of compliance, especially if you went through the winter and people realized that you had folks who were proactively doing the work? Yeah. So with our MEO group, with our general enforcement group, we do on average around ten thousand complaints a year. 89% of those are, are citizen, um, you know, called in, citizen initiated. The snow and ice officers, the 15, did 13,000 proactive investigations. And, um, you, you know, they issued about 1,700 tickets. So, again, it, it just goes to show that, that that proactive enforcement, we still get a high compliance rate, but the fact that we were able to do twice as many inspections and support people with mobility issues, seniors, and those that need that accessibility was, was I think, one of the key things uh, that we took away uh, that we were really proud of this year. Okay, uh, great. Uh, and and uh, separate from the enforcement side, I think just the, the last question again was on the uh, overall budget. And, and let's assume for the moment that we don't see a, a change due to OP12, although uh, my hope is that we will. Um, how do you make the decision to, you know, in terms of w going to roads versus active pathways and sort of prioritizing um, what we need most from a GBA plus perspective? So what we have right now is um, we've got teams dedicated to, to roads and then there's uh, separate teams that are dedicated for the active pathways, um, different skill set, different equipment that's required and routing. Um, so right now what we have is, is the priorities uh, set based on the resources we have and how fast it, get, it takes to get through that inventory. Um, and, but we're always looking for, for ways to improve it, but at this point we're looking at um, the service levels that we've, that we've uh, published right now. Yeah, and, and so realistically if we're looking to, you know, it, it, so, it's not, so it's not just as easy as saying, hey, well, instead of, if you're, if you're looking at that chart between roadways and active pathways, it's not as easy just to say reallocate some of the ones in the roads to, to help drop down that priority three active pathways because you need the right equipment, you need the right teams, so, so they're not interchangeable. On, um, on, a, on a permanent basis, I would say that's, that's correct, that's true. Um, yeah. That said, we also do look at areas like when can we move you know, say folks from the northwest or northeast um, to be responsive and reactive. Uh, and on one-time basis, you know, can we move staff from one area to the other? Like, for example, this past winter, we moved staff from um, from snow and ice control to potholes because we had uh, the pavement was available just based on weather conditions. So we do have the ability to be reactive and responsive when it makes sense, and we have the skill sets available. But in general, uh, different uh, different skill sets. Uh, those will be all my questions. I think we'll have some uh, draft wording for a motion just around that communication plan piece uh, at the appropriate time. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Councillor Rice? Uh, so I would like to ask some question for the uh, 2023 24 winter season focus. Um, I believe our item 20s uh, expect the services keep improvements and to see the better and better. And uh, from like financial perspective, from financial perspective, the actual spending for the 2022 and the 23 is $72.2 million. Um, however, and in last year, we did have one-time funding. Can you explain uh, the unfavorable variances 
is caused by this one-time funding what the services program we provided, or is cover something else? Because this is really important. The, uh, your answer is really important for me to ask the next related question. Yeah, no, no, no problem. The, what we did last year is we took that $4.7 million uh, and the, the, the guidance to start building up towards that R1, AP1 service level. So we hired uh, roughly 120 more staff. And we got about halfway there to that R1, AP1 level, so about 50% of the way there. Um, and at, uh, at budget deliberations, only 20% was funded. So we had a decision to make. Um, do we lay off all those staff that we just hired and trained? Uh, or do we retain them and keep that service level consistent throughout the winter season? And, and that's what we did. So all of the staff that we hired and trained and brought on board in the fall, so through like September through October, November, um, they're hired, they're trained, they're, they're operating. Uh, we retain them through into the 2023 calendar year at a one-time variance. So that way Edmontonians did not experience a change in service mid-season. Uh, and so that's what's reflective in that peach color on the graph, that variance. Uh, so also the one-time funding, and then it's my understanding, that is related to the program last year, the Direction Council provided to pavement level for that. So that's his one time. Is, is that the part of that? Or it, not? it is not, no. Okay. So that bar shows the 22-23 winter season, so essentially yeah. the fall and through until um, that one-time funding associated with the blading to bare pavement was roughly yeah. another $16 million. That was in, it was in the 2022 calendar year, but it was in the first quarter of okay. 2022. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. Uh, then, based on that clarification, but the, bus, the base bus budget did not change at all. The base budget is still the same, and based on the uh, presentation provided here. Um, if that is the case, if we look at the 2023-24 for the, uh, your major focus is the priority service level deliver. And however, if you look at the right, residential roads, school zones, bus stops, path, and the public amenities, and actually is all the service level reduced. And then this is actually is contradicting and from the information you provided here, we're going to focus on priority service level delivery. And do you think this is not a priority, like residential roads, school zones, bus stops, path, pathway, and public amenities, and in the winter time? I don't think we're not saying that it's not a priority. We're just looking at how we distribute the work, how we break our work up, and what kind of funding we have available to provide that work. So when we look at the budget, the people, the time, and the equipment that we have, that delivery has to be dispersed in our priority areas but it impacts certain areas just because of the amount of people that we have available to us. Because right now, based on the uh, report here, the services level changed for those areas, actually reduced lots. Eight days to 10 days, four days to six days, 13 days to 22 days. So is there any po possible there we look at and we still use existing funding and with uh, the resources we have, because the last year we didn't use the contractors, we only use the staff and we have, and then could be able to do the same services level without reduce all those days. Uh, last year we did still use contracted services. And, and by the, on the reports here, the page, I can, I can point out the page here and say it very clear and then we did not use the contractor. I have question, uh, in, 2000, in 2022 and 2315, uh, Snow and the ICE officer, and this is page 120. I don't think I have enough time. I may come back and say there is no contract used or not used. Okay, so we can clarify that information because that is I saw in the reports. Okay, thank you, Councillor Rice. Uh, I just wanted to um, ask a little bit about ticketing. In the metrics for the tickets, do we take into consideration the compliance? Because maybe some neighborhoods may be more inclined to not be parking on the roadway. Do we take that into consideration? 
That's okay, I can ask again. <laughs> so uh, in regards to the ticketing, we were, I know we uh, looked at you know different neighborhoods or sections of this city. Uh, included in the metrics, it's, it's not included, but uh, is it considered how many or which neighborhoods are maybe more compliant in not having their, their vehicles on the roadway? Yeah, so th that was working in collaboration with uh, city operations in um, identifying when snow removal was going in, was there a co high compliance rate? Um, and if there wasn't, then they would be calling the officers to come in and, and do that proactive um, enforcement just in front of, of as they're going through. Then if there was active snow removal in the area and they were seeing a, a, a lot of uh, low compliance, they would be calling us immediately to try and come in and, and, and be reactive immediately. And so it's more about neighborhoods that are less compliant, maybe that's where we're going in. And, and urban design as well. Some other areas of the city uh, have a lot of cul-de-sacs and uh, it, those places that have a lot of cul-de-sacs, we would be looking at those cul-de-sacs. So areas of the city that are developed in that regard would have less tickets. Okay, good. That was the only question for me. Uh, Councillor Rutherford, I think you're on your first round, so please go ahead. Thank you. I'm actually just going to jump off of, of your question because I think the only one that's still outstanding for me that hasn't been answered is, you know, the original uh, wording from for the inquiry came from email responses that I had received from administration to some of the concerns around uh, ticketing uh, in Ward and Olnick. And it did mention that there was priority neighborhoods. And then the report says that there isn't any priority neighborhoods. But even in the response just now to Councillor Principe, I feel like there was a bit of a contradiction there. So can we, like, I get the, like, if there are, if there's cars parked and it's preventing the snow clearing, you're calling in, in the bylaw. But it sounds like there's a first part to that in being a bit proactive in areas with low compliance. So, so Council Rutherford, I would say we take citizen uh, concerns uh, when they're reported to us as being low compliance. Those would be areas that we would actively um, uh, pursue, but we would be working in collaboration with city ops to identify areas where they have gone through, they're going through or, or they've seen in the past for us to be able to make sure that we are addressing those. So um, I would say I wouldn't focus on the, the, the priority perspective uh, and I hope that that's not confusing. Um, does that help clarify a little bit of what you're asking? Yeah, I mean, I think what spurred the original inquiry on was, you know, even after the part phase two parking ban, I, I got a ton of emails to my office regarding um, concerns over uh, aggressive par aggressive ticketing. And when I talked to my council colleagues, like a lot of them were not getting that. So I, I guess just trying to make sure the only question that's outstanding that I can't really go back with complete confidence and say, you know, I'm still, it's still fuzzy to me. What, how we make sure that there is isn't proportionate, we're not any sort of inequitable targeting of neighborhoods with mm -hmm. our parking enforcement. So could you just clearly yes. lay that out for me? Yes, and, and there is no targeting. Uh, there is only collaboration with city ops and identifying where we need to attend based on if there's low compliance uh, that they're seeing and also as a reactive when they're in the communities for us to um, uh, ensure that we're going there. I think uh, Eddie was very clear in the fact that there are some neighborhoods and some districts that by the design of it uh, would see lower um, maybe ticketing uh, compared to others. Uh, and, and I can categorically say that there is no identified uh, priority uh, targeting uh, that parking enforcement and our uh, enforcement group would be 
um, doing. Okay, and then my other question was like, because I mean, 31,000 for the, the app isn't super huge. And the unfortunate thing is that we can't get a sense of what neighborhoods have have picked up on that or not. And I know that this direction came from council. Would you need different direction to do a little bit more um, like education and promote it? Like you would have gotten a ticket, you know what I mean? Kind of thing rather than just immediately going to a, a $250 ticket. Certainly, I think I think uh, Council Rutherford, any communication going forward, we can use that as as some of the impetus to say, you know, in order to avoid a ticket, you know, we're seeking compliance, um, and uh, provide that in part of our messaging as part of our initial campaigning, um, and then I'm hoping that it's not just the thirty one thousand signs or the 31,000 notifications yeah. out there there's signage that is going up yeah. there's there's multiple avenues that i think that we're doing our best to try and communicate out to uh every area that the snow plows are in uh in order for that behavioral change to take effect and i think just to what add i'm hearing so what i'm hearing sorry just have a just to confirm is that the motion that's potentially being made around communication might support that yes Yes. I guess I can't debate a motion that's not on the floor. Never mind. I will stop. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Knack. Uh, thank you. I, I, I worry that it's not going to uh, fully address what had just been raised. Uh, so I'll, I'll read out what what I worked on with the clerk. It's just slightly modified from what was sent from um, Accessibility Advisory Committee, and then uh, would love to get some uh, thoughts from Councillor Rutherford about how we can maybe add to it to to make sure that it's all being thought of. So the motion that had been worked on so far was that uh, administration work with the Accessibility Advisory Committee on a communication plan for the snow and ice control program. Very straight, simple, straightforward, no report required back. Um, just just making that formal that uh, what we heard today. Um, I, I don't have any other questions, but I'll, I'll uh, see if we can think about what Councilor Rutherford just raised and, and figure out a way to try to capture that in maybe a, a second part or, or something else. So uh, that's it for me for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Councillor Rice. I have a few questions regarding the ticketing. And then, so follow on the inequitable perspective for that question. Uh, I would like to know a little bit more about the, uh, when the city um, deliver enforcement and issue tickets, timeline and between the sim, uh, signage and also between the time and when the, uh, the snow already uh, cleared. Um, so in the report, it said very clear enforcement does not take place in, if the location has already been cleared by snow and ice control crimes. And however, the, what we heard, at least speak to me, and I heard from my constituents, the tickets are still issued out after the snow clean. So can you uh, provide more information no, uh, on that piece? Th those would be exceptions that are not in accordance with how we do things, and those tickets were probably recalled. Um, so I, I don't know how the tickets record processed, but at least uh, I still re I still receive the concern on that piece. If they clean already done, on why is it you come back to issue the tickets? That is number one question I had. Uh, number two question is about the signage, and then I heard many uh, cases in certain neighborhoods the signage is not on, and then but the enforcement has already happened, and then. Constituents residents in the in the neighborhood is really uh, confusing for us, and because their understanding is we have signage on, and then the enforcement will, and even though and as a councillor and as a city, I believe, and for the communication piece, we do a lot of work to say, oh, this parking ban phase two is out. Well, in fact, this day, this day, we we keep that communication really open and then effective, but it still happened. 
the mm -hmm. signage not there. And the even residents took a picture. Signage not there at all, but the tickets issued. Right, so there's a, a number of um, entranceways into neighborhoods where we did do signage and we made in-season adjustments. So we have multiple communication channels to communicate that a phase two parking ban is on. The traditional white signage was what was used and some of the feedback that we heard was that it was, uh, there was not enough of it and it wasn't visible, so we made an in-season adjustment. We went from 600 white signs to add an additional 800 of the bright orange signs and deployed those, uh, which we started seeing being used for the end of the season and for spring sweep. So that's an improvement in the program that we'll see next year. Um, increased signage, more visible signage in addition to the other communication tools. And I can add to that, Council Rice, the tickets that were withdrawn for the first two days were in a specific area for, for a notification area. Immediately after that, every ticket before it was written, an officer would verify that a sign was in the area and that a notification had gone out. So we can categorically say tickets issued after the second day of enforcement going forward that that, that had taken place. So if there are certain exceptions or um, as you mentioned, blading through and then they came back and bladed again um, where they're saying hey it was kind of clean or it was if you, if you want to provide those exceptions to us we'll certainly look into those and ensure that we haven't uh, issued those in any error um, for all those like take the issue in air and then you will do the investigation and also uh, you will do investigation you will make a final decision and for that and also for signage and for this type of communication will be reflected in the motion on the floor, and it will improve some like communication plan, and then including the signage, including um, the timeline, and between the already cleaned, and then go back to do um, the enforcement again. So this type of details, specific sense, will increase that clarification and through this communication plan. So I just want asking for this will be included in this communication plan. This motion specifically addresses the accessibility committee, so we'd be looking yeah. at how to coordinate with the accessibility committee and how we communicate to that, that general uh, population. However, we do do communication uh, each year, every year, and we look at how we improve that. So all the communication we're getting here, the feedback we're getting here, will build into our program approach for, for the snow season and look at how we can you know, learn from what we had last year yep. and then make sure that we're communicating effectively in the next year. So that committee will not be covered by this motion for the improvement for that type of communication? Not, not as it's written, no. Uh, but, but largely that work is already built into our communication plan. So we do have a communication plan for large programs like snow and ice, um, but the additional signage, the tweaks to the email text notification, all of those would already be incorporated into just continuous improvement for, for year over year. But that would not be embedded within this, um, this particular motion, but it is work that we would be doing anyway. And you would, you would have seen some of those signs uh, for spring sweep. So we had hundreds of additional signs, uh, got some good feedback for some, uh, spring sweep. They were more noticeable, uh, so we're just kind of building on that. So you will continue to improve that and then, okay, okay. thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice, Councillor Knack. Uh, thank you. So, so recognizing that conversation and, and Councillor Rutherford's previous questions too, I, I know I can't amend my, amend my own motion, so there's two options. I could withdraw and then restate with some updated wording um, based on that. If That would probably be the cleanest if, if committee will allow me that uh, opportunity. I would appreciate that, Councillor Knack. Uh, check with my other, our other committee members. Yeah, it looks like it's much appreciated. Excellent. Thank you. Go ahead. Excellent. Uh, I think the clerks do have the updated wording now, so the motion would be right away, yes, uh, <laughs> that the administration work with the Accessibility Advisory Committee on a communication plan for the snow for uh, the snow and ice control program and that administration develop a communication plan to better support parking ban compliance in residential areas. Great, thank you. We have a motion on the floor now. Uh, Councillor Paquette? More questions? Go ahead. No questions, just, uh, just ready to, speak. to speak. All right, any more questions? It looks like there are no more questions. Please, Councillor Paquette, go ahead. All right, thank you. So I'll speak um, in, in general broadly to the Snow and Ice program, knowing that uh, we've got this specific direction on the floor. 
but uh, it all sort of ties in together. So the challenge we have here is one of res resources. And um, unless council wants to um, increase taxes or cut from other services, it looks like the snow clearing budget is what it is, gradually increasing over the next few years. Um, and there's different ways to look at snow clearing from the full suite of services at uh, 240 to 280 million dollars a year to what we currently have, which is a little over 60 million dollars a year right now. Um, and that, of course, is always impacted by the winter and winters are becoming increasingly less predictable. And therefore, uh, costs tend to uh, fluctuate along with that. So the question is simply what do most folks feel is a reasonable allocation um, to up the snow clearing budget by about $17 million is about a 1% tax increase to get up to the hundred million dollars that we were hearing uh, would cost uh, folks, I, don't know, I think about an extra 30 month, $30 a month extra in taxes, give or take. Um, so that's sort of where we're at. Uh, do we want to pay for the service? Um, as is, which is what we've got, or do we want to increase the service in the coming budget? Uh, that's another question. Can we find that allocation in uh, OP12? Unlikely. OP12 is not a magic bullet. It's not going to magically solve uh, resource issues. Um, it can streamline a little bit, can find efficiencies a little bit, it can refocus some of those dollars, but uh, you can't invent dollars where there aren't any. So another way to look at that is that uh, for the past several years, uh, on average, Edmonton has had the lowest uh, tax adjustments of uh, all lake size cities and potentially all big cities in Canada. I'll have to check on that. But uh, current tax rate of 4.96% is a bit over the inflation rate this year of 4.3%. But then when we take into account growth as well, and uh, the Edmonton population growth last year, I think the number was about 2.86%, I have that right, would take us to an even Stephen tax rate of 7.16%. That means we are still, uh, these many years later, running behind on simply keeping up. So that's the challenge, is the demand for services versus what people want to pay for them. And the frustration is that uh, folks feel that there are so many efficiencies that we can find in the city because there are uh, capital builds and programs that some people don't agree with and some people think that there should be more of. And so it becomes that balancing act of what people actually want to see. And I was doing a few calculations on one of our controversial uh, capital builds and uh, doesn't even come close uh, if we transfer that uh, to the operating side to covering these things because of the way capital and operating dollars differ. So again, there is no magic bullet. And so administration is doing the best they can with what they've got. Um, the hope is that by working with uh, uh, the Accessibility Advisory Committee and working on a community communications plan that we can enhance some of these services with what we've got. But again, I don't think anyone should be expecting wholesale positive changes until we are willing to actually pay for the service that people want to see, or until people say, yeah, this is the right allocation for what we get. The city still relatively functions and um, it's, it's not all the bells and whistles. Um, but of course, that's, uh, that is not the popular sentiment. People want better services. Um, but they don't want to pay more money for it. And that's the challenge that we're in. And with that, uh, I support this motion and uh, hopefully it uh, leads to improvements. But for our administration, I, I, uh, you have not stated it, but I feel uh, the tension that you've got in trying to um, provide more services for less money. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. I will go to Councillor Rice now. I, I know I'm sorry I missed the opportunity to ask a question. I'm going to put my question into my speak. 
I do believe the, uh, the communication plan is really important um, for the snow and ice control program and even and for the uh, purpose of how uh, our Edmontonians to perceive or add, actually receive the services and for this important uh, services in our city. And then we need that communication is really clear. So I saw uh, my colleague uh, add the second part. That is the second part. Uh, it seems to me that to respond my earlier question uh, to have that communication plan to really better uh, support the parking ban uh, compliance. So that means this motion has a two different components. And one specific working with accessibility advisory committee and focus on that piece. So res to respond, in order to respond to my question earlier, so this part two be added. So if that is my understanding correct. Uh, I just want to make sure uh, I have clear understanding for what I'm going to vote. Uh, if this is a something, uh, this is a correct understanding, of course, I'm going to support both of them. And even though an administration said very clear, you don't need the motion and to develop a maintenance plan and you're already doing, and right now with this motion, that means you are going to de develop a new plan or is just enhance your existing communication plan and in terms of the better support, the parking ban compliance. So I just want to be clear for that and for what I'm vote. And I know I, I'm not allowed to ask a question right now. Okay, that's his a few comments there. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Knack to close. Uh, thank you, Councillor Prince Fay, and, and uh, to the last, to, to Councillor Rice's piece, I think that that is sort of my interpretation again here. It's 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 work that was going to happen, but just being a little bit of a bit more deliberate and uh, on on both the accessibility front and on the enforcement front. So, uh, my thanks to to yourself and and Councillor Rutherford, who I think made the initial inquiry um, on that regarding the enforcement piece, and and my thanks to uh, the accessibility advisory committee and Councillors um, uh, Wright and Tang for. Um, advancing, uh, being vocal about that piece on on supporting that group with uh, the better communication. So, um, really, I think from there, just just the the final closing thought uh, on the budget front. Uh, again, really appreciate the work that administration's been doing. Uh, again, data is has been fantastic and has allowed us to be much more informed about the decisions that we're making. Um, it, it should be no shock that uh, I, I think we're well still off where I'd like to see for the um, active pathways in particular. Uh, and on the roadways, uh, seeing the, that dip on the residential front is, is also a bit uh, concerning to me. And, and again, that's going to be up to us to decide how quick we want to um, address that because uh, generally speaking over the years, what I found is that main roads have been pretty good over the years. Uh, I, I don't often get a ton of complaints. You know, freezing rain can sometimes uh, cause a bit of a spike on, on arterial roads, but arterials and the main collectors that I think we I think we got a good system there, but it's how we're how we're addressing the local roads and how we're addressing the infrastructure for those that uh, that can't drive or choose not to drive that that is still um, significantly off where I think we need to be. But again, we'll have that conversation uh, later this year. But but my hope is that we'll um, we'll see at least uh, a return back to to pre this last year's levels soon-ish, uh, sooner rather than later. And and I'd like to see us hopefully move up to the uh, the ideal level, um, you know, with by the end of the budget cycle. Uh, but but we'll have that discussion at the appropriate time. But thanks for all the work that's been going into this. So uh, that's it for me. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Please vote. We have four votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. Thank you very much everyone for the work and thank you to our speaker, Tanya LaRiviere, for being with us today. Next, we will be moving Can on you, um, to- point of order? Yeah. So we don't need to pass like the, receive the uh, report as information, do we need to? For the, re, for, 
Uh, so we do. We so do. we need to. Sorry, for for eight point one, we do because it was cross referenced. Okay. So okay. So that was just for item seven point two then. Seven point two for the motion. So we yep. don't. We don't need to receive it for information, but if you would like, that's fine. But for 8.1, we do. We do. Yeah. Okay. okay, then we'll, then we'll move that. Okay, thank you, Councillor Rice. So uh, I move that uh, June 19th, 2023, City Operation Report C0018-24 be received for the information. Great, that's thank you for pointing that out, Councillor Rice. Does anyone have any questions about that? I'm assuming not. We spoke to them together. So I'll just ask my colleagues to please vote. We have four votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. So next we'll be moving on to item 7.4 and I see administration all ready to go. So please go ahead. Thank you. On September 27, 2022, following the presentation of report CS01220, Drug Checking Program, collaboration with homeless serving agencies, administration was asked to come back with additional research and engagement with potential drug checking service users. Since then, we have conducted further research and engagement regarding opportunities for municipal partnership in drug checking programs. We are here today with an updated report for information. No decision is required. Today we are sharing additional information on those drug checking programs, which is one way some other jurisdictions in Canada are addressing this issue of drug poisoning. Notably, a pilot project launched in Calgary earlier this month uh, we will continue to monitor closely. For this report, we have engaged key, key stakeholders and gathered information from research, local initiatives, and people with lived and living experience. The majority of stakeholders were not supportive of the city playing a direct role in the operations of drug checking services. Some stakeholders recommended the city play a supportive role. Recommendations that we heard for a municipal role include raising awareness by sharing information and educating the public on drug checking services, providing resources and funding to support drug checking programs, advocating for data collection, management, and dissemination, and further developing local understanding of emerging knowledge and research on drug checking services. Effective solutions to drug poisonings require meaningful collaboration and partnerships. We would like to extend our sincere appreciation to the community partners, advocates, and people with lived and living experience who contributed their time and knowledge to inform this report. While this report is specific to the role the municipality can play in drug checking programs, it will also contribute to our broader efforts to support work underway on developing recommendations for reducing injuries and deaths due to drug poisoning, which will be presented to this committee in September 2023. Thank you, and we'd be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm just going to call for our speakers now. Uh, we did have our first speaker, Jeanette Salavalagio. She um, requested to not speak, so she's dropped from the speakers list. Uh, we have Shelby Suazo. Are you there with us online? Hi. Yes, I, yes, I am. Um, oh. Christine and I are going to be speaking together, though. We're not individually speaking. Okay. Um, the way it works here, you each have five minutes. So I'll give you five minutes. When your five minutes is up, then I'll call for her to speak. Does that sound okay? Okay, we are sharing a presentation and have slides um, in between the presentation that she's like we're speaking. It's okay, so she'll be, go ahead, do your part and then I'll do my part, it's okay. Okay, sounds oh, great. That's Thank great, you, Thank you. Go ahead, anytime you're ready, Shelby. Hi there, my name is Shelby Suazo. I am the drug checking program manager with AWARE and I'm also an LPN as well. And then we have Christine and she is our director of programs so she can introduce herself as well. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about the slides that I have prepared for um, my speech as well. So Christine and I were supposed to do this together but I'm gonna improvise here. Um, so a lot about our program with our mobilized drug checking program in Alberta based in Calgary has been going on developing for a few years. Um, I'll just get you to change the next slide, please. And we'll just go two more, please. 
Yes. So um, Christine will talk about the program development before my time with the project. I have been involved in the project as a consultation role since the inception of it, but I've officially um, joined capacity with the Wearers of Program Manager in March. Um, so I'll let Christine talk about the other development around that, but for right now I'm going to just talk about our, our advisory committee that we have formed and have been working with over the last year to de develop our program. So you can see on our presentation, we have a wide variety of people across the country working on our advisory committee and giving us guidance on how to develop our program and how to execute it. So we've had a lot of key players in the drug checking profession and community and also in public health and research as well too. Um, you can notice as well that we do have the Beltline Business Improvement Association and I'll talk about their involvement when I, when I get to this, my part about our van. I'll just get you to go to the next slide, please. So with our program, and this is kind of, um, so I'm, I'm really improvising saying, I apologize, Christine will, will touch base on that. So we applied our exemption as an urgent public health need site. And so that is giving us an emergent um, application process and applying for our section 56 uh, exemption with Health Canada to operate a drug checking program. So within that program development, we have made our drug checking code of conduct. So this is very standard across all drug checking programs internationally and nationally as well too. So as you can see on your screen in front of you that we have a quite robust code of conduct as well. And we are very, um, we, we, this is a very strong in, um, code of conduct as well. So we really make sure that, you know, nobody's buying or selling substances in or around the van by 150 feet, no consumption or use of substances inside the van or in the intake and greeting area. So these are code of conduct that our clients have to access or follow, sorry, in order to um, receive our service. Um, so our hours of operations are going to be three days a week, Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays. And the reason why we're only operating three days a week is because we are in partnership with the Beltline Business Improvement Association and they lend us their van. So they are using the van um, for events and outreach um, outside of our service hours. And so that's why we have a great involvement. They've loaned it to us. And so the costs were covered through them. Our locations are going to be throughout the downtown Calgary location, and that's just a start. Um, the reason why we have chosen to stay within the, sorry, Tuesdays and Thursdays, we'll be staying within the downtown Calgary core. And then Saturday, we'll be going outside of the downtown core to access um, other demographics that don't necessarily access services downtown. Um, because one thing that we really want to make sure that is important with this project is that all demographics and people along the entire spectrum of substance use are accessing the service. Um, I just like to take a moment and recognize that everybody uses drugs and I don't mean to put everyone in here together, but it's outside of our inner city core where people who use drugs um, happen. So my role within AWARE is to really encompass that this service incorporates everybody along that spectrum of usage. And that includes your recreational weekend warriors, your occasional social substance users to your people um, entrenched in a very dependent lifestyle or they're physically dependent as well too. Um, so we wanna make sure that happens. Um, technology, we're using an FTIR broker too. Um, I'm just gonna skip ahead because this is stuff that you guys can access on our slides and Christine can follow up as well too. I really wanna just talk about our provincial plan that we have for drug checking in Alberta. We really want to expand our services to other locations as well, including Edmonton and strengthen our par partnerships within the province as well. One thing I really do wanna note before my time is up here is that I'll, we are um, creating an Alberta drug sense dashboard for data collection as well. But I'll let Christine uh, take over the presentation from here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shelby. Christine, go ahead, you have five minutes. All right, thank you. I'm just gonna throw the slides to the side. So I'll look at them from my end and uh, we can share them afterwards if needed. So as far as program development uh, goes, we started thinking about this program in 2019. 
uh, where has been in operation officially registered since 2016. So we do have quite a bit of experience in this field, working with peers and present employing peers and doing work um, run by peers. So in 2019 to 2020, um, we looked at our data that we'd collected and we saw an increase in outreach engagements as well as an increase in reported hospitalizations due to drug checking within the past 12 months of data collection. That then prompted our um, interest in applying for the SWAP funding through Health Canada um, and we got about 700,000 to do this particular drug checking project. So we've been approved to kind of run it over an 18 month period and then we're looking at extending that um, that's why we do have a temporary um, exemption that we hope to extend. So as Shelby um, mentioned, we do work with an advisory committee and this is part of our environmental scan and collecting information to make sure that we do this correctly. So we're looking at the impact of this program on our target audience, our target um, population, as well as on the communities in which we'll have these vans. So I won't talk about the exemption, but what I'm gonna go into actually is the community engagement and the community impact. So we focused on the dissemination of information. We've done an environmental scan and we've also done quite a few focus groups and we've also done open houses and meet and greets within the city. So we've invited um, agencies, we've invited uh, city officials, we've invited the police, transit, to get as much information as we can and as much input as we can into our program design. Otherwise, we're pretty sure it's not gonna be um, taken up as successfully as we hope. So this is a very strategic approach and it's on purpose. So we're combining virtual and in-person delivery of information to make sure that people have access to that um, wherever they are. So there'll be updates on our websites as well. Um, and we're measuring our success uh, through learning opportunities, which involve, um, again, in-person meetings or focus groups, as well as virtual ones. Then we're looking at the knowledge products that we're uh, sharing with people who come and access the service who are in, or who are interested in information about the service. So those are educational pamphlets, online content, flyers. Um, and then we look at the services that we're providing. These are specifically for people who use drugs, any Canadian who uses drugs can access this service. Our target population is um, the group 18 to 65, people who are at risk, houseless folks. And the idea behind that is to provide wraparound services. So folks come in for the drug checking, but while they're there, we talk about um, harm reduction, we talk about safe use, we also talk about multiple options, and one of those options is treatment. So we're not a group, um, we're not an organization that closes doors to options. We make sure that people know what is accessible to them and where to find it. It doesn't matter what solution they're looking for. Uh, again, the beneficiaries, as I mentioned, to be more specific, we're looking at BIPOC, men working in trade, sex workers, LGBTQ to S plus, population, houses, people, and people go to festivals or clubs on a regular basis. These are the groups that we've identified as the most at risk of experiencing a drug poisoning because of um, an identified frequency of use of drugs within these target populations. Okay, so we've looked at risk factors for our program and uh, for our workers, we're looking at uh, mitigating high turnover and burnout and we're making sure that we're staggering their shifts so that not one person is doing multiple shifts at a time. We're also making sure that our services are advertised properly through the right channels and with the correct information to make sure that the public is aware and not receiving secondhand information and misinformation. And then lastly, for our beneficiaries, we're making sure that um, these are people that may not regularly access safe use practices or use safe use practices. So we're trying to make sure we engage them through multiple approaches, not just one approach. So we're trying very many different approaches to getting in touch with our target population. So. We're looking at um, support from the city of Edmonton and some of these were mentioned earlier. So of course, funding is one of the biggest ones, but also supporting physical locations so that we're able to collect and store data safely. We also want um, help with connecting with communities and community engagement. We've previously done a um, public awareness campaign with the city of Edmonton and we want to build off of that momentum and continue that. We also want help building relationships with other organizations in the BIA as Shelby had mentioned. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that. 
uh, I will ask my colleagues to please sign up to ask questions of the speaker. S speakers. Councillor Knack, would you like to go ahead? Are you looking to ask questions? I wasn't sure. That's okay. Uh, no, no, I want to select it to hear from our speakers who did a wonderful job, but I don't have any specific questions uh, from that presentation. Thank you. Okay. Well, I am going to sign up then to speak. I do have a couple of questions. Uh, Christine, you had mentioned uh, the target population um, and you had mentioned 18 to 65 year olds. Do you, um, also serve under 18 year olds because as Shelby said you know there's many there are many different demographics so are, are there under 18 year olds maybe you're not aware of the actual numbers so we do know that there are under 18 year olds if I may go please may do please yeah please okay <laughs> So we do know from statistics that come in from other organizations like Trellis and Woods Homes that there are under 18 year olds who do um, use drugs and who are dealing with addictions. Um, our organization specifically works with 18 and above. That's why it's stated that way. However, if someone under 18 does come to access the service, we're not going to turn them away because this is an opportunity to then connect them to other resources, other organizations that can assist them, and to also have a conversation around um, you know, safe use and how to make sure that they can get on a more straight and narrow path or more, um, how do I say, useful path for them or healthy path for them. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's great. Yeah, that was, going, well, that was what my question was about. Like, will you still uh, help and service pe folks that are under 18? So that's great to hear. That's good to hear. I'm glad. Um, so this question, so again, Shelby, you'd mentioned, you know, all demographics, there are many different folks, some houseless, some wealthy. Uh, and so a lot of people can service or use this service, but do we find that um, certain demographics might use this service more? And also with that, um, are there some demographics where, and this is my concern, even if they see that the, um, the drug might be, uh, well, I, I was going to say lethal, but I guess any amount can be lethal. But if it would, would is it possible they still might use it? That's kind of a concern of mine. So, just I just want to note just a little bit on my background. So, um, before my time here with the Wear, I was also a street nurse with Boyle Street Community Services at Streetworks, and I'm also the founder and director of Indigo Harm Reduction Foundation. So, I have a wide variety of working with different um, types of people who use this drugs. Um, so when I, in my programming and the way that I move forward is I am looking at all of that because I know everyone along the spectrum. And so within my experience with delivering drug checking services as Indigo has in the past um, with an FTIR and both with reagents as well, is that when we're working with certain different types of de demographics, there's definitely certain types of messaging that we have to portray and a lot of dismantling fear and information and stigma around uh, drug checking. A uh, big concern with our folks who are houseless and who use, who work really hard to get their substance for the day. And I'm gonna be quite frank because this is the reality of our folks who are living houseless and who are living with a dependence to a substance is they hustled really hard for that, to be able to pay for that substance. So they're very afraid that they're not gonna get their substance back or it's gonna get destroyed. And so we really need to make sure that the messaging towards those folks is that you do get your substance back. This is something that you know we're not keeping your substance. We recognize your hard work and, or you know, your journey in, in getting that. And, you know, a lot of it too is in Alberta, we don't get a chance to have any surveillance data on our supply in Alberta. So this is actually going to be 
our program is really breaking that open and giving us a chance to look into the supply. And a lot of the messaging too, when we deliver results that are going to be potentially adverse or dangerous substances, we really give that information and knowledge and power to that person and, and really like empower them to make that decision. Of course, what we tell them might not necessarily always be the result that we would like to see. But again, with drug checking, it's very respecting people's autonomy, respecting their choice on what they would like to do. And we can all we can do is just provide them with much safety and messaging that we can to ensure their health and safety and well being. I do want to note that in the more festival club like nightlife lifestyles and demographics who use substances, this is a normal thing. This is an expected service at festivals and events in BC. And it's been wanted in Alberta for a very long time. I've been advocating for these services for about seven years. And so the amount of messages that Indigo gets in their social medias, and I'm just referring to Indigo right now is because that experience I have with Indigo. And so that that demographic is they want this edmontonians want this service okay thank you my time is up thank you councillor tang go ahead great thank you both very much for this presentation um are you, you're both based in calgary right no, i in calgary shelby's in edmonton okay gotcha um and uh it's, so it's been almost a year since the pilot kicked off um and I'm wondering, I'm wondering, I guess, just wanted to maybe check on a few things, uh, sort of my assumption. Um, so I heard that, and, and if I miss anything, you know, apologies. Um, and I actually do have quite a bit of questions here. Um, you know, the program is open to general population, but you do have a, you do have several target demographic and has that kind of come to fruition? Are you, you know, it's almost a year based on the tracking of, you know, service users, are you noticing that that is are you kind of reaching your target population? I'm not sure who to, maybe Christine. Okay, so uh, the journey of this project is that, again, we got awarded that funding off the tail of COVID, which means everything was backlogged. Then we've had issues with, you know, uh, you know, the government on strike, people on strike. So it's been lagged so much. And uh, the, again, another misconception is that getting an, an, an exemption is something that, you know, happens over six months. It's been a long, long time. So as far as um, actually doing drug checking, we've done test strip checking. Um, and Shelby will fill in on what those results have been since we started that. But as far as using an FTIR, we've been waiting on getting those legal requirements, I making see. sure we have the right safety measures in place. Yes, that was the main aim there. I see. So, so, so officially on the testing, any technology wise, how long has it been? Officially, we start about first week of July is where we're aiming, but we cannot test on any technology without an exemption. So gotcha. that has to be in place before we can do anything. Okay. As far as test strips go, people test on their own. We just teach them how to use a test strip, but using an FTIR, we must have an exemption first. I see. So officially hasn't been fully started because you're you needing some of these other pieces to fall in place. But if those pieces were to fall in place, it will start July. Yes, it okay. should be rolling out in July. Yes. And we will have data once it rolls out that we can share after that. Yeah. That's too bad. Would you anticipate the program to be extended because of all the delays then? We've already been extended. We're supposed to end, oh, okay. I think, September. We've been extended to March 2024, and we wow. expect to be extended again after that. Okay. Um, okay, that's that's helpful to know. Um, and then I was wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the role for City of Calgary. Um, I think you have, you know, you have mentioned them. Are they also, because I didn't see them uh, on your advisory committee for the pilot project, but City of Edmonton is. So yes. I'm wondering if you can clarify that. So the city of Edmonton is on there because we do do some work with the city. We had um, another SOA project we were working with the city on and we were handling a public awareness campaign that just concluded recently. We've never done any work directly with the city of Calgary other than being kind of an addition to something that someone else is doing. So that's why they're not on there. I so, see. Yeah, so our whole project is funded by Public Health Canada, so it's a federal project, and the city hasn't 
hadn't shown any interest in it until mm. recently. So now the city's been coming to the table. Um, they've been asking for more information. We're collaborating better with the city because we have other projects that we're working on together. And the approach of using peers is very um, interesting right now. And it's very effective because people with lived experience do know how to approach others who are dealing with similar problems. So we use the peer approach and it's quite effective in um, reaching people who use drugs and who need assistance in that moment to be directed to the right resources. I see. So there, uh, so the city is starting to show show interest, but they're not formally a partner or a funder at this point, right? They're not a funder or a partner on this particular project. No, no. it's a hundred percent from from Health, Health Canada. Canada. Yes, exactly. But what I also heard from you, the call to action for City of Edmonton is for the city to fund. That feels a bit of a disconnect for me. Can you just maybe elaborate? Yes, so I think that what we've noticed is if the city is endorsing um, different avenues to addressing this issue, it experiences more uptake. It's also easier to connect with the city than it is to connect with the federal government. The wait time is shorter, You're, you have your hands in the decision making as opposed to waiting for the government to make that decision. So we would prefer to partner with the city on this. Yeah. I see, okay, I'm out of time. I might just have a couple of outstanding questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Wright. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I'm just, um, where am I looking at here? The, the funding that you, um, that you received to start the project that was through a Health Canada pilot, right? Correct. And that and that's to expand the services across Alberta, or is it just for your pilot program in Calgary? So yeah, so the jurisdiction is Calgary. How for the van and the FTIR? That's what the exemption is for. However, okay. since we are provincial, we are also doing work in other provinces using test strips and wraparound services. Okay. In um, other cities, not provinces, sorry. Okay, other other cities within the province. <laughs> right, okay. Um, and then, so I'm just wondering, is there any other funding available that the, the city could? For the city of Edmonton, we know that the city of Edmonton is looking at um, different approaches to this issue and drug checking is one of those approaches. This is why we wanted to speak directly with the city of Edmonton. The city of Calgary already has it now because we found it federally, so they already well, have it set. Well, right? that's, that's what I was wondering yeah. is, is there any federal funds still available? For this project for Edmonton? Yeah. It hasn't yet been announced, so we don't know if Public Health Canada will announce more funding through SUAP. Um, that's, I think, an announcement that comes somewhere in the fall, but we haven't received any information on that. We do know that because we're already funded by them, we are um, encouraged to apply for an extension on that funding, but we don't know if they'll drop it or not. It depends on the budget. Okay. Um, okay. Keep us up to date, hey? Okay. Okay. Um... <laughs> And then I'm also wondering about, um, oh, what was I wondering about here? Um, the, have you done any work with um, the other groups in Edmonton that did get a little bit of funding there, the, the Queer and Trans Collective and 4B Harm? In so, terms of drug checking? Yes. Shelby, I'll take this one. In terms of drug checking, um, again, we're not drug checking in Edmonton. So we were still doing a lot of peer navigation and outreach work. So now that it's gaining momentum in Edmonton, we can also focus more of our efforts on working with others there. So we are more than open to reaching out and learning and sharing what we're learning as well. I think the advantage that we have is that we're already far ahead in that game right now in Calgary. So we will have knowledge that other groups don't have because they haven't started yet. So we want to be able to share that information and we're open. We're always open to collaborations. Okay. And sort of provide a, a mentorship as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Mentorship, partnership. Um, it's always good to do funded partnerships, I think, because every stakeholder in there is more invested that way. Um, we've done collaborations where it's some aren't receiving funding for it, and we see the interest is lacking and lagging in there. So we are always interested in making sure that every person on that table is compensated because they do use resources to put forward those um, services. And just one other thing in your, your presentation, you talked about the test strips, I think, um, being able to test for, is it benzene and fentanyl? Is it carfentanyl as well? 
Yep. So the test strips, we have fentanyl, benzodiazepine, and xylosine strips. And the fentanyl testing strips, it does include other fentanyl analogs. Um, so I like to think of um, it as a family. So we have our hierarchies, which is fentanyl, and then we branch out into smaller families, which are the analogs as well. So an fentanyl or carfentanyl, sorry, is, is an analog. It is a little tricky with carfentanil because you require so little of carfentanil in the substance that if the dilution of the water is not done correctly, it can produce a false negative. So that is also some information around test strips that does need to be distributed in the community when it comes to test strips. And also same with benzodiazepines. Um, we're very thankful that um, we have been very close with, we work and represent Alberta on the National Drug Checking Working Group. So it's organization across Canada who work together. Um, so they've been sharing all of this information and knowledge with us to make sure that we are um, making sure that the right standards are being done in the community with test strips as well. Okay, and I, and I understand in the past few weeks, there's been a, a bad batch identified in, in Edmonton. What do, do the test strips in that? Um, I, and I don't even know what that, and, yeah, and, and again, too, right, and, and again, too, like, when it comes to drug checking, we have to make sure that our messaging is coming off in the right way as well, too, because right now, Alberta is really catching up to drug checking, so there's been a lot of work around drug checking in other provinces over the last seven years, and so they've had to go through um, situations and learn things as well and pass that on to us as well too. So even saying like a, a bad batch can be very stigmatizing because generally right now our whole toxic, our whole supply is very toxic. And so we're kind of used to this and especially being a frontline worker, like it, it's, it's bad out there. And so we're trying to neutralize the language as well too, and just make sure that we're using, um, you know, it, it's, it's like versus saying clean versus dirty, right? So we just want to make sure that it's a warning or it's an alert, like to be aware. So, and then that's another thing when it comes to messaging around alerts and stuff, it's just making sure that everybody's taking the same stance and, and messaging when it comes to alerts, but yes, um, in Calgary, we did we were able to identify xylazine with a and with a community member. We didn't do the testing, um, and then this substance was also associated with a few over drug poisonings as well that resulted in fatalities. And so I think this is just really important for people to have a true understanding of what exactly is in our supply and having moments of of like this where this news and knowledge is, is transferred and shared within the province of understanding what exactly is out there. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, my time is up. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Any more questions to the speakers? Doesn't appear so. Oh, one more. Okay, Councillor Tang, go ahead. Sorry, thanks so much. Uh, just a couple, couple last ones. Um, What's your status on the exemption? Like d that, does that have to be applied by the city of Calgary? And no, so oh. our, there are two mm. different avenues for exemptions. You can go a provincial avenue or a federal avenue. So we went the federal avenue because our funding is federal funding. Um, so we just use that same process, that same chain pipeline. Um, but the status on it is when they get back to us, they'll get back to us. I but see. we're, we're at the final stage. So we we've been going Please. through and doing everything we're supposed to be doing. Um, and we're com communicating what we're doing with the community. However, we can't sit there and say, yes, we have an exemption because right. that would be false advertising. Yeah. But we are at the final stage of that process. Right. Um, I had a question that I am, and perhaps because of the slow start and and uh, kind of the the double extension you've already gotten. But you know, I, I guess at some point with this grant, you would have an opportunity to present the data and evaluation to determine whether to continue or scale this initiative as per your provincial plan, right? Yes, and we also have a deliverable 
uh, in which we are going to do a whole report on this. So this is part of our community engagement. When we did the open houses, we've done two so far. We're going to do a third one in July. It will be a virtual one. And the idea is to prepare people for what's about to happen. Yeah. Then after that, we do engagements throughout. And then at the end, we'll report our findings to the entire community or anyone else who's interested in learning about what's happening in Calgary around drugs. And and uh, and I you know I think just your advisory board structure allows you to have some direct communication with partners and the city uh, here uh, to kind of share that 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 knowledge as you kind of mentioned earlier. So that's good. Um, and I guess you know my final question is you know I I recognize it's, it's good to have interest um, from from folks from the city of Edmonton here. But from a policy perspective, any thoughts on how critical it is for municipalities to have their own opioid response plan first? Christine, do you mind if I just touch base on this a little bit? Um, so just from a frontline street nurse, I think it's very critical. I've been a part of overdose response teams within the city. I was the health services manager at Tippinawa at ECC, and that those programs were very critical. The amount of overdoses and lives that we've lost due to toxic drugs is so high. Like I've I've lost eight personal loved ones to overdose drug poisonings in my life. So I think in our landscape that we are in, and I don't want to say um, point blank things right now, but I think it's very needed that our city is is intervening and and supporting programs like this just like how you support an overdose response team downtown or you at the libraries i think it is just another tool in our toolbox to s prevent some deaths and i think it's very important right and 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 i think what i was trying to get at is rather than just start deploying funding for programs you know uh, to me if it, it feels also quite critical to have a a bit of a you know a, a strategy or or a plan to say what are the things that you will be rolling out um, before jumping to kind of determining which program. I think that's kind of the question I was trying to get at. Um, but I really appreciate your point there about the urgency. Um, and if I may on the strategy, if that's sure. okay. Yes. So as Shelby said, I mean, people are dying. People are losing loved ones. But when we speak um, to, uh, we had a few city officials show up, some counselors, Beltline counselors showed up to one of our community engagements, as well as police showed up. And we also have constant communication with police. And they're also at their wits end. Mm -hmm. The problem is no one knows how to approach this. And what we've witnessed with AWARE is that you, we need everyone in there. It can't be just AWARE, it can't be just Boyle Street, it can't be just the city. We all need to be at that table. This is where the problem lies. So if the city collects data, but we're not sharing it with you, or you're not getting us involved, you're not collecting the right data. Everyone needs to be at that table. So we all need to bring whatever resources we have, whether it's um, information or expertise or funding, we all need to sit there and figure out what every single person or every single organization is going to bring to that table to make this a successful use of public funds. Yeah, that's a really important point about that collective approach. Thank you so much. This was really informative. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Paquette, you're right on the cusp of the break time. Okay, so, I can wait. How about if we? How about if you? Um, your are your questions to the speakers? They are too. Speakers. Okay, so how about if you go ahead and then we'll just delay oh. our break a little bit. Okay, uh, do we have a demographic breakdown of uh, who is most affected here? As far as who's most affected by the drug poisonings? Mm -hmm. So our biggest demographics are men's in, men in trades, and then we also have BIPOC and Indigenous folks. Um, who are, again, aged between 18 and 65. The older you get, of course, the lower that number gets, but we do have a lot of youth who are affected by this issue. So when I say men in trades, they tend to be, again, 18 to 35. Um, they, they have seemed to be our highest rising demographic in terms of poisonings and deaths due to poisonings, which is something that um, was alarming for most people. And is the majority of that um, fentanyl related or...? I am not at liberty to say. Depends on the data. Maybe Shelby okay. has information. Yes. So um, Alberta does collect um, poly uh, different types of substance um, passings as well. So you can break down that information. The only thing that I do want to note about that is that when you pass away 
from an accidental substance poisoning, they will account for every substance that is in your toxicology report. Okay. So they can't specify exactly like, yes, it was. This. It was they this, will... it was the cause. There was just all of these things in the system. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and uh, Alberta's deaths, um, I'm assuming that uh, if you if you did a graph of drug deaths, you'd have ups and downs depending on seasons and things like that. But where's the trend line going? I'm just I was muted, sorry. So we saw during COVID that we spiked up and then we kind of came down just a little bit though. The data is not a significant and drop to you know contribute that to COVID. Whereas you can see the incline happening again too. So I I encourage to to please look at the data out there because it is alarming and this isn't something that's going to calm down. The more the more, and we've seen this in the manufacturing side of substances as well too is and you know since the 70s we've gone from heroin, opium to heroin to fentanyl to carfentanil and so and now benzo does that benzo so pe people are just going to get more creative sorry that's the shorter story of what i'm trying to say yeah, yeah. no of course and, and um of, oh go ahead yes as in say in terms of of data like like shelby said there was a peak during covid because people had no way to access services so they kind of went into recluse recluded and used there and it was much riskier if you use alone um, and then um, speaking again to the police they've also seen and emergency services there's a sharp incline in responses so I wouldn't even say that it's that people are using more or less or anything but it's more the fatalities that we need to be worried about and the, the poisonings because like she said everything is a bad batch now even the police said it everything is bad because you don't know which is bad everything is just potentially a poisoning that's where the alarm is coming from if people aren't getting poisoned it's whatever but people are actually having yeah and we're talking about hundreds yeah. of people per quarter yeah okay so which is horrifying uh so there will be people who say well listen you're making it easier for people to to do drugs when you're testing for it you're making it easier if there's supervised consumption sites why are you making it so easy for people to do drugs and, and make it easy for them to ruin their lives? Shouldn't we just stop all of that and then suddenly drug use will stop? So as a experienced harm reduction nurse, that is honestly one of my favorite questions to get to people because it comes down to ideology. So when we talk about abstinence-based programs, a majority of the time they fail. People cannot go into an abstinence-based program and be accepted to see substance use, especially if they're physically dependent on it. So the point of harm reduction and recovery and treatment is that we work together on that and support this person throughout whatever journey they may be on. And when it comes to drug checking, we're a safe space where if you are on that recovery journey, then you can come to our space. Let us know that so that we can make sure to have the appropriate conversations and education to that person because a lot of things people miss is when somebody is in in, re in that recovery their rate and percentage for having a, a drug poisoning skyrockets because your tolerance has come down you're not used to what you were consuming before and then there's the shame and stigma aspect as well so they don't want to talk about that and then also nobody acknowledges that when you're in treatment or you're going through your um, journey that you're addressing a lot of things that you are repressing and it it takes a lot of work and therefore people are going to use again and so we need to make room for that and have those conversations to prevent somebody who may be recovering and they need they decided to access so that they can do it safely i i hope that makes sense um so i always like to rebuttal that you, you know it, I, i'm it sorry i'm sorry we're out yeah. of time out <laughs> i'm of sorry time. about that i love rambling i'm sorry <laughs> no that's okay you're very passionate that's great Thank uh you. so uh that is it i think for uh questions to the speakers we are going to go on our lunch break right now lunch no 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 we had lunch we had lunch we're just having an afternoon break so we'll be back in 15 minutes so that's at 3 49. thank you
It is 3.49. We will get back to our meeting. I just want to confirm quorum. I am here. Councillor Rice is here. Here. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councillor Paquette. Well, we have quorum, so let's continue on. Any questions to administration? Councillor Rice. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> uh, but my question is very quick. Um, just based on the uh, report here, um, majority of stakeholders were not supporting uh, of the city president director role um, in that. And what is specific reason? Um, thank you for your question, Councillor Rice. I would say that the specific reason behind folks not seeing a direct role in operations for the city is that uh, there are more trusting relationships already existing with community agencies and outreach groups, and that was deemed to be more of an appropriate role for them and who they would feel more comfortable with in accessing those services. That's, that's very good. Thank you. And then my next question. Uh, so administration still currently still working on um, uh, conducting more engagement uh, with the key, st key stakeholders, develop some like broad recommendations, right, to reduce uh, drug poison, injuries, and deaths. And in, in the item uh, do you have sense what the, what 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 does the broader recommendation will cover? What's the scope for that? Thank you for the question. I think we're seeing uh, a lot of thoughts on all different angles. Uh, so we've been really mindful to engage with folks, uh, whether it's academics, uh, folks within institutions, folks on the ground. Uh, and so there are a lot of different ideas. Uh, those range from data, engagement, awareness, um, advocating for social infrastructure within the city. Um, there's quite a lot of ideas uh, that we're hearing come together. Okay. so. Chair Principi, and then I'm going to put this received as information uh, on the floor. So if that's the time. Yes, that's great. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Yeah. And no more questions? No Any more questions. questions. Okay. That's all. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So we have the motion on the floor. Uh, Councillor Rutherford, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. And, um, I guess just one of the things that I want clarity on is in the report, you know, there's opportunities for municipal partnership in drug checking services, you know, providing resources, which comes with a budgetary impact. And then, you know, assuming a supporting role, uh, it mentions that that doesn't require budgetary resources. So I guess one thing that was kind of lacking or that I didn't see in this report is if this is received for information, what next? What happens with this information next? Can you can you clarify that for me? Thank you for the question, Councillor Rutherford. Uh, as we noted, uh, there are still a number of conversations undergoing about uh, reducing drug poisonings and deaths in Edmonton. And so I think that uh, as we continue some of these engagements, sorting out what we've heard through this report, uh, we've learned a lot, and making sure that we integrate that with all of the other um, ideas that we're hearing around how uh, City of Edmonton can help and bringing that forward into some opportunities for what those spaces could look like uh, within the scope of a sort of whole of system response. I, I guess, uh, I guess to, to put it bluntly, like I know that it also mentions that there's a report, you know, in the executive summary, it mentions the report coming forward uh, scheduled for September, 2023. Uh, will drug checking be a part of that with those broader recommendations? Will it be considered within that report? Yes, absolutely. Okay, those are all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Paquette, are you on to ask questions of administration? I am. Oh, please if go ahead. Okay. Yes, please go ahead. At your pleasure. 
Okay, thank you. Um, and, and thank you for the report. Um, I think what we heard is that um, we need a whole suite of approaches. And I guess um, if we have to go into private for this, let me know. But um, are we uh, making progress with the provincial government on uh, being able to incorporate a number of viewpoints and approaches in a way that will lead us all toward the goals we want to see, the outcomes we want to see? Um, is there that sort of collaboration that's that's beginning? Uh, thank you for the question. As you know, uh, due to the election, things have been quite quiet on the provincial side, as is required around an election. Uh, but we have been having uh, significant conversations uh, ongoing outside of that period with the provincial government, as well those uh, who have been informing some of uh, their view of the world and how they think that uh, we may be able to make progress in this space. Uh, so those engagements uh, have been continuous and will continue between now and when we come forward in September. Uh, and in addition to the provincial government, uh, this is likely to have um, uh, activity for the federal government as well. We heard about the SUAP grants uh, that have uh, their own funding allocated uh, for coming up this year. So with any luck, uh, when we get towards September, we might have a little bit more information on what those look like as well and how that might fit into uh, some of the opportunities here. Okay. And... Uh from our work with uh, other orders of government, is it understood by other orders of government that at a municipal level, uh, we embrace all potential solutions that we do not preclude any, and that we're willing to uh, work with all viewpoints in order to uh, reach a, a safer situation for all? Certainly, we've approached all of our engagements from a place of openness, uh, recognizing that uh, every individual that we speak to has their own uh, manner of knowledge, their own manner of experience that they're bringing, uh, and we are very open to hearing all of those ideas and considering those. Uh, if that will help us uh, create a city where we have fewer who are impacted by drug poisonings and deaths. Okay, and, and just to be very blunt about it, I've heard that there is this impression that uh, from uh, the city level, we are only interested in one type of approach, uh, which obviously is not true, but for some reason that seems to be the impression. Do you feel that uh, it does it look like maybe that um, assumption is starting to sort of get dispelled? That's certainly not the flavor of the conversations that I've been having through the engagements. That's really encouraging. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Tang. Great, thank you very much, and thank you to the team who put this uh, report together. Um, uh, you know, it's it's not an easy topic, and I've been hearing quite positive response from the community about how they've been engaged, so really want to commend you on that. Um, I'm, I'm curious about the SUAP grants, the two pilot projects that were in Edmonton, it's done. Do you have any evaluation about how those two went? Thank you for your question, Councillor Ting. Uh, we don't currently have any report back on the evaluation. Like you mentioned, the pilot project is complete now, uh, but we will we will be in a position to bring forward evaluation over the coming weeks. And and it sounds like there are other conversations with stakeholders beyond those two particular organizations um, around kind of various strategies, or, or I guess actually not strategies, uh, tactics on the ground um, for harm reduction and uh, prevention and 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 opioid overdose. Um, so we, those conversations are still ongoing. There's no quite a resolution yet, right, that we'll hear more about in September as well? Yes, we will include that in our report back in September as well. Yeah, um, I also really appreciate the jurisdictional scan on this, uh, but if, and it feels, you know, there's quite a bit of a variety of how municipalities, municipalities interact with this particular, um, the drug checking approach and how they interact with their provincial government and of course the federal government. Um, and then just even from the speaker's presentation, I thought it was really enlightening to clarify the city of Calgary's role. Um, is there other instances in the, in the province that 
um, I know they're in the report, but I just wonder if you can highlight that a little bit. Uh, for example, what is Banff doing? What is Regina doing? Um, I saw Toronto does their own, but they also have the authority to for public health, which we don't. Thank you, Councillor King. So as is mentioned in the report, Banff has been piloting uh, distributing test strips. So that is something that we are in communication with them to see how it's going. And we will be following up on any evaluation. We have also made contact with a couple other municipalities to hear about their different pilot projects, any related evaluation. Uh, we are currently working to um, stay in touch with Regina uh, to understand the work that's taking place there and any lessons that we can learn from them. But they're not, no one is, so in Banff is the town of Banff or like partner organizations in Banff? It's the Banff Library that took that initiative. Right. Um, so you are correct that uh, the role that municipalities have been playing uh, has not been to lead, but yeah. be to just be supportive or silent. And you are correct in making the, uh, the note that Toronto and other Ontario municipalities um, have a different um, jurisdiction when it comes to health than we do here in Alberta. Um, yeah, I think that's a really important point that we'll, you know, we'll always keep in mind. And I know that there's direct federal support, but I also, in some ways, I, I also wonder how this, you know, we, we do hear the government say a lot that harm reduction is very much part of the recovery oriented spectrum. Uh, you know, it, um, I'll be curious, you know, when that report comes back in September, some commentary around that piece, um, uh, that alignment piece. And um, I guess finally, just in terms of, you know, what are you hearing right now in the community in terms of their, uh, in Edmonton, their capacity to, to do this work on the ground, to expand their work, um, yeah, to, to come, to take this on? I think we're certainly hearing that there is interest. Uh, of course, like any of these services and in these complex spaces, there's also constraints. And so you heard from some of your speakers today, uh, there is significant funding that's required to do this and to do this well and to make that available. And in addition to that, there's, there's simply time and resources required to, for example, get things like exemptions, get through, that doesn't happen overnight. Uh, certainly we're seeing across the social services uh, sector, there's constraints on resources overall and maintaining resources to do this kind of work. And so I think that uh, it would be, we do well uh, to acknowledge that uh, even when there is desire to do it, that doesn't mean that it's easy. Uh, and should there be interest in community pursuing this, uh, it still could take some time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Those are, those are all my questions. And, um, and I think there's really strong tie-in for that report later on. So again, appreciate this information now and uh, the thorough research. Thank you, Councillor Tang. And any more questions to administration? All right, anyone to speak to the motion on the floor? No one, oh, Councillor Rutherford, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, the pause came because this is probably one of the hardest things for me to speak to. Um, you know, reading the report, the, the numbers are, are staggering as our speakers spoke to and, and they're not getting better. And I don't want the receipt for information to be received as a lack of caring or that we don't want to do more. I do recognize the need to do it right and to do it alongside community and within the context of the broader um, conversation. So I was re really reassured today to hear that, you know, this isn't the end of this discussion, but more of a, a continuation of the discussion as a bigger piece of a puzzle uh, in, in September. So um, while there's a sense of urgency I feel like two months, three months is justifiable to make sure that we're really seeing what, what is possible. I do think that, you know, whatever comes out of that conversation in September, that drug, drug testing should, 
and must have a role. Um, we're dealing with drug poisoning. You know, a lot of people still use the term addicts, but I have a, I have two young children and the reality is, is they make one wrong move when they're teenagers and they try something that's toxic and it can be fatal. This isn't, this can affect anybody in anybody's home in any, across any demographic. And as a society, like we need to start to do everything under our arsenal. I'm to curb these deaths. These are real people. These are real lives. And that, you know, that number 700, and that's just from 2022, it's higher in 2023, are real people with real families, with real lives. And that's just in the Edmonton region. Sorry, I'm sorry. So while I'm not on committee, I support the receipt for information, knowing it's a part of a bigger conversation, um, but one that I'm confident that my colleagues, when this does come back, will hear from administration and put any tools that we have in our capacity to use to address this issue. I have utmost confidence uh, in my council colleagues for that across the entire spectrum of care. And I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss for words because this, this really is something that, um, I wish we as a society weren't so desensitized to at this point, but I feel like we are getting desensitized to it. So, so with that, I appreciate all the work admin is doing. I appreciate the staff that we've funded to, to, to do start to do this work. I appreciate the complexity and the context in which they're working. And I have the utmost faith that if we continue to have honest conversations like this, if we continue to raise this issue, if we continue to advocate, that change will come. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Any other uh, comments? Any Councillor Rice to close? No? Okay, please vote. We have four votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. Thank you, everyone. Next, we are moving on to item 7.5. And we have the same delegation. Yeah? Close. Close. <laughs> <laughs> All right, whenever you're ready, please go ahead. Great, thank you. The information report before you today provides an overview of the multidisciplinary and outreach programming in Edmonton that support people sleeping rough as well as those who engage in high-risk behaviors and or experience crises in public. This report will provide programmatic information, funding arrangements, geographic coverage, and key challenges experienced by outreach teams. In advance of the report, administration engaged 17 agencies with funded outreach programs and three unfunded mutual aid groups. No decision is required at this time. I'll now turn it over to Stacy Galatly, Branch Manager for Social Development, to walk you through this presentation. Thank you. Before we look at existing outreach programming in Edmonton, it's important to note that the ecosystems are complex and can be viewed and analyzed in a variety of different ways. Administration has analyzed the ecosystem as a whole, and from these learnings, we have chosen a few ways of understanding to highlight but these aren't the only ways. And we would like to acknowledge this nuanced and evolving ecosystem. During our research, engagement, and analysis, three basic types of outreach were identified. Proactive, targeted, and hybrid. Proactive outreach helps ensure that vulnerable people 
have access to the necessities of life, such as food and clothing, and a means to stay safe as, as safe as possible when they're experiencing a crisis or an emergency, whether that be mental health or otherwise, or perhaps when they're engaging in high-risk activities, such as using drugs or sex work. They tend to support groups of people quickly with only limited capacity for individualized follow-up. On the other hand, targeted outreach workers engage more intensively with a caseload of people who are referred to them for system navigation. It focuses on offering case management similar to what is offered on site at social service agencies to those who cannot access such agencies. Outreach programs can also engage in both pro proactive and targeted outreach. This is hybrid outreach. Hybrid outreach teams assertively canvas a geographical area to help meet the immediate needs while also accepting interested individuals onto a caseload for more intensive system navigation. Next slide, please. The outreach system in Edmonton is varied and complex. Of the 17 funded outreach organizations that administration consult with uh, with operate 23 programs with 165 total outreach FTEs and 13 unique funders. These numbers are bolstered by the three mutual aid groups, one of which reported having over 100 volunteers. Not only that, but these numbers are changing every day as the ecosystem evolves. While each outreach program in Edmonton is involved with one of the three outreach types detailed in the previous slide, whether it be proactive, targeted, or hybrid, they can be further grouped into one of the five categories shown here. Outreach worker involved in system response are generally helping to address larger systemic issues that impact the entire city, such as encampment, transit safety, or public disorder. Location-based teams are typically stationed at locations that are frequented by vulnerable people but lack the resources to respond to them in appropriate uh, manner, such as shopping malls or a library. The housing category involves housing first teams, which include housing outreach workers who can help vulnerable people secure appropriate housing and follow-up support workers who help them to maintain it. The health category has the most programs, many of which are oriented around safer drug use and overdose prevention and response. This category has experienced recent expansion due to the impacts of drug poisoning, which we talked about earlier today, and, those, uh, and also includes mental health and drug recovery oriented teams. Basic needs and connections programs, on the other hand, are focused on ensuring people have the necessities of life and or liaising with businesses and or other stakeholders. Next slide, please. The chart you see has broken down these programs by category, funder, and the number of outreach FTEs. Roughly three quarters of the FTEs in the ecosystem are devoted to the system response and health categories. There's a good number of location-based teams, but they have very few FTEs, and most are funded internally or through grants. In general, small programs like these were created by agencies to respond to urgent, localized needs, and it is more common for them to be unconnected to the larger effort or response. These FTEs were accurate as of February 2023, the time administration's consultations happened with the outreach providers. And already, as I noted, much has changed. FTE counts are different, some of the programs have amalgamated, and in some cases, new funders are involved. This is indicative of the standard rate of change in the outreach ecosystem and is a factor to consider in broad coordination efforts. In terms of organizations that directly fund outreach FTEs, there are currently six primary funders of outreach programs in Edmonton that collectively account for 16 of the 23 programs and 150 of the 165 FTEs in the outreach ecosystem. Of the six primary funders, the City of Edmonton is the top funder, with funding contracts for a total of 42 FTEs across six programs. The City of Edmonton also contributes overarching funding to Reach Edmonton, Edmonton Public Library, and the Edmonton Police Service, while the Government of Alberta contrib contributes overarching funding to AHS and Homer Trust. The other seven outreach programs are either funded internally or through grants. Funding sustainability is a consideration and a concern for many agencies as 12 out of the 23 funded programs are considered temporary and nine of these 12 teams acknowledged feeling uncertain about funding renewal. 
The eight largest outreach programs operate citywide and account for roughly 70% of the FTEs in the ecosystem. Street outreach is responsible for locating and responding to encampments across Edmonton, and COT operates within the entirety of the transit system. Crisis diversion responds to 211 calls to transport vulnerable people to safety and help supports frontline police officers with social disorder calls. Two teams are housing and the other two are oriented around mental health. Nine other funded teams primarily work downtown. Four safe drugs and overdose teams, one addiction support program, one encampment team, and one housing program, along with the outreach teams at the Edmonton Public Library and the City Centre Mall. These nine programs account for 33 FTEs out of the total 165. Three mutual aid groups that spoke with administration also devote the majority of their time to vulnerable people downtown. Three additional teams follow established geographical routes to better serve their particular participants, and one engages business improvement areas in and around the downtown. One team operates in, operates in Old Strathcona, while the University of Alberta program focuses on the main campus and attends to other properties owned by the university as needed. Like many social services, outreach programs are struggling to properly support people experiencing homelessness. The number of people on Homeward Trust by Names list that are unsheltered and more likely to be outreach participants has grown from 426 in March 2020 to 716 as of June 1st, 2023. In addition, outreach participants do not consistently check in at drop-ins and shelters and are subject to pronounced transiency. Being able to locate a participant is of critical importance because the system navigation is based on the timing and sequence of resource provision. This issue is exacerbated because there are challenges with the information sharing due to numerous outreach teams using unique software to collect data and sensitivity around confidentiality and privacy. Perhaps most challenging of all, most teams have no control or direct access to the resources their participants need and have to engage with other service providers to access them. Complex intakes processes and long wait times discourage outreach participants, many of whom are focused on survival and or suspicious of formalized systems. During administration's engagement efforts, we invited organizations involved in the outreach ecosystem to provide feedback about their outreach work. In total, 17 of the 20 invited agencies we funded uh, with funded outreach programs took part as well as three of the six mutual aid groups. The results of the engagement work, including key themes, is detailed in the Community Insights section of the report. During these communications, conversations, the need for administration to definitively establish the municipality's role in outreach work was general, uh, in general was made apparent to us. The role will require further research, including a jurisdictional review, to determine how to best aid the, munis uh, the multidisciplinary outreach ecosystem in Edmonton. That's a long-term goal, but in the meantime, administration has identified six potential areas for the near-term focus. Firstly, an outreach database. Secondly, an outreach hub. Three, direct pathways to provide immediate resources to participants. Four, geographical division of labor. Five, utilizing the Healthy Streets Operations Center. Six, improved performance measurement. Further details on all of these potential options are within the report, but I'd be happy to share any further details here if requested. And that concludes our presentation. We'll be happy to take any questions that you might have. Wonderful, thank you very much for the presentation. Next, we will go to our speaker, who I believe I saw her online, Felicia Ricard. Hello, hi there. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. You have five minutes, please go ahead. Absolutely. Thank you all for having me today. I apologize. I'm joining from my car, but such is the life of an outreach worker sometimes. Um, so my name is Felicia Ricard and I'm the street program coordinator with Creating Hope Society. We aim to support to vulnerable Edmontonians um, who are struggling with the complexities of mental health, addictions and houselessness who come to our door. Um, or in my case, oftentimes who come to my car window or are on our city streets and appear to be struggling. They call us outreach workers, and an out outreach worker is defined as a person who does work designed to help and encourage disadvantaged members of the community, 
but how do we do that? We meet people where they are, both physically and in their own unique journey. We load up our personal vehicles, our backpacks, and our wagons with supplies, and we get to work. We canvas areas where many won't dare to go, and we build relationships with vulnerable individuals who have been so let down by systems that they have no reason to trust us. But we're lucky, because we're armed with food and water, clothing and basic needs supplies that so many of us take for granted, yet are such a luxury item to our vulnerable people. We work tirelessly to build relationships and trust, and we become advocates for those who are tired. Tired of telling their story to yet another worker because funding for the last program they were involved in was cut, or their worker doesn't work in the field anymore because being an outreach worker will take more from you than it will ever give. Tired of being let down by systems that weren't designed to see them succeed. Tired of reliving their trauma every single day. Tired of being wet and cold. Tired of being ridiculed and told to get a job. Tired. We become food banks and referral centers, safety nets and last hopes. We become a voice for those who have lost their voice on their journey and we walk beside them, picking them up at every speed bump along the way. Until one day their camp gets moved by bylaw and police and they've been forced to pack up the little that they own and value and find another place to call their temporary home. They get cast aside with the promise of being forgotten, made to feel like a nuisance when, re when in reality they are just trying to survive. But it's easier to push them into river valleys than admit that our systems aren't working and we have a growing problem in our city. All the work we've done goes down the drain because the systems that are supposed to be there to help them don't understand the true complexities of life that people are forced to live. We keep people alive and do our best to help them hold on to every ounce of dignity that they have left. We work endless hours and long shifts. There is no nine to five for an outreach worker. And unfortunately, many of the services that we need to refer to to help support someone are closed when we need them the most. We become a light in the dark and we work endlessly to ensure we don't let someone else down. And we do it all with our whole heart. Outreach is not for the faint of heart. I've pulled people from bus stops to reverse their drug poisoning and done CPR on more street corners than I would ever like to admit while public drives by without a second glance and pretends that it's not happening. I've heard stories that'll stay with me for the rest of my life and seen struggles that no one should ever have to face. And I've witnessed candlelight vigils being held amongst tents community members and families mourning the loss of their friend, their son, their daughter, their mother, or their father. I have bandaged both physical and emotional wounds and just prayed that even for a second, I can help the bleeding stop for someone. But through this work, I've also been blessed to meet some of the most beautiful souls and to hear stories of resilience and to see people find their worth again. And I do this work day in and day out with no relief in sight and ever encroaching deadlines of funding running out. Programs like mine have no funding security. We have no job security. We work tirelessly because it's where our heart is, yet we struggle to try to make ends meet ourselves. We take pay cuts to keep doors open and staff employed, and yet we show up every day and try to make the world a little brighter and create hope for as many people as we can, but we get tired too. Programs need long-term sustainable funding and support from city officials and government. We can't take this all on by ourselves. My team consists of me and one part-time worker who works about 10 to 15 hours per week. We're out doing the work and are often the first to come across a crisis or an emergency, yet we're not paid like first responders or emergency services because we work off of temporary grants and small pockets of money that we have to take our time that we could be supporting clients to write pages and pages of information for just to be considered. I urge you to take this report seriously and to hear our voices in this report because people's lives depend on you to make changes in our city. Regardless of circumstance, every name on the by names list, every tent in our city streets, they're human beings and they deserve so much more than we can currently provide them with. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Felicia. Uh, I will ask my colleagues to sign up to ask questions of the speaker. Are there any committee members that have questions? It doesn't look like it. Go ahead, Councillor Tang. Great, thank you so much, Felicia, and for your patience of um, waiting all day to to speak. That was really important. Um, I'm I'm curious about how how long Street has been around, how long you've been around with Street. 
So I've been doing this work for since 2015 um, in a little bit of a different capacity. So initially I was with the SNUG program through another agency. Unfortunately, that program got cut in 2020 um, and it took just over a year for me to be able to find a small chunk of funding um, to be able to start the street program. And it's been running now for, we'll hit two years in July that we've been running as the street program. But you've been really kind of involved at the front line um, in, in this outreach type of work for quite some time. And you know, in this report, it also outlines the landscape that there's so many players, there have been new programs that have emerged. I'm curious from your perspective, what kind of um, improvements you've seen um, and, and street focuses on a very particular uh, group of people in the, in the sex trade, is that right? We, we are heavily focused on the sex trade, um, but it's not the only work that we do. We will, I mean, when we're out and we're doing our outreach, we are helping anybody that we come across, whether they're involved in the sex trade or not. Many of our folks are living in encampments, are sleeping rough, um, and are you know involved in many different complexities of that inner city um, demographic and that that life um, that they're living to try to survive, right? Yes. Um, so, so we yeah we help everybody that's on the street really. So I'm curious because there's a, a, a number of teams in this report that I mentioned that also supports a lot of the people you just mentioned. How have you found working, you know, intersecting with those teams? Have you found um, any improvement in, in this kind of um, coordination space? Um, what are some best practices that, that you've experienced? Um, you know, we, we meet, I think it's quarterly, if I can recall, um, with multiple different outreach teams, and we have an opportunity to sit and talk about the trends that we're seeing and different things that are going on um, and what we're doing in our work. Um, so that's been something that's completely new to me and the work um, since I started Street. Um, and it's been really phenomenal to be involved in that because it is a great opportunity to be able to, you know, see what everybody else is doing, what services we're duplicating, how we can kind of streamline things a little bit more. Um, but being a really small program and just having myself and my one part-time um, staff member, it is very hard to coordinate services um, because and because we are a relatively like we've been around for two years but that's still considered pretty relatively new and we're still you know working on getting our name out there and and doing all of these things that um, a lot of people still don't necessarily know that we're out except for the community members right so it's been a lot of really networking and making sure that people know that, you know, we're around and we're here to help as much as we possibly can. Yeah, but given how small you are, you're sometimes you're you're just focusing on just helping people and that's kind of where a lot of your time goes, I I bet. Um, yeah, and and so if if there is you know, one or two things that you think could help you because I've, I've, I've heard you talk about permanent you know you know contracts or that that security that's one area can you maybe highlight you know is there any anything else I guess beyond funding um, that you think would be beneficial I think really having you know the report talks about um, an outreach database um, and being able to have access to that information and be able to have that information sharing between organizations um, would be incredibly helpful because, you know, sometimes we're seeing somebody and we're working with them and because of the, the complexities of the lifestyle, they may fall off with us for, you know, a month or two months, but somebody else may have seen them in the process, right? So being able to have that communication and be able to connect with people and other organizations to really, you know, have That's that continuity of service and be able to interact with each other great. would be really helpful. That's awesome. Thank you so much. That's all. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Wright. Hi, thanks very much, Felicia. Um, 
You had mentioned the by names list, and I was just wondering, yeah, if you had access to that, or and if there was a, if that was a database that you could connect. But um, thank you for answering that. Yeah. Obviously not. Um, no. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm just wondering, um, what about? So we've got the the Healthy Streets Operations Center up and running now. There's a physical space for them. Um, is there any connection that you have uh, with people on those teams? I don't, unfortunately. No. Yeah. Is there is that something you you'd like to have more connection with or? Absolutely. I, I mean, I'm open to any connections that I can possibly have to to better serve the people that I work with. Right. Um, like I said, being such a small team, it's so much of my work has to be focused on supporting the individuals and not letting them down and not being another service that, you know, pulls the rug out from under them that um, doing all of that extra stuff you know, is really hard sometimes because I'm at capacity, you know, and that's, that's really hard. Okay. And having that database, cause you, you'd mentioned that you don't have access to the services that people need at the time that you need them. So having a database um, where you could make those connections for the daytime when those services are available to be able to reconnect back with the individuals. Yeah, it yeah. would be, it would be incredibly helpful. Okay. You know, when people get moved through the city and not knowing where they are anymore, but somebody at another organization has contact with them, it makes it a lot easier to be able to get there and, you know, know at least what area they're in now versus just trying to drive around and hope for the best that you find them. Okay. Or if you know they've made an application for housing or something and then somebody connects with them later and lets them know more information is needed for their application. Something Absolutely. like that would help. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then I'm just wondering about there, there are there are so many um, agencies and services in that. Would you see maybe consolidation of some of those services as an option? I think it would definitely be something to to look at. Um, I know that for us because we we do deal with such a um, unique population primarily mm -hmm. you know nobody else is out on the street specifically helping people involved in the sex trade um, you know so that that is something that is a big focus for the street team but like I said that's not all that we do so looking at those partnerships and stuff is something that we've been trying to do and seeing we never want to duplicate services right um, it just creates way more work for us. Um, so just being able to, you know, figure out what everybody is doing and how we can best support each other would be phenomenal. Okay. And do you have the opportunity or maybe the capacity to, to do data collection, um, sort of showing what some of the positive outcomes of your work has achieved? Yeah, absolutely. I, I collect as much data as possible physically possible um, you know it's really hard with reporting and collecting data and stuff with this work because it is so primarily relationship based um, so every every measure every statistic that I can possibly collect I, I, I do my best to collect those because I need them for my reports so um, yeah I, as much as possible I am always collecting that information well, and building those relationships, I think, is a, a definite positive outcome because where yeah. others can't. So, and and thank you for for your many years of being able to to stay in this role. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you, thank Councillor you. Wright, uh, and thank you to our speaker. It doesn't look like we have any more questions to the speaker, so I will ask my colleagues to sign up to ask questions of administration. Councillor Rice, go ahead. Um, I would like to start, thank you for this report. Uh, lots of work involved, I really appreciate. Um, first question, just a high level, how we are going to use this information? 
Um, thanks for the question, Councillor Rice. So the report was generated in response to a motion made previously by committee uh, asking for more information. Um, so that's primarily the function of the report. However, obviously the learnings are super useful from a, pers from a systems um, perspective. And so the information in this report will also inform our corporate homelessness plan going forward. So considering what might be included in that. And then also will um, be used in the community plan to end homelessness as well. So the work around this I think is particularly relevant to both of those major sort of strategic undertakings that we're engaged in right now as well. Uh, thank you. And in terms of program FTs, because I, I did say two type of FTs. One is program FTs, one is geographic, geographic coverage. Um, does this mean this is entire uh, Edmonton region or is this just for the Edmonton center, inner center area only? And for the programs, we have six agencies collaboratively work together. That is our primary funders. And then the FTs right now adds up based on the charge you provided here is 165. That's, does that mean that is only FTs and in this industry area we're doing the work? Yes, that, that represents the FTEs citywide working on outreach for people experiencing homelessness. But including all the uh, agencies, right? It, this include, well, this only includes the FTEs uh, that are specifically engaged in outreach, so they're mobile going Mobile to, and in the different organizations. That's correct, across all those organizations. And also for the uh, geographic coverage, FTEs only and content only represent the people who actually work on the outreach piece, but not including every FTEs. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So, I really appreciate this information, but I'm still trying to figure out what this information could be used, what is our next steps. And because right now this type of conversation come back every year and over and over. And then the outcome and our Edmontonians still feel like there is not there yet. So what is the information really we can use and to really achieve that outcome. I think the uh, Edmontonians looking forward to say not only about the information, is about what real change we made, well, real difference we made through all these programs, services we provided. And then to help people who actually really need help and also and for our entire society. And I think that's Right now, I'm still a little bit struggling here, and maybe you can clarify, provide more information on it. For sure, I think that creating clarity is always the first step, and I think that we have done an exceptional job of just mapping this really complex landscape. And then once we know where we are, you can know where the gaps are, and I think mm -hmm. that's also a really important feature. And when we heard from the stakeholders that we, that we consulted, uh, the idea of data you know, we knew in our hearts, yeah, data is important, but boy, when you hear it from so many voices, that really gives us a call to action, just the sharing of data, uh, and just working harder to coordinate. So there were some themes that emerged that I'm not sure we would have heard as loudly had we not done this work. Uh, I like that uh, concept of mapping, and that, that mapping actually really provided that strategic, strategic direction for us, how we move forward. Uh, I just wondering, and because uh, as a city, we're dealing with, uh, including many organizations, we're dealing with the same, it's the same issue, same demanding uh, for the services for so many years now. So we still, does that mean we still don't have the systematic uh, approach and or in place and including mapping, even if it's fundamental uh, piece and then really give us the idea of what we need to move forward. So that piece is still not done yet? I think that piece is always a work in progress. And I think that through this work, we can better identify where some of those lags in the system are. You know, for some, for example, like getting on the list to get your ID and knowing that might take however much time. Like all those different pieces in that pathing yeah. to get to housing, for example. Um, this work is really illuminating where those gaps are, where we can tighten things up, where the coordination amongst orders of government can be done. I think those are some of the opportunities that require further exploration. Uh, 
Uh, I like that, but I also looking forward for the integration integration of policy level, program level, and the service provider level, and then. Because if we don't have that integration piece inside, we come back over and over and discuss the same issue just from different angle. So, but it seems to never get to that point and really resolve this problem. So that's just some comments I want to put there. Thank okay. you, Councillor Rice. I took myself off the list because Councillor Rice covered my questions. I would just ask my colleagues, we only have 20 minutes left, so let's try to keep our questions succinct and not repeat. Uh, question. So go ahead, Councillor Stevenson. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, just want to say thank you for the really outstanding report. It, you know, provided all the information I think we need to make good decisions and provide some really nuanced reflections on on the challenges. Um, just a clarification. So, so the funding that we use to fund um, the outreach programs is that ongoing funding in our city budget? It's a mix. So some programs have ongoing funding. For example, uh, Boyle Street's Street Outreach um, has ongoing funding that for encampment outreach, uh, but others are a mix of one time. Um, so an example of that would be uh, like the street out the street works overdose prevention funding that's provided primarily from ETS and downtown vibrancies budgets. Those are one time funding commitments. Okay, so is there an opportunity when we have an ongoing funding source to reflect that in our service contract with providers so that they have, have some contract certainty, even if the contracts are structured so that service can continue to evolve? Where, yes, where we have dedicated on, um, ongoing funding for outreach, there, those contracts are multi-year. Okay, okay, well, that's, that's great, great to hear. And so really it comes down to us um, when we're looking maybe at our corporate homelessness strategy, really reflecting on that need for, for ongoing funding, is that a potential recommendation that may come forward? Yeah, yes, like in the context of the corporate homelessness plan, we'll be showing where the city is currently investing and any recommendations will also um, include, you know, we'll, we'll highlight where there are funding gaps that are, are a misalignment between expectations in terms of what's recommended for our overall approach and what we would need to invest to be able to deliver on it. Great. Did have I really gone through four minutes already? Sorry. Um, I don't believe we, you have. Okay. <laughs> um, please, please stop me uh, uh, at the right time. Um, you know, I really appreciate the the point about ensuring that uh, you know different activities in the same space don't create a self defeating dynamic, and that to me really reinforced uh, the need for agencies to be involved at decision-making table for high-risk encampments. So wondering what the update and status is on, on that work. Um, so we are continuing to build out the governance model around encampment, the encampments work generally uh, through the enhanced encampment strategy work that we're doing this summer. So we have made some progress in terms of an MOU and um, we sort of reconfirming the membership for that, that it does bring agencies to the table on that piece. Um, but primarily right now, we're focused, that governance structure and the teams are focused on in, um, implementing all of the actions that were in that plan, which is mostly focused on the lower risk pieces. Um, a lot of the high risk encampments, uh, that goes to the high risk encampment team. Um, so those decisions are made sort of more quickly. Uh, so it's nested underneath the overall structure, but in terms of like a day-to-day -day, uh, role for the agencies, I think outside of, we have a once a week tactical meeting where those are discussed together. Um, but outside of that, there's sort of limited, there's less opportunity, I think, for engagement on those decisions outside of that weekly meeting, just because usually high risk encampments have to be closed within a very quick period of time. But like I said, all of that work falls under the broader governance, which does include the agencies, and they are able to share their perspectives there. Yeah, and I think I think um, you know having their voice at the governance table is really great. I think that there, what I'm reading in the report though, is that there could be significant value in having them at that more tactical level table for the high risk encampment, because I think again, I think that point about self defeating dynamics, of having 
you know, very opposite approaches in the same space, which isn't to say that those two approaches can't happen, but just that that, that coordination maybe needs to be there a bit more. Yeah, maybe I would just add, Councillor Stevenson, that one of the actions in the plan is working, looking at the individual assessment piece, which it's about individual assessment, but more importantly, even it's about what do we do with that information, um, which is, are there different types of responses that could be um, incorporated into the strategy when based on that information? So if someone, ha if we know somebody is, for example, like the report talks about, on the, br on the brink of being housed, are we treating that situation differently? Um, or if we know someone needs you know, psychiatric or medical attention, are we treating that situation differently? I think that action around individual assessment will open up the discussion around alternative approaches to um, encampment closure it, that can be quickly implemented to deal with the risks as well. Great, great, thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson, Councillor Tang. Yeah, great. Thank you very much for this. Uh, it was really enlightening. Um, did you feel like you were surprised by anything you learned through this exercise? Go ahead. Do you want to say something? Okay, I'm going to ask Jared to respond because he has a ton of direct experience and outreach, so I'm going to ask him. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Um, I, I've been doing this work for uh, over a decade. I was surprised still at the complexity of the ecosystem. Um, just the number of players from the funding level down to the front line mm -hmm. um, and how just how interwoven everything was, um, but without um, necessarily the structures in place to, to help coordinate at a top level. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that was surprising to me. Yeah, and I think the goal here is really to figure out that structure to make sure that web is you know, supportive and sturdy, and um, well, I was really surprised by that. One outlier at U of A, <laughs> one person over there really gave some support. Um, I wanted to hone in on a few kind of major thoughts that I have. Um, w one, thank you for referencing the corporate homeless plan. Do you think when that plan comes back in the fall, it will come with any kind of resource ask? Or do, do you anticipate that? Um, I think, the most important thing is getting an understanding from council on what our lane is in terms of where we should be, um, wh where the city should be playing a leadership role. Should it be in this outreach space that we've identified these gaps? Or you know, should it be in drop-in? Should it be in winter emergency? Like there's all these areas that I think we've kind of dipped our toes in uh, in the last few years. But so what I would see is in the corporate homelessness plan, which is coming back in January, is that we would have recommendations around where our role should be. And then in terms of resource asks, I think we'll have a sense of where addition, what additional investments could be made in each of those, but ultimately that will probably require further discussion with council through the budget process as well. Okay, and, and um, you know, I, I, I recognize to do anything to sift through that structure and to kind of tease things out requires resource to do that. And so that's why I asked, I'm wondering if that will be part of kind of that discussion at that time to be part of that bigger picture. Yeah, and I think we'll have that like at a higher order piece, but as you know, as you know, Councillor Tang from, and every other council that's been involved in these discussions, there's like, you know, you can do a little bit or you can do a lot, right? So it's not just where, but it's also the extent to which we want to go. And so I think for each piece in the corporate homelessness plan, though we will have like recommendations for interventions or investments that we would rec see as being most critical in those areas if we decide to proceed with that as it was part of our plan. Um, and then ultimately can build those into more fulsome asks through the budget process if that's the direction that we receive from committee and council. Okay. Um. I was uh, curious about the data sharing. It came up during the speakers. It was a very salient point that you know DCM women have mentioned and in the report. Uh, you referenced the inner city app. Um, have you also looked at other things like my recovery app that the province has done that's much more self-directed uh, that may potentially address some of the, the FOIP issues? And I'm, I, get, I guess I'm just, the, what I'm asking about is how do, like what can we do there to make sure people are sharing data effectively and considering that everyone's so different, you got mutual aid, you got, you know, formal institutional, you know, providers, um, have you considered, you know, what to do there? 
Not yet, but I, I think like that would be a next step out of this type of work if we were directed to be more engaged on the outreach side of things. I think, honestly, one of the main takeaways from this work for me is that everybody sees the need for data sharing. There's a lot of different groups that are working on pockets of data sharing, um, but there isn't someone who has that sort of system-wide perspective on the outreach, of, like we've talked about here, that's trying to bring everyone together. And I, so I think there more work would need to be done to figure out what's the best strategy for trying to enroll people in that, to be able to achieve that vision. Like I think the vision's really clear. Like we want every outreach worker to have, you know, secure access to people's information to be able to support them as effectively and efficiently as possible. But everybody has a slightly different interpretation on that. And so I think there needs to be a broader conversation of trying to bring in people together and bridge those perspectives. And then a strategy that says, we're starting here, we're building this thing with these groups, and we're gonna try and build it out to be broad and comprehensive over time. I'm wondering if you consider perhaps an incremental social innovation approach to, to that data sharing piece. There was a prototype done a long time ago. Uh, prior to pandemic, and obviously a lot has changed. I'm just wondering if there's things that can be started to explore that without, you know, a F dedicated FTE to do this, that kind of stuff. So I'm out of time. Uh, maybe you can reflect on that. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Wright? Thank you very much. Um, I'm just wondering, I'm just trying to, to, to break down these, um, the funders or, and the FTE in each in each area. With the City of Edmonton's 42 FT, does that include the, um, like the social workers, you know, that, that, that work out in, out in the community, not necessarily downtown areas, but in outer areas? Perhaps you're talking about our networkers or those that um, work in community, um, our community recreation centers and others. So this yeah. is not inclusive of those. Uh, we tend to consider those folks uh, working with community businesses, organizations on some more uh, higher level, community level responses. So uh, not necessarily uh, considered within the individual outreach as their uh, primary main objective. Okay, okay. And then... Um the the 28 with EPS are those part of the the help teams and the cot teams or are those just EPS officers no that's the help teams that's the help okay. team that's the help team okay but it doesn't sorry but it doesn't include the officer it would just be the outreach worker component okay okay um thank you um and i and i did have some sort of concerns about the um, about the the by names list and how to connect that that database, um, and and still keep within our our privacy uh, legislation and whatnot. But that's that is something that's being. Yeah, I, I think there are different ways of ensuring that folks that are all outreach workers can be connected into the process. Homeward Trust has developed sort of like an affiliated agency process where. Um, agencies can have access to the by names list, coordinated access, and potentially also access resources when they're housing folks. So the, there is mechanisms for connecting people. Part of it is just making sure that they're aware, those agencies are aware of the resources that exist with Homeward Trust and making sure that they can fulfill the expectations that Homeward Trust would have in exchange for access to that. But we can certainly help connect um, Felicia's group or any, any other uh, agencies to that to try and I think that's everyone's goal is to have as much resources and information shared as possible while maintaining privacy of the clients. Yeah, because I mean that coordinated effort I think would just be so ideal. Um, and now that you mentioned Homeward Trust, I'm just wondering um, those six, that 16 FTE that is strictly outreach or is that other positions within Homeward Trust? They're outreach housing workers that specifically go and work with people in encampments okay. for the okay. purpose of housing. Okay, wonderful. And um, I'm, I'm just wondering. There, there's no, there's no specific um, housing ministry within the province right now. Where, where is that consolidated under? Housing is under seniors and community services. Okay. Because I think at one time it was seniors and housing, wasn't it? Or yes, um, yeah. but then they merged with the community and social services. So now, okay. like seniors, housing, homeless, serving, outreach, income support programs are all in the same ministry. Okay. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that. And the 
some of the mutual aid groups there, Bear Clan, Water Warriors. I mean, there's other groups across the city. There's different faith groups and, and everything um, providing some services as well. That doesn't seem to be captured here. The only, so we reached out to all six mutual aids and the ones we captured in here were the ones that um, followed up for response, but you're right in terms of like the faith groups that that wouldn't have been captured. It's more the more formalized um, mutual aid and organizations were the focus of this. Okay. So I'm just wondering if, if, if there, if there might be more again to, to coordinate with, with those other groups as well. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. I think having like some type of, the beauty of creating some type of system would be that you could then expand it to less formal groups also. Um, but that's sort of the gap right now for both the formal and the informal of some of these coordination structures. Okay, okay. Um, I'm running out here. So thanks very much for, for all your work on this. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Knack. Thank you. Uh, thanks for all the work here. First, just did you have a response to Councillor Tang's question uh, that she was just wrapping up about the uh, social innovation piece? Yeah, I think that we could. Def we haven't looked at that yet, but we could look at that. <laughs> I think if that's um, work that count that you know Council wanted to direct us to get involved in, um, we could certainly apply that. I think, like like with everything on homelessness, we kind of through the corporate homelessness plan, hopefully we'll get some clear direction from council on the priorities of areas for us to intervene. And if outreach is one of those, then we definitely have some very clear next steps and we could look at using a process like that to advance those next steps. Okay, excellent. Um, curious about uh, how we get, how we share the findings that we're gathering right now with the provincial government um, to help with the accessibility resources, consistency, application resources. We do meet very regularly with um, staff from the homeless, uh, or, or homelessness outreach sort of, I can't remember what their little department's called <laughs> within the department, but we meet with them every once a month and we did share this report with them in advance of um, it being published, as, or sorry, when it was published as well. And uh, I think that we are getting some good alignment in terms of thinking about the types of work and services that need to exist together, but that would be another key part of um, it, advancing any of this outreach coordinating work would be continuing to ensure that all the funders are bought in because it's not super helpful if everybody has a different tool or a different vision or a different priority and there's a lot, lack of alignment. So we've definitely had some good conversations with the GOA and Homeward Trust. Um, they do see Homeward Trust as being the major coordinating body, but I think we're making um, yeah good strides. It's just there's obviously more work to be done still. Does that team, you mentioned you meet monthly, which is awesome, but do they do they come to the quarterly meetings that you're hosting? Oh, do you mean with the outreach, the outreach, the outreach coordinating meetings? I think that they have yeah. attended from time to time, um, for sure. We've had, but I'm not sure if they attend every meeting. Jared, do you know? That's okay. The, the fact that they are, they, they, they are going, they're being invited. So, so that's an opportunity. So who's, who's there? Like our, our, our encampment response team, uh, who's, who's at that meeting out of here, just to make sure I'm. Uh, th those meetings are actually more uh, frontline oriented. So um, a lot of the teams that the city funds would be attending them, but that's more of a, a frontline orientation to those meetings. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. That's helpful. Um, so can you walk me through, like, you know, I've heard a few of the questions and I'm, I'm just, and obviously you've got a body of work coming soon, but I'm just trying to figure out, okay, if this is received for information, what, What's that looking like in terms of your next steps between now and that next meeting and then just generally beyond that? Um, so we have a list of things that could be considered as part of the corporate homelessness plan that we're currently reviewing through. Um, so we've done the jurisdictional scan. We've done uh, the engagement with the broader public overall. The next step for us is engagement with stakeholders and engagement internally. So we're using that information to inform um, recommendations around the corporate homelessness plan. So this outreach information will be fed into that process. And when we come back in early 2024, our plan is to have basically a plan for the city, for council's review that recommends that the city play a role in homelessness in these, you know, 
whatever areas, <laughs> and this is what the next step would be in each of those areas um, for further expansion of the rule, if that's what we're recommending, or otherwise, if that makes sense. Yeah, so, so if I'm hearing you right, again, this what's coming up, it will say, okay, here's what we think we should be doing based off your expertise and the advice of everyone you've been engaging with. Here are the areas where we're not going to be working on, and even if that was potentially advice from from those you've engaged with, and, and sort of the here's why I, I feel like I'm thinking or I'm planning in my brain where we sometimes have had reports to say here's what we're doing and why, here's what we're not doing and why, even though maybe people have asked us for that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I think that's what the corporate homelessness plan needs to speak to is to say like on affordable housing, we have a clear strategy. We know we're a limited funder, but we're willing to be the first one in and we're doing that because it attracts funding from other orders of government and we're, we have the connection to the land as a municipality. So we have a clear strategy. That's what we want the corporate homelessness plan to provide as well, to say this is what the city should do on homelessness and this is why, given our unique position as a municipality, given the gaps that people have identified, given, um, you know, what's our strategic advantage? Because we could do anything on homelessness at any point, but there's particular areas where we'll be more effective as a result of the nature of our institution and this ecosystem in Edmonton. Okay. Uh, I know we're cutting it close on time. Um, I, we're almost done, but I, I see at least one more speaker on the board. Maybe I'll do a motion to extend orders to, to finish the agenda. Thank you, Councillor Knack. You're reading my mind. Please vote. Should yes. I clarify? To extend orders. To complete the agenda. We have four votes. Please display the vote and that is carried. Councillor Rice, go ahead. <clears throat> I just want <clears throat> very quick question and I will put a motion on the floor received as information. Um, the, so based on the current population, and for the houseless uh, people, and based on this FTEs presented today, and it seems as the ratio is one to 16. That means one outreach, outreach FTEs and face to 16 uh, houseless people. Uh, so I don't know if we never did any analysis to look at this ratio and in the past or the future, or is, do we have any targets we would like to change this ratio and then to use some this type of ratio as an indicator and to uh, measure the progress and the success? That is a good question and I would say that no. Like I don't think that we have that analysis and but I don't think a lot of cities have that analysis for what it's worth. Like this area is sort of, you know, homelessness is um, like a relatively new phenomenon at such a large scale is what we're experiencing now. And outreach in particular too is sort of seen as like the front door to a system, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily seen as the most critical part of the system all the time. So I think it's one of those areas that's been under um, analyzed and under planned and under strategized. And this report's a good start into that, but I think we'd have to look at, I think that, like, I think, I, I think that's such a good question. It's, we don't have that for day drop-in services. We don't have that for outreach. Like, I think that's sort of the next phase of the community plan needs to start to get into more of that piece and same with our corporate homelessness plan as well. I actually really look forward to that and from data collecting purpose and also from evidence purpose and how to inform our strategy and moving forward. And the reason for me to ask this question because the 165 FTE only, only reflects the outreach piece. It's not reflecting the system and how many FTEs actually work uh, to really address this complex issue. Um, this is will give us the basic sense and the basic evidence is the, is the approach, the strategy right now is efficient or effective. Is working or not working? If it's not working, and then as a city, do we need to reconsider something and re-explore something and to find the real way it really works? Otherwise, we will end like come back every year to have the same discussion, conversation every year. Uh, that is something I really want uh, looking forward to explore it. 
Yeah, and, and I think every time we come back to you, we bring you more information that's moving us down this path for sure. But I, I think it is worth noting, like it's not like there's a blueprint you can pick up from a best case city that has cracked the code and we just need to implement it here. Like we're really creating the solutions as we go as well. And I also think it goes back to when you ask about FTEs, it goes back to the type of FTE we're talking about mm -hmm. too, right? Because yeah. you could have, we know there isn't enough FTEs doing case management, for example. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of people doing the proactive stuff, but much less doing the case management, which is the stuff that really sustainably resolves people's homelessness mm -hmm. but we also know that we could instantly hire 200 case managers tomorrow but if we don't have affordable housing places for folks to go uh, then it, those case managers are not going to be successful in housing as many people in the long term so it's not just about this specific piece it's the overall system needs mm -hmm. to be in balance too so that there isn't any you know, roadblocks through the price, and then we need to work on scaling the system. Like we have good processes, we have good FTEs, we have good training. We, it's, it's more, we know what to do to resolve homelessness. It's more an issue of how do you scale it in a way that's consistent across the system and helps gradually achieve higher and better outcomes every, you know, on a, every, as we go forward every month, every week. I actually, I would like to see this ratio and then actually become smaller. And because if we're, we calculate, we include all other FTEs, and you can say may, maybe like one FTE will face like three population or five population. I don't know that data, I just think loudly there. Um, from I, that perspective and property and then to measure effectiveness and then the ratio, the bigger is better. And this less, means the f effectiveness, efficiency, and it's lower. Uh, so I, I know we don't have time to discuss that more, but i looking forward and for what you described and for the further discussion, further exploration. Uh, like I said, I put a motion on the floor, mm -hmm. that's all. I would just I would just caution the only thing Council raised on that is that what you heard I think in this report and what you heard from Ms. Richard in her comments is that we have a lot of folks working and working really hard and doing their best, but they are not necessarily having access to those higher order FTEs that are really important, like from a clinical perspective, whether it's you know nurses, people to help manage the health system. Their outreach workers are some of the lowest paid workers in the sector. They don't necessarily have the skills, training, and continuity to keep, you know, to solve problems as effectively especially given the complexity of need that we're experiencing in Edmonton currently. So when you're looking at those FTE ratios, I think it's also important to ask what type of FTEs are in those ratios because we could hire a dozen more yeah. outreach workers working at minimum yes. wage who are fresh out of school, but they may not be as effective as because having right those now clinical we, resources. Because we only refract one type. Exactly. And that, that is what I am I'm, I'm going to looking forward to see all the types. And then also, the, because right now we don't have the total number, we don't have breakdown, we only look at one type. So this is not a fully refracted situation. Thank okay. you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Paquette? Just to speak. Oh, okay. Any other questions? Okay, go ahead, Councillor Paquette. Okay, I, it might be a little bit cynical. My apologies. Uh, so I would just say that, uh, you know, I'm very grateful for all of the work that uh, everyone does. And we say that a lot, but uh, in these uh, particular uh, situations, one thing that really bothers me um, across the board, across governments, is the amount of time spent talking about these issues, which is an inordinate amount of time, versus the funding and the strategy and the political will to actually solve these issues. One would think that if you look at those things, that this is not actually a priority and no one actually wants to solve it. Now, that's not true. But the money and the organization, the policy does not match what we want for results. And I think that's something that uh, all orders of government could reflect on. I think that at the city level, we do as much as we possibly can with what we have. Maybe we can eke out more. And that's what we are trying to do here. We are trying to organize uh, and fund a system that uh, we do not have the financial capacity to handle. We do not have the legal capacity to handle. Um, and so that can be extremely frustrating. Now, the people who do have the financial and legal capacity to handle it, um, I don't know if they have a will to solve this or if it's a, a useful scapegoat. I have actually have no idea why we don't see serious action 
and serious investment to solve this immediately. And if not immediately, at least within a term of years. It's astounding and it's flabbergasting. I think that the people of Edmonton deserve much, much more, far more. And it's not just Edmonton. These issues are growing in every city across Canada. And so one has to ask why? Why, when we can identify the issues, do they continue to worsen? It is flabbergasting, astounding, and shameful. And on the positive side, we have people who are literally going to bed with these issues on their mind, waking up with these issues on their mind, and working every single day, but they do not have the support they need. Full stop, period. So I'm looking forward to the conversation in September. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Councillor Tang? Great. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I, I wanted to maybe provide some bit of context at this time. Um, for because there's a lot of questions like why this report, why this question, what does it do? This initial motion actually came about uh, during this committee, um, you know, many months ago, because at the time we were, ta you know, we were talking about uh, the community outreach transit team, and there was some interest in evaluating that program, even though they were just filling up two teams, and it was just a couple months into it. And instead of evaluating something that hasn't really gotten started, this was the alternative because at the time we were funding a multidisciplinary outreach program almost one a week. We had no idea how many were existing, if they're doing overlapping work. So I thought this was actually really helpful to lay that, to, to lay all the information out. And obviously with the pandemic, the challenges and complexity of the needs that we're seeing um, have simply amplified, and I, you know, I'm I'm a firm believer in we need multifaceted approach, um, and and multidisciplinary outreach is an important tool uh, to to address some of the immediate needs that we have. So I definitely think this report is a great starting point. Um, uh, sometimes I think we're in the weeds; we might not always notice the connections, gaps, and opportunities, and that's why I requested this overview of the ecosystem so that we can really dig into um, the gaps and the problems of coordination and collaboration. I hear from organizations what the barriers they're facing. Um, I still think that, you know, I, the report identifies some of the gaps and, and I'm, I'm feeling very confident with some of the comments from administration about uh, where you're gonna look into next. Um, and I certainly think we can be bolder and more, and more clear. Uh, and I think that's what that, that fall report hopefully will, will address. Um, and you know, we, we've been, we, we talk about system coordination for years and years and years, and there's never been any clear resolution. And I, uh, for me, I feel like we just can't keep pouring resource without changing something fundamentally in how we bring people together and work together. Um, you know, so just to, to really emphasize this point, you know, there's no other motion contemplated because I don't think it's necessary, uh, but I really do want to drive home this point that when that corporate homeless, homelessness plan come back, I really want to see multidisciplinary outreach really integrated into our plan intentionally, more holistically. Um, and I think we can be iterative uh, and see what works and what doesn't uh, and start to find effective solutions. Um, very specifically, I want to hone in on four specific threads. Uh, and these are not suggestions, these are just suge suggestions, they're not you know, directions because they're not in the motion. Um, funding came up quite a bit. Uh, and now that we know who's all funding all these programs, how can we get on the same page in terms of requiring reporting or outcomes? So that question of common outcomes framework was very alive for me when I read the report. Questions about contrast came up um, through the report and through the speakers. Uh, there was a good question earlier, Councilor Wright asked about how much can the roles be consolidated? Um, how can we ensure either the city or how can we work with our partners to turn some of those temporary contracts into permanent so they can have predictable, sustainable funding, much like some other actors in the CSWB landscape. 
Um, on the data sharing, I would encourage a prototyping social innovation approach to lay some foundations before a more fulsome resource ask as part of the corporate plan if there needs to be. Um, I think there's a lot of great, great base to build from, the inner city app, the My Recovery app. And finally, if hearing pretty loud and clear from some of, some of the stakeholders that people want to be at the table um, to take that kind of collective approach. Uh, you know, I believe Councillor Stevenson touched on this, but you no, know, certainly tables like the encampment would make it really worthwhile. Um, in the past year and a half since the election, I've done numerous walkabouts, ride-alongs with six or seven teams out of the 23 mentioned. Uh, they all fill different niche, all really valuable work, and over time I have seen improvements and change in terms of how the teams interact. I would say change for the better. Um, and, you know, this is a pretty small piece of the puzzle, uh, but it is a microcosm that reflects the complexity of the broader system. And, and I think this is a, it's a good area for us to kind of dig into and see how we can play that systems convening role. We're not going to be able to take on a whole bunch of responsibility, and we shouldn't, but I think to pose those questions, to bring people together, I think is well within our power. Um, and I just want to see us be the bolder, visionary leaders uh, in this space as we have always been. Thank you. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Tang uh, captured that really beautifully. Um, I just want to, to, again, share my thanks and appreciation to the team for the phenomenal work that you've done on this report. It's incredibly exciting and gives us a, a very clear picture, which is what will help us move forward and, and, uh, and do more, do better. I really appreciate the points around needing the overall system to be in balance. Um, and in that, you know, look forward to the corporate and community plans coming forward in the fall. So thank you again so much for this work. Okay, and Councillor Rice, any comments to close? Uh, I don't have too much to add and really appreciate the conversation we had today. And also appreciate some like good points and comments and brought up by my colleagues. And also thank you for uh, your team's great work. Uh, only one thing I would like to emphasize, just to reflect um, the um, really good comment uh, Councillor Percat brought up. Let's do something. Let's look at action. And also I would like to, let's look at the results. And then because if results every year is not changing the same, that actually the indicator saying something in the system is not working. Let's find out why it's not working. And instead of we keep coming reports, reports, reports over and over, and then I'd rather focus on, let's do something, let's have the action, let's have the tangible results come out. So I'm looking forward to that direction and also look, looking forward to some really tangible results come from that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Uh, please vote. We have four votes. Please display the vote. And that has carried. So we, are com we have completed 7.5. Uh, and do we have any private reports? None. Notices of motion, or sorry, motions pending, none. Notices of motion and motions without customary notice, none. So we are adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone.